Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. Chapter 106 The one who explained the changes in the military was Commander Gree. Rex, see if you can follow my line of thought. You weren't on Geonosis, but what happened there was at the same time a failure and a success. Yeah. We gave the Seppis and the Bugs a good blow, but most of their leaders escaped. The moment Count Dooku left the system, it was already decided that this would be a long and tiring war. After one month of war, when that became even more certain, Cody contacted us, with the authorization of General Kenobi, of course. Commander Fox took over. He said something on which we had been thinking for some time. Since it was clear that this war is going to last, we felt that giving each legion an identity was important. That is how all those rumors about new armor and colors started. The legions already have numbers, and some even names, but there was one thing that made us step up and talk with our respective generals. And what was that? Our names. Initially, only captains and above received a name from the Kaminoans. That was so we could distinguish ourselves, and to get the chain of command clear. But on our first battle, soldiers, sergeants, lieutenants and even medics started receiving names. Some were like Thyre here, granted his name by a Jedi. Dajer interrupted Commander Fox, something he would never have done if he wasn't slightly drunk. I was the same. General Peel was the first to call me Dajer. You see what I mean. But there those named by generals were only a few. The majority of our brothers received their names in the middle of the battle, or right after it, and the one who gave them their names was none other than ourselves. And by that I mean that we, clones, looked at our brothers, and felt that we didn't deserve to fight and maybe die without a proper name. The fact that the higher-ups didn't stop that, gave Cody and us more reasons to make our claim. When Apo and I left Kamino, some cadets also had names. When Rex said that, Deja remembered the young cadet that he met after the Battle of Kamino ended. He had given the cadet the name Cut Up in a whim. He wondered if he had influence over the changes that were taking place in Kamino. Commander Fox approached the great conclusion, and every clone in the room stayed quiet, even the commanders who already knew about it. Reveling it to Deja and the others in the room was the same as making it official. As you probably know, the claim Cody made to the Senate was that identity that each clone was acquiring little by little, was represented by a new armor. We were quite successful, and the result is that each legion, independent of new or old, will have a color on the armor. Now, not only commanders, but sub-commanders, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, soldiers and staff will have their own mark. In most of the legions, that is purely an aesthetic measure, but the morale boost will be huge. Or so we expect. My legion, the 41st, was chosen to be the first to receive the new armor because we fight in forests. The white color is quite conspicuous, and have caused more than a few casualties. And that new armor is being called Phase 2 armor. I think that makes the one we are wearing the Phase 1. Don't lose it, boys. When that war ends, we can hang it on the wall and say we were the first. Ha 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 ha. For the clones, and for the Republic. Five hours later, Dajer woke up to find Hell Squad still sleeping. Even though he had slept only three hours, he felt renovated. The last day, after the meeting on the second floor of the Revanter was over, Dajer found his men leaning on the counter, trading war stories with other clones. It took just an order from Dajer for them to form up, although they tripped a little. Dajer decided to tell them the news later and he had yet to decide if he would do that. Wake up. I don't want the 303rd men to become lazy because of one night of fun. Brain, call the captains and see them do the same. We get up as if we were on hostile territory. Hum. Yes, sir. Dajer sent Hell Squad in their exercises, so they wouldn't get lazy. He felt that this routine would be the same for the next six days. Until a voice came through his comm link, bringing bad news. Commander, I came as fast as I could. Dajer, wearing his full armor, his helmet and carrying his blaster, stopped in front of Commander Keeley on the meeting room of the headquarters of the clone army on Coruscant. 
In the room were not only Dager and Keeley, but most of the clones Dager had met the day before. We are still waiting for Fox. Step aside, and be prepared to move out at any moment. Things aren't good. Dager did as he was ordered, and waited behind Commander Keeley. Less than a minute later, Commander Fox arrived. Commanders, please make your reports. We need to confirm the news we received. Cody. Yesterday, three troopers of the 212th Attack Battalion didn't return to the barracks. Neither their squad members, nor any other clone knows what happened to them. Keeley. It was the same with the 303rd, but only one soldier is missing. Monk. No scuba trooper unaccounted for. Gree. Five missing. Bly. Also five. No trooper have any intel on why or where they went missing. On our side, more than ten Coruscant Guard members went missing last night. We don't know who or why, but we are working on it. Meanwhile, our, and your, order are to not disclose anything, but keep your men at the barracks. Fox, we won't stay locked in while we have men missing. Besides, how do you expect we to tell them that their leave time is to be spent in the barracks? Honestly, Bly, I don't know. But orders are orders. This is a clone army matter, so there will be no Jedi interference. That means no loopholes. Don't be rash, and follow orders. Chapter 107 Commander Keeley activated the lockdown order immediately after getting back to the barracks. No clones were to leave the barracks, and those who were outside it were to return immediately. Luckily, there were still entertainment facilities inside the headquarters of the clone army, although not as good as the Revanter. More luckily than that, the clones hadn't gotten out of their usual routine, so no complaints were raised. The next action Dager took was to bring Hell Squad together, and head to where Commander Keeley was. This was basic military tactics, and the commander should be protected at all costs. An army without a leader wasn't more than a bunch of loose grains of sand. Sir, who is the enemy? What should we prepare? Bring everything we have metal and 3-4, you two especially. We will need heavy firepower, and, 3-4, stay close to Commander Keeley. Protect him no matter what. Tech, Cell and Brain, you are to pursue if anyone tries to flee. Dab and I stay here to make sure it isn't just a distraction. How many enemies? We don't know. In fact, we don't even know if they will really come. Remember your orders. Our priority is Commander Keeley's safety. Hell Squad moved fast, and arrived in front of Commander Keeley's chambers. The clone commander showed no surprise, and asked Dager to come in. 3-4, Tech, with me. Commander Keeley's room was nothing different from the ones belonging to the normal troopers. The only thing that stood out was the huge number of blasters on the wall. Hell Squad took position, and stayed beside Commander Keeley the whole day and night, no matter what he did or where he went. But it was unnecessary, as no attack had happened. As a way to cover up the futility of their actions, Cell said that the attack Dager was expecting didn't happen because Hell Squad was there. The members of Hell Squad, tired from the last day and night they stayed up and awake, gladly accepted the excuse. The blow came next morning, when Dager, who hadn't slept yet, saw the report that Commander Fox had sent to Commander Keeley. No clone from any of the legions temporarily on the capital planet of the Republic went missing the last night. But almost thirty Coruscant Guard soldiers didn't return from their patrols. The next day that number was reduced to twelve Coruscant Guards. There was no kind of pattern, neither in the number of attacks or in the place they happened. With more than fifty clones missing, Commander Fox finally decided that the Coruscant Guard couldn't deal with the problem all by themselves. Still, all the commanders agreed that since the clones were being specifically targeted, the Jedi weren't to be involved. A measure was soon taken, thanks to a contact that Commander Fox had in the underworld. The snitch would do anything for a good price, and didn't deserve any trust, but Commander Fox pressed him hurt. Of course he didn't pay, but hinting that he knew about some of the crimes the snitch committed was enough. In turn, Commander Fox had lost his best informant, as the snitch wouldn't do anything for him anymore, unless Commander Fox paid double the price. But it was worth it. 
Although the snitch didn't know the name of who attacking the clones, or why that group was doing it, they got other important news. First, the location, and second the number. According to the snitch, deep in the underground world of Coruscant, a gang of more than a hundred members was capturing the clones. How can we make sure your informant is telling the truth? And even if he is, how can we guarantee he won't tell that gang that we know their location? Later, in the meeting, Commander Monk voiced his doubts, for which Commander Fox already had an answer. We can't. But he has nothing to win if he does this. You moved from a planet to another, and didn't have the time to understand how the underworld works. But I have been here since the start, and I can guarantee to you that Coruscant is much worse than it looks like on the surface. A snitch that tells both sides about each other wouldn't survive a day here. And even if he decided to do that, there is a 99% chance that they would eliminate him for crossing them. Commander Cody cut in at this point, think more rationally than Commander Monk. Even then, a hundred is still a lot to deal with. And if finding them was so easy, I wouldn't be surprised if the real mastermind is still hiding in the dark. Fox, how many men can the Coruscant Guard spare without leaving other areas lacking? We can barely cope with what we have in hand. Two hundred men at the most. But we have to be careful. They are on level A83. The Coruscant Guard have no men after level 67. Down there is a world with no laws. Two hundred. If we take them by surprise, that should be enough. But we have to prepare for the worst case scenario. We can take the legions that are here. What do you all say? Commander Bly put his fist in front of his chest, determination on his face. We thought you are never going to ask. We will squash those who dare to mess with our brothers. There were sounds of agreement between the commanders and sub-commanders. But Commander Fox destroyed their desire to move out before it had the chance to grow. I said the Coruscant Guard can move 200 men, not that it should. If we mobilize more than a hundred men, the chances of they noticing are already big. If we bring out the legions, before we make it out of the headquarters, there will be no more than rats in their place. Silence. It was logical if the clones thought about it, but still frustrating. If the depths of Coruscant were under total control of thieves and criminals, one clone would be quickly stopped, not to talk about two hundred. We will have to storm their lair before they get the chance to flee. How many soldiers shall we take? The subcommander of the 327th broke the silence with a question. I will take a hundred men of the Coruscant Guard. You move your troops in a different place, to give anyone the impression that we are just searching aimlessly. That is a good plan. But take some of my men with you, Fox. I can assure you they won't disappoint. Commander Keeley spoke for the first time since the start of the meeting. Chapter 108 the moment Commander Keeley opened his mouth, Dajer knew Hell Squad wasn't going to have an easy job. But he didn't think Commander Keeley would throw them right in the middle of the attack force. Even more so after Commander Fox had said only the Coruscant Guard would take part on the attack, and the other legions would be bait. If I ain't wrong, none of you, including the Coruscant Guard have a special unit. Hell Squad, led by Dajer here, helped take down a battle sphere on Geonosis, and their ranks weren't even full at the time. They are the elite of the elite of the 303rd. Besides, they have experience in close combat. Commander Fox was pensive. It was true none of the other legions had a special squad since it was too early to sort out the best men of an entire legion. They were turned on a special unit by General Windu himself. At the time, I wasn't even aware of their potential. That was enough for Commander Fox. Since a Jedi had recognized their capabilities, it was worth giving a try. How many? Dajer stepped forward this time, since this was a question concerning the unit under his command. Seven, including myself. We are prepared for any circumstances. I can assert for them. If it wasn't for Hell Squad on our left flank, we would have lost many more on Mon Cala. With the intervention of Commander Monk, Commander Fox finally accepted it. You have to follow my orders, understood? Dajer looked at Commander Keeley, and once he nodded, made a salute to Commander Fox. Yes, sir. All right. The plan will follow that line, then. 
Bly, take the 327th to Sector D-108, Gree, 2. It was dawn of the next day when the clones put their plan into action. It is worth mentioning that five more Coruscant Guard members went missing, even with the clones in high alert. One by one, the 303rd Attack Legion, the 41st Elite Corps, the 327th Star Corps, the 212th Attack Battalion and the Coruscant Guard started searching randomly for the ones capturing the clones. The scuba troopers under Commander Monk stayed at the headquarters to give the impression everything was normal. It would be difficult for anyone to notice there was a reason behind the searches the clone legions were conducting. That is because they were really random. Aside from the commanders and sub-commanders, no other clone knew the hideout of the gang. Besides, following the plan devised by Commander Fox, all the legions were quite a distance away from the real action. In an abandoned warehouse on level A67, 80 Coruscant guards, and Hell Squad were listening to Commander Fox. We are at the last level where the Coruscant guard have some sort of presence. The moment we step outside, every criminal on Coruscant will know we are here. We will have to be fast, and arrive at their hideout before they can react. No one will mess with the Coruscant guard apart from the gang we will face. Remember, identity the leader, take him alive. We have permission to use lethal fire against the rest. The plan wasn't difficult, but things could go wrong at any moment. Commander Fox said the scum that lived in the underground of Coruscant wouldn't fight them, but Dager wasn't so sure. Anyway, they had a plan, they had a target and they had their orders. Hell Squad needed nothing else. Hell Squad, Commander Keeley spoke highly of you. Dager, I need you to be serious, and cautious with the answer to the question I am about to ask. Yes, sir. Can you be our frontline? You need to be sure. One step wrong and you will be in trouble. Dager looked at Hell Squad, but he couldn't see their faces under their helmets. He put his own helmet on his head, the single horn painted on it being very eye-catching. They won't even know what hit them, sir. Good. Coruscant Guard, let's move. The clones got in two different police transports, and the doors of the warehouse opened. As the two transports flew out, many citizens scurried to get out the way, and some even threw curses at the clones. But quite a few instantly took out their communicators, and started passing messages. One of them, in special, uttered a very specific message. The worms are coming. They know where we keep our worms. It took mere seconds for the two transports to descend on the big holes that led to the depths of Coruscant. After that, they hurried to the address provided by the snitch, almost running over the pedestrians. For a few moments, Dager had the chance to see the poverty of the Republic. The streets were dark, and the people looked like the worst of the worst. Dager saw at least three different crimes happening. Their objective, a warehouse similar to the one they just left, came into view. A human was at the door, hearing someone through a communicator. The moment the transports turned the corner, the man opened the door of the warehouse and tried to run inside. Dab. Got him. A blaster shot from Dab's DC, 15x later, and the man fell to the ground with a smoking hole on his back. Before the transport even stopped, Hell Squad had already jumped out. Dager yelled at the civilians nearby to get away, and approached the warehouse. Brain, Tech, your turn. Through the door the man had left opened, Tech threw a kind of smoke bomb, that immediately triggered a volley of lasers from the inside. Without showing himself, Brain threw the real grenades, blowing up anyone near the entrance. Dager and Cell jumped in, and rolled over their shoulders, dodging another volley of lasers and immediately responding with fire from their own. Knees on the ground, Dager took down one enemy to his left. Meanwhile, Metal followed them in, his Z-6 cutting down the gang members like they were dummies on a training field. The smoke impacted Dager's vision a little, but the problem was much worse for the enemies, who didn't have helmets. Within seconds, ten gangsters were eliminated, but more keep popping out. When Dager thought that maybe Hell Squad had been too bold, Commander Fox arrived. Dager, when I said, frontline, I didn't mean get yourself eliminated. Watch out. Commander Fox was followed by many Coruscant Guard clones, but one of them was hit the moment he stepped inside the warehouse. 
Dager and Commander Fox had the same reaction, which was shooting the enemy hidden behind a pillar. Chapter 109 The warehouse was totally open, and besides the pillars there wasn't much else to be used as cover. On the far left end of it was a set of stairs that led to some sort of office. When Dager looked briefly, he felt the warehouse was smaller than he expected. Paying closer attention, he saw a door at the opposite end of it. The wall they were seeing was only a division separating the warehouse in two. Since the missing clones weren't in his line of sight, they were most probably on the other side of that wall. Ah! A clone fell behind Dager, his body becoming another one on the pile that was growing at the door. The door was only big enough for three troopers to pass together, and was turning in a choke point of death. But there was nothing Dager could do besides keep advancing. Only if all the enemies were cleared out would the clones be able to take better positions. The only positive side was that their distractions had worked, and there were fewer gang members than they had expected. Dager heard Dab shoot, and a body crashed in the floor near Dager. He looked and saw Dab aiming his blaster to above. Dager hadn't noticed before because he was too worried about the problem ahead, namely the huge amount of blasters firing at them. There was another office-like room right above the door, and if Dab hadn't noticed it, the first clone to advance would have died for certain. Dab. Get up there, and provide overwatch. Gilly, Heat, Love, Tari, go with him. See if you can get the ones on the far end of the warehouse. Commander Fox went along with Dager's commands. Dab and the other soldiers got up the stairs, although one of them, Heat, was lost in the middle of the way. Dab was actually the only one with a sniper blaster, but the soldiers that Commander Fox brought with him were also the elites of the Coruscant Guard, and weren't to be outdone. They hit four shots in five, and with Dab to make up for the ones they missed, they soon established a foothold. With a group of sharpshooters now providing help, the clone attack couldn't be stopped. All they needed was one chance and they would win. Dager decided to give them that chance. Metal. Suppress them. Cell, 3-4, with me. Metal had just finished reloading his Z-6, and got up as soon as his squad leader called for him. He sprayed laser through the warehouse, without worrying if he was hitting anything, but making the enemies keep their heads down. Hundreds of hours of practice made Hell Squad actions seem like they were connected. Every member of Hell Squad knew what the other was about to do, and what they had to do. Every time Dager, Cell, or 3-4 had to reload, Dab would take down any enemy aiming at them. Just like that, Hell Squad conquered half of the warehouse all by themselves. Go, go, go. Commander Fox was close behind Hell Squad, bringing the Coruscant Guard with him. Sir, the construction on the left. Dab warned Dager, who immediately looked at the left. The office-like construction was similar to the one Dab was using, so Dager first thought there were sharpshooters there. But then he saw a bunch of gang members running down the stairs. He understood what caught Dab's attention. They were much more organized than the other gangsters, and moved in a way there was also a space in the middle of them. Dager knew this well, because he had practiced it a lot when he was a cadet. They were protecting someone. Commander. Left, maybe it is the enemy leader. Before Commander Fox answered, however, Dager had already turned his attention. He had heard a very familiar scream. Sure enough, Hell Squad had one member on the ground. Cell was already besides 3-4, spraying blue laser to keep the enemies away. Two members of the Coruscant Guard were pulling 3-4 back. He had a black spot on the left side of his torso, and Dager knew the armor wasn't enough against something like that. But, no matter how much Dager wanted to go after him, he couldn't. If he stopped now, the enemy leader might have the chance to flee. So Dager had to throw all his thoughts to the back of his mind, and keep going. Commander Fox had charged forward, and was near Dager. Dager, remember, we need him alive. Yes, Commander. Move, we don't want to lose him. Since they couldn't eliminate the enemy leader, the clones also couldn't fire directly at the group crossing the end of the warehouse. The most they could do was fire in front of them to keep them from going further, but the enemy was fearless. No, not actually fearless, but well trained. 
They understood that the clones didn't want to eliminate them, so they stopped worrying about dodging the lasers. Luckily for the clones, they had already got their entire force, nearly a hundred, inside the warehouse, so their fire output was strong. Deja took cover behind a pillar, and peeked by the sides of it, killing one enemy and then hiding again. One of the men protecting the enemy leader fell to the ground, wounded by a blue laser that missed its mark. Deja got the chance to see a tall, blue person in the middle of the group. They were almost on the door, and near escape. Deja. Get your men to fire on that cluster. They can't make it to the other room. Yes, sir. Dab, you have permission to take them down. Just don't eliminate the one in the middle. Copy that. Brain, tech, cell, let's charge. Metal, cover us the best you can. Time was tight, and Dager didn't have time to devise a better offensive strategy. So he just gathered as many Hell Squad members he could and jumped from behind the pillar, trusting that metal would cover them. For clones ran forward, their blasters spraying lasers, but with surprising accuracy. The cluster of enemies near the door started to diminish, their members falling to the ground like dead leaves. When Dager, Cell, Brain, and Tech got near, only four enemies had made it to the door, including the leader. Dager have that number with three quick pulls on the trigger. Nevertheless, the remaining two still made it past the door, at almost the same time the clones finished clearing all the enemies in this half of the warehouse. Chapter 110 Without stopping to rest, Dager got near the door, and prepared to breach in. However, he was stopped before he could. Ho ho ho. Don't come in clone, or all your friends die. Dager ignored the arrogant voice, and kicked the door, swinging it open. However, he didn't come in, and that was proved to be a wise decision, since the doorway was soon filled with lasers. Standing on the other side was a scene from hell. Aside from the dozen or so gang members, this side of the warehouse was filled with Coruscant Guard clones. But they weren't chained like prisoners as Dager had expected. About sixty beds filled the warehouse, and on each of them was a naked clone. Plastic tubes and syringes came from a glass container near the bed, and ended under the skin of the clones. Medical droids were walking amidst the beds without caring for the battle. The liquid in the glass containers was yellow, and was flowing without stop in the veins of the clones. Beads of sweat adorned their bodies, and their veins were bulging out. None of them was awake, but Dager could see they were visibly in pain. What are you doing? Release them, now. Dager yelled at the man responsible for that without thinking, and stepped out in the open, aiming his DC-15A at him. Immediately, a dozen guns were aimed at him, but before they could shoot, they all dropped dead to the ground with ten burning holes on each of them. Commander Fox and the Coruscant Guard, as well as Hell Squad, had arrived. But the man didn't seem afraid. He put his right hand up in the air, so every clone could see a trigger in his hand. Ho ho ho. This is a release trigger, clones. I am pressing it, the moment I release it. Every clone on those beds dies. The man was tall and slim, and had a purplish-blue skin. His eyes were wide, and he was laughing maniacally. He was totally crazy. Seeing that, Commander Fox gave the order to hold fire. You captured soldiers of the Grand Army of the Republic. That is a crime which the penalty is death or a lifelong sentence. But if you carefully deactivate that trigger, and come with us, we can say you cooperated. Ho ho ho. Ho ho ho. Crime against the Republic, you say? I don't care about the Republic. You are all dirty liars and murderers. But I will show this galaxy the Republic is nothing. When my creation is complete, the Republic will be a defenseless prey for the Separatist cause. While he was saying that, the man kept lifting his thumb off the trigger, and then pressing it again. Every time they saw the finger lift, the clones gripped their blasters harder, and relaxed a little when the crazy man pressed the trigger again. Sir, I have him on my scope. Don't. If he dies, that trigger will be released. The clones would have to talk their way out of the situation. Fortunately, the crazy man didn't seem interested in dying either, and offered the solution himself. You see, clone commander, 
I have much more to do in my life. I still haven't completed the task Count Dooku gave me. So, I will retreat slowly, and you won't shoot. Because if you shoot, ho ho. I can't agree with that. Stop right where you are, and disarm the bomb. However, the man ignored Commander Fox, and started walking without turning his back to the clones. Ho ho ho. Who said? It is a bomb. Without any warning, the crazy man simply dropped the trigger. Without the pressure, the trigger popped back into place. Dajer had subconsciously shrunken, waiting for a blast, but nothing of the kind happened. Commander Fox fired his twin DC-17. It was a bluff. Catch him. The clones had stopped worrying about capturing him alive, now that they knew where their missing brothers were. However, the man was crazy but not stupid. The moment he released the trigger, a hatch opened under his feet, and he dropped into it. Before any clone went after him, the hatch closed. Split and look for any exit on the outside. He can't be too far. Bring the rest of our forces here, search for him everywhere. The Coruscant guard had been on standby on the levels above, just waiting for that order. The moment Commander Fox gave it, they moved fast. Ugh. Arg. Arg. Horrifying screams overwhelmed Commander Fox's voice on the comlink. The clone that had been laying on the beds had started to contort and scream in pain. Deja ran to the nearest one, and saw that the yellow liquid on the containers had started pumping out much faster. The skin of the clone started turning yellow, and his screams got louder. Deja pulled the syringes connected to the arm of the clone, making the liquid splash and accumulate on the ground. The other clones started doing the same to their brothers, but it was useless. After more than ten minutes of blood-curdling screams, the clones started to get quiet one by one. Dajer, Commander Fox, Hell Squad, the Coruscant Guard, Medics and anyone else had been able to do nothing, but watch the clones suffer and die. Back at the Clone Army Headquarters. Fire, please, tell the commanders the analysis results. Yes, Commander. Of the fifty-one troopers captured, none of them survived. They were injected with something that caused their genes to degenerate in a fast and painful way. We suspect the man who escaped was working for the Separatist, trying to create a chemical weapon that affects only clones. That is why only clones were being kidnapped. Before the enemy escaped, he injected a much larger amount of the chemical, activating it. We also lost 22 troopers on the assault. Commander Fox said that very quietly, but the impact was big. In a day, more than 70 clones died. They had suffered a total defeat, and a huge blow. We didn't find the crazy scientist, but the most intelligent thing to do would be to leave the planet. The Coruscant Guard will send a warning to all the legions. If the same thing happens to them, they will be better prepared. Meanwhile, our analysts are working on a cure or at least a medicine for the chemical. I think that concludes our meeting here. Commanders, make sure to let your men vent out their stress. The Separatists are starting to fight back, and you can't be sure when your legions will have another break. None of the commanders said anything, because they couldn't change what happened. The best they could do was follow Commander Fox's advice. Chapter 111 The clones spent the remaining four days of their leave without worries, drinking and talking at the Revanter or playing at the headquarters. Well, most of the clones did. Hell Squad and others of the 303rd Attack Legion spent most of the time in the infirmary, checking on 3-4. Needless to say, the wound on his side was pretty bad. His armor protected him from a fraction of the damage, but the angle that the laser hit was terrible. Two ribs were hit and had fractured, and his left lung was perforated. Because laser fire was too hot, the wound had been cauterized immediately, but the damage was big. 3-4 hadn't woke up yet and although the doctors were confident that he would live, he might not be able to fight again. Dajer and Brain stood side by side, looking at 3-4, who was floating in the back to tank. His wound was wrapped in bandages, but Dajer had seen it without it, and knew 3-4 had been lucky to be on Coruscant and not another planet. In normal battles, that would have been a fatal injury, because it needed immediate treatment. But on Coruscant, it took mere minutes for 3-4 to arrive in a medical center. Come on, 
Brain. Medic, get him in the cruiser. As the medic droids got 3-4 on a transport, Dager left Brain behind and went to the Sincerity. His week of rest had passed, but it felt like he was on a normal battlefield. In the heart of the Republic, the supposedly safest planet on the entire galaxy, 77 clones lost their lives, including those who didn't resist their injuries. Dager, sir. Barrow. How you doing? Had fun on the capital? I did. I heard you didn't. I am sorry about 3-4. I am sure he will be all right. That happens in battles. Besides, there is no need for us to feel down. He will be back on the battlefield before we know it. It just bothers me we didn't capture that separatist idiot. The man with blue skin, who had tricked Dager and Commander Fox. The man who had escaped under their grasp. The man who was creating a poison, a virus, to eliminate all clones. Dager swore he would catch that man no matter what. He swore it in front of his dying brothers. He can't escape the Republic. If we don't find him, some of our brothers will. But that is not the reason why I came after you, sir. General D called all lieutenants and above to the command bridge. I am going. You can return now, Barrow. Appreciate your last few hours without your armor. Dager made his way to the command bridge, and cleared his mind of unnecessary thoughts. One soldier had been hurt, but he couldn't falter because of it. The clone wars were far from ending. He stood quietly at one corner of the command bridge, waiting for General D and Commander Keeley. When they arrived, General D first spent some time greeting the clones. When he arrived in front of Dager, however, he said nothing, but patted his shoulder. It was Ragu, his Padawan, that talked to Dager. Dager, we passed by the infirmary in our way here. Three Four's life force is strong. I sensed it. He will recover without problems. Dager eyes went wide, but Ragu couldn't see them, since they were covered by his helmet. Dager didn't know Jedi's couldn't tell things like that. It appeared their skills didn't lie only with lightsabers. Dager. Please, share with the rest of the officers our orders. Yes, General. Officers, we received our next destination from the army headquarters. We are to recover Dantuin from separatist control. That is a planet-wide invasion. We can expect a long, tiring battle. Sir, we have a whole bunch of rookies with us. Valid considerations, Captain, but we will have much more than a bunch of rookies with us. We will have a whole fleet of shinies. The 501st Legion is with us in this battle. The response the Separatist gave was much stronger than we expected, so we will have to make do with our two legions. All right. We will attack the Tuin from two different areas. We, the 303rd, will start here, 200 kilometers from the capital city, Garan. The 501st will have the easy target, Kunda. And by easy I mean they will face hell, and we double that amount. Dager showed the two cities on the hologram. Dantuin wasn't a big planet, and the only importance it held to the Republic was in terms of showing strength. But orders are orders, and Dager was never going to contest them. Besides, he was born to do that. Now, let make things simple. The Clankers know we are coming, so it won't be an easy battle. But we are clones, and we don't shy away from a battle. Our men are rested, and we got the new troops we needed. Let's give the Seppis a beating. Oh, yeah. You heard Dager. Now, make the preparations to the embark. Our fleet sets out in six hours. General D ended the meeting, and called Dager aside. Dager, I need someone to stay here and organize things, and someone to go talk with the commander of the 501st Legion. Commander Keeley decided you go to the 501st headquarters. Yes, General. I will go right away. Minutes later, Dager was at the capital cruiser of the 501st Fleet. Once he announced his purpose, he was immediately brought to the commander of the 501st Legion. Dager. You came to discuss the invasion plans for Dantuin, I imagine. Dager frowned. There were two irregularities in Captain Rex's words. 
The first was that he called Dajer by his name, even though his rank was lower. That was against military regulations. The second irregularity was that he was just a captain. The one to receive Dajer should have been the commander. Hello, Captain Rex. I need to talk to your commander. Erm. I am it. What do you mean? I am the commander of the 501st. That is a normal confusion. I am the highest ranking officer of the 501st Legion. We are a legion composed by the elites of the cadets, so our contingent is smaller than the normal. I am captain in name, but I work as the commander. That was surprising and suspicious. Why would a legion that hadn't even gone to battle be formed in such a strange way? And why wasn't I informed of this? If you have fewer members, that can change our whole plan for Dentuin. I don't know. We were sent here without. What is going on here? Chapter 112 General Skywalker The man who entered the room was surprisingly young, and had a serious semblance. It was human, with brow hair and brown eyes. He was wearing the battle robes the Jedi used under their cloaks, and had a lightsaber hanging on his hips. Dajer knew that Jedi. They had briefly met on the series of battles on Renvar, Alaris Prime and Thule. More specifically, Dajer was on the force sent to rescue him after he had been captured, but the Jedi had escaped on his own. However, when Dajer met him, the Jedi was only a Padawan. It appeared he had passed the famous Jedi tests. His name was Something Skywalker. Anakin Skywalker, if Dajer wasn't wrong. Besides his hair being slightly longer, the Padawan. No, Jedi, hadn't changed much. General Skywalker. And you are. Subcommander Dajer, from the 303rd Attack Legion, General. We met at the Ren Var campaign. I am also the squad commander of Hell Squad. Oh. You were on the team sent to Alaris Prime, weren't you? Your armor was different though. It is good to meet you, trooper. The stern face of the Jedi lit up in a bright smile, and he offered his hand to Dajer. The clone stood petrified, not knowing what to do. No matter if it was Jedi or clone, no superiors would ever make such a gesture to a mere clone he just met. And doing such had never passed through Dajer's mind. It just wasn't a common thing. Come on, shake it. On the side, Captain Rex shook his head while smiling. He had passed the same experience as Dajer. Realizing the Jedi still had his hand stretched, Dajer quickly gripped and shook it. It is a pleasure to meet you, General. Again. All right, Dajer. What news do you have for us? General D sent me to discuss our attack plan on Dantuin. Okay. You and Rex do that, I have to return to the Jedi Temple. See you later. General, it is important that you. Seeing the Jedi excuse himself of the strategy meeting, Captain Rex tried to hold him back, to no avail. General Skywalker had already left before Captain Rex even finished speaking. Is he always like that? I only met him yesterday, and that is already the third time he did that. His master, General Kenobi says we have to keep an eye on him because he tends to be brash. I am not sure how I am supposed to do that. Anyway, we have more pressing matters. You are right. According to the plan, the 501st will attack Kunda, the second largest city, and the biggest economic center. The Separatists are already rooted on the planet, so their defenses will be nothing short from near unbreakable. You have two options, ground assault or air assault. What are their anti-aircraft defenses? Turrets, cannons, dwarf spider droids. Anything you can possibly imagine and more. Their ground defenses are no joke either. Hail fire, AATs, turrets, and of course a huge number of clankers. The only good news is that they are out of vulture droids, thanks to the resistance of the Republic forces prior on the planet. Do we still have any troops on the planet? No. All that could be evacuated have been, and those who didn't. Are dead. What is the plan, Dajer? Frontal, direct attack. No other way. Dantuin is 90% grass plains. They have nowhere to hide, and so do we. 
that is why two legions are being used. Although I didn't know the 501st was smaller than usual. We will make up for that with the quality of our soldiers. Give us a few battles and the 501st will be unstoppable. I hope that is true. The meeting between Dager and Captain Rex lasted well over two hours, on which all the strong and weak points of the droid defenses had been discussed. There was not much chance of a mistake on the Republic intelligence, because Detuin had simple geographical features. When Dager returned to the sincerity, all the attack strategy had been laid out for Captain Rex, and it was on him to pass it to General Skywalker. How well the 501st executed it would depend on both the clone and the Jedi leadership. The only missing information for Dager was Hell Squad role. On a planet-wide invasion, what one squad could make was limited. He had to consult with Commander Keeley and see what were his intentions. Luckily, he found Commander Keeley quickly, eating in the mess. Dager. Have you eaten yet? No, Commander. I've been at the meeting with Rex for the last few hours. Rex? The captain of the 501st Legion. He is the same as their commander. That legion is quite confusing, to say the least. What is up with them? Not exactly them. They are special legion, like the wolf pack. What I find weird is that we are to attack Dantuin with them, and nobody told us that. Did you know, commander? No. This is the first time I heard that. Their general is General Skywalker, former Padawan of General Kenobi. I mean no disrespect to him, but, between us, Commander, don't you think it is weird to bring out a special legion just to put it under an inexperienced general? Yeah. Yeah. I will see what I can found about that. But what about our battle plans for Dentuin? Are any changes necessary? I don't think so. No matter what, they are a well-trained legion. Besides, Captain Rex appears very capable. I am pretty sure he was the one who commanded the cadets in the Battle of Kamino. So he has some experience after all. Well, we will have to see how it goes. Sit and eat. You have been in two strategic meetings in a row. Dajer sat down and took off his helmet. His shaved head was glowing with beads of sweat. A droid brought him his meal, and Dajer ate it contentedly. It was only after eating his fill that Dajer remembered why he had searched for Commander Keeley. Commander, what are Hell Squad orders? I was presented the entire battle but in no moment we were mentioned. That is because Hell Squad has no specific toll in that battle. We first have to establish a foothold on the planet, and then we will find your targets. We need to find a temporary replacement for 3-4. A medic is of utmost importance, even more if we have to go alone somewhere. We will find someone. Now, prepare to leave the 303rd will shortly be off to another battle. Chapter 113 A green ball floating in space, Dantuin was a quite beautiful planet. It would be more if it weren't the debris floating around in space or the clouds of smoke on the planet that were visible from space. Between big and small starcraft, the two Republic fleets hovering above the planet had close to 50 ships. That was without counting the starfighters, of course. But such a big group of cruisers had nothing to do in the battle that was about to start. The droid defenses were too near the cities for an orbital strike, and the few targets that weren't were not worth it. As it was usual before a battle, Commander Keeley was making his small speech to boost morale. The only certainty on the conquest of Dantuin was that many troopers would die. That was something nobody said but everybody knew, and they could do nothing about it. Ever since Dager became sub-commander, his sense of responsibility had become stronger, as it was expected. That prompted him to make sure the battle plans were the best possible, and that weapons, ships, vehicles and soldiers were ready. Everything could save the life of a brother. But his increased responsibility also made him think a lot more about the consequences of a battle, even if it hadn't started yet. He didn't know how many of the brothers he grew up with would die today, and how many more would be severely hurt. He could die today, as could Commander Keeley, General D, Ragu, Brain, Metal, Tech and any other clone. But he had to steal his heart and fight. In Dager's vision, he had a bigger purpose on Dantuin and any other battle. That purpose was command Hell Squad and destroy any droid in his away. 
Only by doing that could he make sure the brothers who came behind him would face less danger. Get on the lots. We are going in, boys. For the Republic. For the Republic. When Commander Keeley finished his speech, Dejo shouted the same as the soldiers. As a clone, his job was simple. Fight for the Republic. The Lot Hell squad got into was different from the ones he was used to. Its sides were freshly painted with the reddish brown of the 303rd. Two horns, one on each side, made the gunship look fierce. And it wasn't only his lot that was like that, but all of them. In the words of the pilots, we might fall today, and if so, let it be for the 303rd. Personally, Dager liked it. Using the basic tactic of splitting the commanders so they don't get all taken down in one swoop, Commander Keeley and General D each boarded a different gunship. Sergeants, check out your groups. We set off in six minutes. If anything is wrong, fix it now, or go without it. Move, move, move. Deja rushed the men in the gunships, and for six minutes there was only the sound of troopers moving and the sergeants making the last-minute checks. Hell Squad boarded their lot quietly. There was a tradition that the clones started after Geonosis. That was to close their eyes and stay quiet until the lots took off. It wasn't just a sort of mental preparation, but more of silent respect for all the clones who would die, and already died. That way, the moment the clones stepped on the battlefield they could focus entirely on the battle. The moment he felt the gunship vibrate under his feet, Dager opened his eyes. The clones with him were hanging on the sides of the lot, or on each other. Just before the procession of lots left the Venator-class cruiser, the doors closed. The clone army was taking off directly from space this time. As usual, the lights turned on, bathing the helmets of the soldiers in red. Near him, Cell gripped his blaster harder. Just like Geonosis, all over again. It looks like more than four months. I hope we have a better landing than I did on Geonosis. The subcommander and I crashed hard. That was Brain chiming in. He and Cell talked without thinking, speaking in the most inappropriate moments. Dager had to shush them to hear Commander's Keeley on his comlink. Quiet, you too. Okay. Hum. Yes, Commander. Closing the channel, Dager turned on the hologram projector on his hand, and showed the clones in the gunship an image of what they would face. Dab, Cell and the sniper team, stay back until we take this position here. Then, provide support so we can take objective J3. Lieutenant Fonder, your objectives are J4 and J5. Make sure to clean all the droids on them. After that big hill, we have a good hundred kilometers of plain ground. The Seppis have trenches, turrets and whatnot. It will be a tough battle, so don't run after clankers. Complete your orders and hold position until you are given new ones. This battle won't be over in a day or two, so there is no need to rush all the way to the capital in one swoop. Sir, we are about to enter their range. Hold on to something. Got it. That is it, troopers. Just do your job well and we will be one step closer to ending this war. Dager concluded his words just about the moment the anti-aircraft separatist turrets fired their first shots. Most of them missed, and those who hit didn't do much damage. But that was just them calibrating their guns. The next volley would be much more deadly. And so it was. As the subcommander, he constantly received the updates about which and how many lots had fallen. Cell was right. It was really like Geonosis. Luckily for them, unluckily for many of their brothers, Hell Squad's lot suffered nothing but a scratch. When the gunship touched the ground, Lieutenant Fonder immediately jumped down with his troops. All over the green plains of Dantuin, clones disembarked their gunships and ran towards the droid defenses. The gunships had formed circles, and the clones were using them as cover to start their offense. A red laser hit the walls of the lot, centimeters away from Dager's head, leaving a scorched mark. Nevertheless, Dager still walked out of the gunship unhurried. He was still too far to get accurate shots out, so he didn't waste ammunition. Using the macro binoculars on his helmet, Dager inspected the droid positions. The green of the grass plains was even more green through the macro binoculars, 
but Dejer soon identified their goals. Chapter 114 The clone army had dropped behind a big hill for two reasons. The first was that it was where the droid defenses started. If they tried to advance more than that, their gunships would have been torn apart. Secondly, if they took the hill, they would be able to establish a base protected from the droids, and from where they would be able to organize a bigger offensive. If they could bring in the big vehicles, like at TES, the battle would be easier. Dejer looked around and calculated they already had enough men on the ground to start pushing up the hill. It was about 500 meters tall, and filled with droids. Lieutenant Fonder Start the attack. Take down the first line of bunkers, then move up using the tunnels. Captain Narza, we will go up the hill. Squash them between two fronts. Hell Squad, on me. Dab, while we are going up the hill, see if you can find any enemy commanders. Cell, help him. Kuvu, stay behind us, if anyone is hurt, apply the immediate procedures. Leave the rest to the others, you move on with us. Kuvu was the clone medic replacing 3-4. He was chosen amongst the elites of the 303rd, but still was quite a distance away from Hell Squad standards. So, Dejer ordered him to stay back, and give support to the wounded. Of course, Hell Squad would be on the vanguard, so Dejer didn't want Kuvu to be somewhere he was not prepared to be. Deep inside his mind, Dejer probably thought Kuvu would slow them down. Through the four and a half months of war, Hell Squad ran far forward than the rest of the clones. Their missions, dangerous situations, and especially their determination, transformed them on a special unit that was the best the 303rd had to offer. It was also amongst the rest of the clone army. Dejer was sure that he and his squad were behind only the clone commandos like Delta Squad. That wasn't arrogance, but the confidence that came from the trust their brothers put on them. Each and every member of Hell Squad knew that if they failed, the cost wouldn't be just their lives, but also the lives of their brothers. Under the command of Dejer, the clones grouped up behind two lots. The moment Dejer ordered, the lots would fly out of the way and the clones would charge. Having already analyzed the droid defenses using his macro binoculars, Dejer knew there were seven lines of trenches, each of them filled with big and small bunkers. After they took over the first trench line, Fonder would clear the underground and Narza the surface. Hell Squad would be with them. They had to systematically clear each trench before moving to the next. Pilots, ready. 3. 2. 1. Now. Captain, Lieutenant, move. Let's go, men. Move out. The two lots took off, one for each side, flying low so they wouldn't be hit by the anti aircraft turrets. The clones split into two groups, going in the same direction but in different angles. The first line of clones was immediately shredded to pieces by the droids in the trench, but the second and third lines had fewer casualties, and the fourth was intact. Only the upper body of the droids was shown over the top of the trench, making them harder to hit, but also guaranteeing each hit was lethal. Each time a laser missed, chunks of grass and earth flee in the air, filling the air with dust. But some lasers never missed. Holding his DC 15A at waist level, Dejer fired two shots in succession, hitting the droid squarely in the chest. Tech and brain aimed more, always hitting the clanker's head. Metal was, well, vaporizing the droids with his Z 6 rotary. At fixed intervals, seppies on the bunkers would fall, all of them with a hole where their right eye was supposed to be. Dab was suppressing the four bunkers near them making sure to keep the droids away from the turrets and cannons. With Cell marking the targets for them, the other snipers were also doing pretty well. Man down. Medic. Hold on, brother. Ah. To the left. Arg. Kuvu had a lot of work to do, and was too occupied to see that Hell Squad had left him behind. Of course, they didn't do it because of some weird reason such as not liking Kuvu. It was just that their rhythm was way faster. More feeling than seeing, Dejer evaded two lasers, and slid in the ground, directly in the first trench. His feet hit the chest of a B-1 battle droid, kicking it to the ground. The E-5 on the hand of his opponent was knocked away from him, and Dejer finished him with a quick point-blank shot. 
The trench was about two meters deep in the central part, and one and a half in the laterals. The trench was littered with droid bodies, and even some clone ones. Brain and Tech arrived by his side, and cleaned the remaining droids they could see. Each section that passed, more and more clones entered the trench, and took over it. Dajer turned on his comlink. Lieutenant Fonder. How are you going with those bunkers? Sir. We almost finished clearing them up. We also found the tunnels, but taking them will be tricky. They had e-webs on each corridor. Do what you gotta do. Captain Narza, what is the overall situation on the first trench? Our troops faced difficulties on the middle. I am sending more men to support. Hell Squad will take care of it. Coordinate with Fonder, and start pushing up to the second trench. We have to take this hill before nightfall. Dab, do you have visual on the middle section of the trench? No, sir. Do you want me to reposition? Cell, with him. Metal, brain, tech, start moving. 3-4, support. Kuvu, come over here, I have troopers wounded. Kuvu applied for the necessary painkillers and medicines, and Dajer patted him on the shoulder, to show he noticed how much the clone was striving. After Kuvu had patched up the wounded, he and Dajer started following the trench towards the middle. The clone army had already taken over the trench, and was in a heated battle with the second trench line. Walking down the middle of the trench, every now and then Dajer saw a clone being shot and falling to the ground. It was becoming more difficult to walk, since now the deepest part of the trench was being filled with bodies. But Dajer just kept going. Scenes like that were now too common for him. Chapter 115 Arg. A clone fell in front of Dajer, his helmet smoking. Since only the upper body appeared above the trench, most hits would be on the head, and would be lethal. It was the work of the droids above them, who had the high ground, and range advantage. But the lasers that eliminated this clone didn't come from above. They came from the last section of the trench that was still under droid control. Making use of the S shape of this part of the trench, the clankers were holding back the clones. That is, until Hell Squad arrived. A few of the thermal detonators' brain had taken care of part of the droids. Dajer eliminated the others almost alone. He picked up a droid, and used it as a shield. To make the action easier, he discarded his DC-15A and traded it for his DC-17. Each time a laser hit the droid body, Dajer shook, but his hand holding the blaster never faltered. Dajer only stopped when he met Brain and Tech. He let his droid shield, now totally shredded, fall to the ground, where it became another one in the pile already there. Tech aimed at it by instinct when he heard the metallic sound. We took the first trench sir. Only six more to go. That was the most difficult. Now we can attack from both up here and the tunnels below. Kuvu, Tech, take the left. Brain, come with me. Metal, when we run out, fire your toy. Lieutenant Fonder, Captain Narza, the trench is ours. Start pushing towards their second line of defense. Cell, you have a better visual than us. How is the status of their anti-aircraft turrets? Still kicking, sir. Dab, is there any possibility of taking a shot? I can try, sir, but it is a chance in a hundred. And. Oh ah. Uh, what is it? One of our gunships just crashed in their anti-aircraft positions. Sir, if we push up now, that might be our chance. There were so many explosions going off on the battlefield that Dajer hadn't noticed this one in particular, but following Dab's indication, he saw that two of the AA turrets had been crushed, and the droids managing three others had been blown away. If they could take that chance to advance and take over or destroy the AA turrets, then maybe they could. However, it was six trenches and five hundred meters away. Damn it. We will have to risk it. Dab, keep those turrets out of use no matter what. Fonder, Narza, hurry up. Admiral Dow. Admiral. Do you copy? Subcommander Dager. What do you need? At TS, plus a squadron of starfighters for support. That is impossible. Any ship we sent will be shot down immediately. 
doing this would be a waste of life and resources. Admiral, we have a chance right now. If we don't take it, then we will lose many more. I can't do that without orders from General D. I am sorry, Dager. Admiral. Berg. General. General D, can you hear me? Dager. What is it? We are. In the middle. Of a battle. Ragu, force push. General D's voice was choppy, and Dager could hear the sounds of battle. General, there is an opening which we can use to put the ATES on the ground, but I need your authorization. How certain are you that our pilots won't be shot down? Certain enough to think it is worth taking the risk. Do it then. Yes, General. Admiral, I have General D's authorization. Bring down the big toys. You better be right, Dager. Thorn Squadron, protect those gunships on their way down. Don't let them fall even if you have to throw yourselves in front of their turrets. With the orders that they needed, adapted lots flew off the sincerity. They had a larger space in their bottom, so they could fit the big ATES under them. When they were near the ground, the magnetic locks would be released and they would be dropped on the ground. Dab, how are you doing? Fine by now. But once the Seppis decide to rush to the AAs, we will be screwed. Just keep going. We will have heavy support soon. All right. Metal, empty your magazine on the next trench. We will follow right after. Metal climbed over the side of the trench and grabbed his Z-6 with both hands. One hand on the handle above it to aim, the other on the back where the trigger was, Metal sprayed an entire magazine on the second trench, 60 meters away. A Z-6 rotary heavy blaster had a magazine of 1-3 kilograms of pure Tabana gas, one of the most volatile and powerful substances in the galaxy. At max potency, that was over 120 lasers exiting the barrel of the blaster per second. In just four minutes, Metal emptied a magazine worth thousands of Republic credits, for a total of more than 30,000 lasers. Aside from the cost, firing recklessly like this also had another obvious downside. The six barrels of the blaster turned orange and red, and started smoking. Metal had to drop his beloved weapon on the ground, and even then there were burn marks on his gloves. Seconds before Metal finished, Dager had already walked out of the trench. At the same time, Captain Narza and Lieutenant Fonder started their offensive. Clones left the trench in a line, and ran towards the next one. At the same time, Lieutenant Fonder started his attack on the tunnels below, forcing the droids to divert their attention. The second attack was very much like the first, with the difference that the clones attacking now had the support of those on the trench. Thanks to Metal, Hell Squad had an almost clear path, because all the droids in front of them had been eliminated or forced to stay down. 60 meters were neither a big nor a short distance, and at full speed, it took Dager five seconds to arrive above the clankers. Dager stood above the trench, his two feet planted firmly on the ground, his blaster pointed downwards. After taking care of the droids and securing that part of the trench, Dager heard Dab on his comlink. Sir. They are about to take it. There are too many of them. It is just a matter of seconds. Then we just got lucky, Dab. Have you looked behind you? What? Oh, yeah. Hearing the excited shouts of Dab, Dager turned off the comlink. Suddenly, big, blue lasers came from behind the clone army, and a huge section of the anti-aircraft turrets of the Separatist was blown to bits. Chapter 116 Giant metal bodies, supported by sturdy legs, with one big cannon on the top, and four small ones in the front. The mass drive cannon needed some time to charge, but its power was undeniable. The AATs used by the Separatist were no match for it. But what the Separatist lacked in firepower, they had in number. Half a minute after the first ATE touched the ground, one of them crumbled under the concentrated lasers of AATs and turrets. But they had done their job. The AA turrets were in tatters, their crews buried or on fire. Smoke was billowing in the air as Dager walked in the trench. Hell Squad had made it inside the trench, but the other clones were facing problems. Tech, Brain and I will go to the right. Kovu and Metal, left. 
Cell, come up here and help them. Dab, continue with the overwatch, you are free to fire at any clanker. Dager's commands were simple. By splitting and following the trench line, they would catch the droids unaware. If they did that, more and more clones could enter the trench. The sound on the battlefield was deafening, with explosions, lasers, and death cries. But, for Hell Squad, there was almost no noise. The trench was quiet, and only if they paid attention they could hear the battle noises. Dager stepped carefully on the ground, making almost no noise. Reloading. Unit R1, R3, where are you? R1, R3 is dead. Oh whoa. Die, Republic scum. Not 15 meters away from where Hell Squad split, Dager ordered Tech and Brain to stop. From up ahead, he could hear the droids talking, although he couldn't see them. Since they were so close, Dager wasn't sure how the droids didn't hear when Hell Squad captured the trench block meters away. Maybe it was a trap, but why would they set a trap in the middle of a battle? Dager doubted the clankers were smart enough for that. Most likely they would just fire at the clones straight away. They probably were just dumb. Brain, do you have some detonators? Always. Go ahead then. One explosive device was thrown, and disappeared after the corner. Hey. What is th? The explosion sent soil flying in the air, which then hit the armor of Hell Squad, staining it with mud. But they couldn't care less at the moment. A hole had been carved in the middle of the trench, and the charred remains of B-1 battle droids were scattered around. Dager kicked a droid torso away, knelt on the ground, and aimed at the droids a bit away. One B-2 super battle droid had turned to them, his rigid arm aiming his wrist rocket. BZZ. There are clones here. The super battle droid fired its rocket, but Dager jumped to the side, and all it hit was the trench wall, sending more mud splattering in the air. Dager's ears hurt, but he surprisingly didn't aim at the super battle droid, but the B-1 units behind it. He hit one droid in the chest and followed with a shot to the head. The second one his aim was a little off because of the explosion, and the laser hit the left arm of the droid right in the joint. The droid's arm was separated from its body, and his E-5 was lost. Losing a weapon in the middle of a battle meant death. By the moment Dager finished off the B-1 battle droid, the super battle droid had changed its wrist rocket by the twin blasters on its other arm. Still, Dager showed no intention of reacting to it, and concentrated his fire on the droids behind it. Just before the B-2 fired his powerful blasters, four shots hit it squarely in the chest, and brought it down. Brain and Tech didn't stop there, but aimed at the next target. The reason why Dager had completely ignored the dangerous B-2 super battle droid was because he had full trust in his brothers. This section of the trench was straight, and ended in one of the bunkers. That meant there was no cover, which was unfortunate. For the droids. When the clones finished, about twenty droid bodies were laying on the bottom of the trench. Tech, open that door. Tech went ahead and crouched next to the metal door. He tapped in his comlink, and connected two cables with the door control panel. Dag. ZZ. Dager. BZZ. Commander. Commander Keeley. Are you all right? There is too much in turf. BZZ. Crashed. ZZ. Up. Hill. We have. ZZ. Wounded. Wait a bit, Commander. Let me find you. Tech, wait, don't open it yet. Dager lowered his macro binoculars and put his head above the trench. But there was too much smoke, and there were too many downed gunships to find which one was Commander Keeley's. Dab. Commander Keeley was shot down. Find his lot. Now. Yes, sir. Tech, get back to this bunker. We have to clear it before moving on. I am ready to open it as soon as you command, sir. Brain, pass me some detonators. I will be the one to blow those seppies. Not knowing how his commander was, or whether he was injured or not, Dager wasn't feeling good. When Tech opened the door, Dager rolled the thermal detonators inside the bunker, leading to a series of explosion. 
Carefully stepping inside the bunker, blaster ready to fire, he saw two destroyed E-webs and a dozen droids. He sat down and took a deep breath. Captain Narza, Hell Squad have taken control of the bunker at position 498A. We noticed, sir. Captain Narza answered not by the comm link, but in person. He came out from the tunnels, leading a group of clones, including Lieutenant Fonder. The second trench is ours, sir. Good. By the way, Captain, why are you in the tunnels? I was hunting some seppies. Sir. What is wrong? The commander is lost somewhere uphill. His gunship was shot down. He contacted me, but the transmission was terrible. When we find him, Hell Squad and a rescue group will go after him. Captain, you will be in command of the offensive while we are gone. Now, rest up a little. In half an hour we restart the attack. Dab, do you have eyes on Commander Keeley? No, sir. Maybe after the battle calm down. Cell, how are you doing on your side? Almost finishing up. A few dozen droids and we are done. Come to 498A. Leave the remaining droids to the others. Hell Squad will be needed soon. Kuvu, Metal, let's go. Guard, take over. Dajer had done all he could for the moment. Now, he could only hope Commander Keeley could wait until they found him. Chapter 117 Commander Keeley, do you copy? There was only static coming from his comlink. Five minutes of the thirty Dajer proposed had passed. Dajer used his macro binoculars and saw the smoke clearing out from the battlefield. There were five trenches waiting for them to conquer it. Still, the clones had taken a huge chunk out of the Separatist defenses. The ATTS blew holes in the droid defenses, and without the AA turrets, more and more troopers were being deployed. Sporadic laser shots could still be heard, when the snipers on both sides found someone being too bold. Dab, anything? Still nothing, sir. There are just too many gunships on the ground. But, sir. I identified at least six lots with survivors, all of them uphill. Commander Keeley can be on any of them, or in none. This is better than nothing. Transfer their location to my comm link, and we will see what we can do. Using the positions Dab gave him, Dajer compared them to where Commander Keeley should have landed. Those two are quite far from his last known position. We will leave them to the end. Then we have two gunships crashed roughly 200 meters from us, both on the left. They are his most probable location. On our right, 50 meters, there is also a downed gunship, in between this trench and the next. The last one is the worst. It crashed just before the top of the hill. Getting there will cost us a lot. As Dajer analyzed the hologram map, he used his fingers to trace red lines between their position and the lots. We will split into three groups. When we start our attack, 19 minutes from now, Lieutenant Fonder will aim for the closest one. If Commander Keeley is there, prioritize bringing him back. If he isn't, rescue our troopers. Captain Narza, your target is the two gunships on the left. They are pretty close to each other. The problem will be getting to them. If we can bring in some fresh troops, I can take the third and fourth trenches in a row, and aim for the lots in the chaos. Good plan, we will do that. Now, as for the last lot, Hell Squad will take care of it. No comments. You have your orders. We have 17 minutes to take back the wounded, no more. After that, I want every available trooper on the front. We can't lose our momentum. The clones scattered, each following their orders. A line of injured clones was created, protected by the unharmed ones, starting on the second trench and going to the temporary headquarters the clone army built. Hell Squad, replenish your ammunitions and anything we need. Especially you, Kuvu. If we are going after that last gunship, we will need a well-equipped medic. Brain, bring some ammo for me. Dab, get up here. I want all of Hell Squad together. Brain nodded and Dab made an affirmative noise. Dajer looked at his comlink. Fifteen minutes left. He wanted to sit down and rest, but didn't do it. 
He expanded the hologram map to show the whole hill, then zoomed in again. Hell Squad needed a plan if they wanted to get to the top of the hill and come back with the rescued clones. There were five trenches in their path. The higher they went, the smaller the trenches were, but the defenders were closely packed. Hell Squad had two options to get to the gunship. They could either go by the surface or by the tunnels. Both ways, they would face a lot of problems. On the surface, the most obvious flaw was that the instant they tried to advance any further than the rest of the clones, they would become a target. And if they followed the tunnels, it would take too much time, and the separatist barricades wouldn't be any easier than the ones on the surface. Besides, the tunnels were a maze for which they didn't have a map. Deja racked his brain, but still couldn't think of any solution. He looked at the time. Twelve minutes. They would have to force their way through, the best they could. I don't know how you plan to rescue Keeley, but you have to. Ragu is going with you. Immediately after Deja ended his transmission with Commander Keeley, he informed General D. The Jedi ordered them to keep pushing the attack, and to find Commander Keeley. If Ragu, the Padawan, could come with Hell Squad, it would be easier. Deja knew that because from the start of the battle till now, Hell Squad had always been the second group to arrive at the enemy trenches. Long before they did it, the Jedi were already there. Even if he wasn't together with them, Deja could imagine General D and Ragu swinging their lightsabers and deflecting lasers. Ragu would be a welcomed addition to their rescue mission. Three minutes later, Ragu arrived at where Hell Squad was. Deja was, at this moment, grabbing the magazine's brain brought for him, and strapping them to this belt. One magazine of a DC-15A had 500 rounds, but it was still depleting quite quickly on the battlefield. Anyway, when Ragu arrived, Deja stopped and gave him the standard military salute. General Ragu. I will let you lead, Deja. What is the plan? There is no real plan, General. I was originally thinking of going by the tunnels, but the chance of we getting lost is high, and I am not sure Commander Keeley has that much time. Since we now have you with us, advancing straight up might be the best choice. It is quite a distance. We won't rescue Keeley if we are dead. That is why I hope you can block the clanker's lasers. But it is your call, General. Jedi are strong, not invincible. I might be able to deflect the lasers coming from the front, but what about the droids we leave on our back? We can't destroy them all. That is our biggest problem, and to be honest, I don't have a solution for it. The ATS can't back us up. They have neither the angle nor the range to duel with their AATs. But the Sepis have the high ground. That gives them a boost in range, and they can oversee the whole hill. Six minutes left till they commence the attack again. Deja ordered Captain Narza to get the men ready. What do you think, General? By the tunnels or the surface? The Tigruta looked pensively at Deja. If we follow your plan, do you think we can make it back alive? This isn't the craziest thing Hell Squad had done, neither it is the worst. We can pull this off. Deja answered confidently. He knew it would be hard, but he never doubted Hell Squad could do it. Seeing Deja answer without hesitation, Ragu smiled. Then let's do it. Chapter 118 With the last thirty seconds slipping away on the clock, all the clones got in position. Maybe the droids noticed it, maybe they just knew the clones had to attack soon, but they also strengthened their fortifications. Hell Squad, ready? More than ever. Let's get those seppies. General Ragu, we will get out first, all right? No. You asked me to defend from the lasers coming from uphill. I will be the vanguard. Ragu pulled out his lightsaber, but didn't activate it yet. Hearing the young Tigruta talk with such strength behind his words, Deja didn't say anything else. In fact, he felt it would be an insult to ask the Padawan to stay on the back. Hell Squad looked at the Padawan with a whole new level of respect. If it was the first battle of the Padawan, they might have considered him harsh, and maybe even stupid. But Ragu had been in the trenches fighting together with the clones. He knew how dangerous it was, but still wanted to be the vanguard. That was the mentality of a soldier, and the troopers respected it. 
Dager, I will start the attack. Are the men ready? General D asked this through the communicator. Dager signaled Captain Narza and Lieutenant Fonder. Just give us the order, General. Very well. All troops, attack. General D's orders were transmitted to every clone in the battlefield. With a collective yell, the clones climbed up the trenches' side. Many of them were shot down immediately, as the blasters and turrets of the separatist bolted into action. Suddenly, the battlefield was filled with action and noise. Screams, explosions, orders being yelled. It was like a gyre waking up after a six-month-long hibernation. Angry and noisy. Ragu jumped out of the trench with a somersault, at the same time turning on his green lightsaber. He swung his lightsaber in a diagonal, from the top right to the left bottom. Two red lasers were reflected, one of them hitting the B-1 unit who fired it, and the other flew off in the distance. Dager climbed the trench's side, and opened fire. He and Hell Squad weren't to be outdone by Ragu, neither wanted to. But they had to admit the Padawan was a force to be reckoned with. In a matter of seconds, he had gotten to the third trench, and used the force to push the droids away. Ragu turned around and cut two droids in half. Their bodies fell apart, revealing even more clankers. Ragu made a pulling motion, and one droid flew directly into his lightsaber. Nevertheless, the Padawan was getting surrounded. He deflected some more lasers, and cut down some more droids, but he would soon be overwhelmed. That is why Hell Squad came to help. On one side, there was an explosion caused by Brain's thermal detonators, and it destroyed five B-1 battle droids, and one B-2 unit. On the other side, two droid heads popped out of their sockets, thanks to dabbed sniper shots. Cell and Tech were shoulders to shoulder, spraying the droids with blue lasers. Metal couldn't really use his Z-6 rotary because Ragu was in the line of fire, but he had a backup blaster, a DC-15S. And Deja used his trusted DC-15A, aiming for headshots. Even Kovu, the medic and temporary addition to Hell Squad got in the mix, and took down some clankers. All of that happened in less than five seconds, just enough time for a person blink thrice, and for Hell Squad annihilate almost three dozen droids. Dager slid into the trench, taking a couple more shots at the droids. Ragu seemed to have forgotten their objective, and was advancing at the droids, so Dager held him. General. We need to keep going. We will leave the rest of the trench for General D and our troops. That is not it. Look. Ragu pointed to some dead clones, with half their bodies inside the trench. Dager didn't understand at first, but then he saw one of the soldiers move a little, trying to crawl forward. Then he saw a droid aiming at the clone. Right, sharp. Dab turned immediately, and fixed his aim at the droid. The powerful laser from his DC-15X torn opened the side of the droid, almost splitting it in half. We really need to go, General. We have medics for the wounded, but going after them in the middle of the battle will only get us eliminated. And we have an objective, remember? But. We can't leave him. He is a soldier, he will hold on until help arrives. Let's go. There was pain on the Padawan's eyes when he turned away from the wounded clone. After all, he was still a child. A powerful, brave one, but still young. Sorry, brother. Dager whispered at the clone, so low only he himself could hear it. The clone had a piece of scrap metal puncturing his neck. Dager knew that even if he received immediate treatment, the trooper wouldn't survive. Leaving the clone behind, Hell Squad followed Ragu, and left the third trench for the rest of the army. The distance between the third and the fourth trenches was bigger than the distance between the second AD the third by about 25 meters. That didn't seem like much, but it could cost Hell Squad their lives if they weren't careful. General Ragu. We can't go on a straight line as we did before. We have to try not to stand off too much. Since they had been in the middle of the clone army up till now, Hell Squad and the Padawan hadn't been spotted yet. But a lone group of clones crossing between trenches would catch a lot of attention. Follow me. However, Ragu seemed to have other plans, and totally ignored Dager's advice. 
he spun his lightsaber so fast that it turned in a bright circle. It was very eye-catching, but super effective. Every laser that hit the spinning lightsaber was reflected back, and not one crossed Regu's defense. It also did the opposite of what Dager wanted. Not only the droids in the fourth trench noticed them, but some of the third also did. In a span of seconds, Hell Squad was being attacked for both sides. Dager couldn't understand why Ragu had done that, but there was no going back. Kuvu, Cell, Metal. On me. Dager took aim at the droids in the third trench, hoping to reduce the number of their enemies. His focus wasn't to eliminate all the clankers, but just suppress them until Hell Squad was in the fourth trench. Miraculously, they all managed to get to the fourth trench before something went wrong. While Ragu had jumped in the trench together with Dab, Brain and Tech, Dager and the others were a few steps away. When Dager was about to jump inside the trench, Kuvu slammed into him, and they both tumbled down. Dager hit the bottom of the trench headfirst. Kuvu. What was that? Kuvu. Oh, damn it. Before he could get angry, Dager saw why Kuvu had crashed into him. Two black holes had appeared in his back. The poor clone would never fight again. Come on, Dager. What are you waiting for? We are giving them a beady. No. Chapter 119 Come on, Dager. What are you waiting for? We are giving them a beady. No. The moment the Padawan turned around, the smile on his face changed into a scream of sadness. It was as if his yell had supernatural powers, and all the droids in a ten meters radius were pushed away by the force wave he unleashed. Taking advantage of the seconds they won, Brain and Tech pulled Kovu's body from above Dager, and laid it carefully on the ground. Dager sighed, but got up and fired at the droids all the same. The death of Kovu was sad, but so was the death of all the clones in this galactic war. The battle wouldn't stop because of it, and Hell Squad couldn't mourn now. I I I didn't mean it. I only wanted to save Keeley A as fast as possible. We still have three trenches to cross, General. We need to go. But. Kovu. Dager looked at the medic's body. The clone had stayed with Hell Squad for only a few hours, but it still hurts to lose a brother. There is nothing we can do for him, General. We need to go, now. The clankers are closing in. Dab approached Dager, and showed him the hologram map. Sir. We are still 230 meters away from the objective. I know. Dab, urged the general, very carefully. Cell, Tech, Brain, we will scout ahead, see if there is anywhere we can advance without attracting more attention. While Dager led the others, Dab approached Ragu. He understood that Kuvu had died because the Padawan had been reckless, but in his clone soldier mentality, he didn't know why they stopped because of that. General, we really need to go. Commander Keeley is still out there, and we need to rescue him. Dab. Kovu is dead. Because of me. Not because of you, General. It was a droid blaster that eliminated him, not you. Besides, this is a war. Kovu died fighting for what he believed. For the Republic. Maybe it was because Ragu believed him, or maybe it was because he just needed a reason to keep going, but the Padawan got up. He gave Kovu's dead body one last glance, then followed the direction that Dager went. Tech, get down. The mechanic of Hell Squad immediately dropped to the ground after his squad leader yelled at him, just in time to dodge a wrist rocket that would have hit him right in the chest. Whipping out his blaster, Tech fired a stream of blue lasers in the B-2 Super Battle Droid Torso. Reloading. Tech pulled the trigger once again, but a click showed the blaster was empty. The moment he started to reload, Cell and Brain stepped forward, and covered him. Deja ran forward, and used the walls of the trench as a shield. Red lasers blew dirt and mud in the air, and big holes appeared in his already precarious protection. But since he didn't plan on staying there for long, it didn't matter. The leader of Hell Squad, the only clone aside from the commanders with painting on his armor, came out of hiding wielding his DC-15A in one hand and his DC-17 on the other. 
his shots hit the droids either in the head or in the upper part of the chest. He was aiming at their core components, respectively the central core and the principal movement control center. Destroying either of those would put the droid out of combat immediately. One of the reasons why the droid army was so worse than the clone army was because just one laser in the right target would make them useless, even if they were still alive. Of course, if a clone took a shot to the head or the heart, he would surely die, but droids usually didn't have such a good aim. The only reason why the Separatist could fight back was because of the staggering amount of droids their army had. Back to the combat. Dager eliminated six droids before he had to reload. Thankfully, he wasn't alone. Brain did his thing, which was thrown thermal detonators. A blazing path was blasted amidst the droids, and there was silence for some time. Dager called Dab through his comlink. Dab, get over here. We cleared this area. We are already underway. Seconds later, Ragu walked over. His face was expressionless, but he still walked stiffly. General. I just checked with General D, and they just took the third trench, and are in the process of attacking this one. Uff. It is as you said, Dager. We need to keep going. What do you think is the best way to get to Keeley? We don't know if the commander is in that lot, General. But I think I know how we can get there. Using that. Ragu looked to what Dager was pointing, and his eyes became wide open. That is a separatist AAT. And it is destroyed. What are you thinking? It was true. Halfway between the fourth and the fifth trench, an AAT was laying with its front half buried. The hatch was opened, and a dead droid was hanging on it. Tech said he can get it back in motion. If we get it moving, we can probably blast through the fifth trench, maybe even the sixth. The closer we get, the better our chances of rescuing anyone on that gunship. Sir. We got the first gunship. Two wounded, the rest dead. No sign of Commander Keeley. Okay, Lieutenant. Get the wounded to a medical base, and keep going. Captain Narza, what is your status? We already started the attack on the fourth trench. In a few minutes, we should be able to get to the two lots. Do that. Captain, soon, there will be a separatist tank moving up. Do not shoot it. Hell Squad and General Ragu are the ones with it. Captain Narza didn't even think it was weird that Hell Squad would hijack a separatist AAT. The clones of the 303rd had long been used Hell Squad crazy doings. Only Ragu was surprised. You were already thinking about it even before we got here, right? One thing I learned with Commander Keeley was to always have a plan. Dager looked over the trench side, and calculated the distance to the AAT. Well, we better get going. And, Dager. Yes, General. I am sorry. I never wanted. What happened? To happen. Dager kept quiet, and the young Padawan turned on his lightsaber. Hell Squad, we are advancing. Let's go. Chapter 120 Ragu, the Jedi apprentice, jumped out of the trench with another somersault. Dager and the clones got out more casually, by climbing it. Surprisingly, they did not come immediately under fire, because most of the droids were still worrying about the forces attacking the fourth trench. They didn't expect a small group of clones to come out of the trench they were defending. Thanks to that, the clones got to the AAT pretty quickly, and without complications. Tech, get in there, get it moving. Tech grabbed the barrel of the tank, and pulled himself up. He pushed the droid body out of the way, and it made a scraping sound as it slid down the tank. Seconds later, another droid was thrown out. When it hit the ground, Dager stared at it curiously. A droid sergeant. Although I've been fighting with them for four months, this is actually the first time I see a droid officer. I think we eliminated a couple of those not long ago. They were on that bunker brain destroyed. The droid sergeant had a yellow circle in his chest, and the top of its head also had yellow markings. In Dager's opinion, both made for pretty good targets the clones could aim at. Got it. A muffled voice came over from the AAT, and suddenly, it started trembling. The front part, which was buried, 
raised little by little, and then snapped back to position. Soil was thrown in the air, showering the clones with mud. The tank hovered in midair, and although it seemed to a little damaged, it was working. The barrel made a sharp turn, and started aiming at the fifth trench, instead of the fourth. The main body of the AAT followed soon. Dajer climbed the back of the tank, and entered it. The interior of the separatist vehicle was brownish-red, and full of mechanisms which functions were unknown to Dajer. The only two obvious controls were the driving on and the cannon one. It was all Hell Squad needed. Cell, hop inside, this cannon needs two to operate. The others, stay close to the back, use it as cover. General Ragu, when you give the order. The Padawan nodded, and Tech pushed a lever, making the AAT go forward. Inside the tank, Deja was looking at the red aim control panel, while Cell was loading the ammunition. The screen in front of Dajer showed a huge number of droids right in front of them, each of them marked with a white dot. He figured that meant they were considered allies. Tech, see if you can override the aim weapon system. I don't think it will let us shoot at the droids. On it. Cell, take control here for a moment. All right. Tech and Cell switched positions, and Tech started tapping on the screen. Suddenly, there was an impact and everyone inside the AAT was thrown from one side to the other. What was that? Cell returned to the driver's seat and apologized to Dajer. Sorry, sir. This thing turns a lot slower than I thought. We hit a tank carcass. Get this thing back in track. Now. However, before Dajer could even get back up, the AAT shuddered. What now? Cell, that better not be your doing. It isn't, sir. Brain, status. They saw us, sir. That was one of their turrets, although it missed. I think we can start attacking now. After Brain said that, he immediately fired his blaster, although the distance made hitting something difficult. Dajer put his head out of the tank, and saw one turret had turned towards them, and one AAT was advancing in their direction. Tech, we need the weapon system online. Just another second. Got it. We are free to fire. Cell, get over here, reload as soon as we fire. Tech, get back to driving. General, how are you doing out there? Still all right. The AAT is blocking most of the lasers. Since there was no immediate threat to the Jedi, Dajer sat back at the gunner's seat and looked at the screen. The white markings had changed colors and became green. Besides, the AAT coming towards them was marked with a bigger target. Dajer turned the cannon towards the enemy AAT, and both fired at almost the same time. Both missed. The red blast fired by the enemy passed two meters away, while the one fired by Dajer caressed the enemy tank without doing any harm. Reload. Cell picked up the big shells used by the AAT, each filled with a deadly amount of Tabana gas. Ready. As soon as he heard Cell's voice, Dajer fired again. He had corrected his aim, and the laser hit the enemy AAT in the bottom left. The vehicle swaggered with the impact, but although a chunk was missing, it was still firing. The first hit Hell Squad's AAT took was right in the center of the tank, where the armor was the strongest. Still, everything trembled, and the ammunition was knocked out of Cell's hands. That gave the enemy the chance to fire once more, and they hit the same place. No matter how strong the frontal armor was, it still was heavily damaged. Frontal plate at 61%. Another two rounds and this thing will be gone. Quick, Cell. Doing his best under the precarious conditions, Cell managed to put another shell inside the cannon's chamber. Dajer aimed at the same place he hit before, trying to take out the enemy tank's mobility. His aim was perfect, and the whole bottom of the AAT suddenly was gone. Without its support, the tank couldn't hover above the ground anymore, and it flipped over, leaving a scar in the earth. One more. Without the threat of the AAT, Dajer could aim calmly at it while it was down. The immobile tank could neither fire nor run, and Dajer blew it up with a red blast. Nevertheless, it was too soon to celebrate. The turret was still on the game, 
and since Hell Squad had been advancing towards it while dueling with the AAT, it was dangerously close. The already damaged frontal armor of the AAT took two consecutive shots. Although individually they were less powerful than the main cannon of the AAT, the turret could fire a lot faster. Armor at 30%. Cannon is ready, sir. Dajer turned the cannon, and locked on the turret's position. The laser found a straight path to the turret, but Dajer had failed to account for the distance, and it fell short. A bunch of unlucky droids were blasted to pieces, but the turret was intact. One more laser hit the AAT, but Tech managed to dodge the other. 19%. Ready. That was the final shot. If Dajer missed, he would order the clones to leave the AAT, and they would be on open ground. He adjusted the angle of the cannon barrel, and took a deep breath before pulling the trigger. In a millisecond, the red laser left the AAT, and hit the turret. Oh yeah! Chapter 121 With the turret blasted to pieces, Hell Squad had only small firearms going against them. The lasers fired by the E-5s peppered the damaged AAT, but did nothing. We are approaching the trench, sir. Keep going, Tech. Instead of stopping when they reached the fifth trench, Dager ordered them to continue. The AAT bumped into some droids, and crushed them under its weight. Oh oh. That is not good. Heavy Vehicle AAT 398D, stop. What? The only effect on the AAT when it ran over the droids and the trench was a slight shaking. Just like that, the fifth trench was left behind them. If they could use the AAT to cross the sixth trench, then it was almost guaranteed that they would get to the lot they were looking for. Sir. Are you there? Captain. Deja was called by Captain Narza, but he only brought bad news. We recovered the two lots assigned to us, but there is no sign of Commander Keeley. I also sent search groups for the two we left to the end, but the result was negative. Leave that to Hell Squad. We are approaching the last gunship. How long before we take the fourth trench? Estimated time is 12 minutes. Lower it to 8. This battle already lasted too much. We need to take the hill before nightfall. Dab, how is the path ahead? Full of clankers, but no big guns. We are clear to go. Good. Brain, take my place here. Blast every seppai on the way. With pleasure, sir. Dajer lifted himself through the hatch, careful not to be shot by the multitude of red lasers, and slid through the back if the AAT until he hit the ground. The members of Hell Squad who were outside, namely Brain, Metal and Dab, made space for him, and Brain entered the tank. The clones were firing at the droids in the sixth trench, showing only a part of their bodies, then hiding in the safety the AAT provided. Of course, it wasn't 100% safe, since they had to deal with a few sporadic shots from the clankers in the fifth trench. For that reason, Ragu had his green lightsaber turned on, and was facing the direction from which they came and was reflecting the lasers. General Ragu. The other gunships had all been searched. Commander Keeley is either on the lot we are heading to or in one we haven't found yet. How long? Uff. Before we can get to that lot? If we continue like this, 10 to 12 minutes. We only. Wait. Master. Yes. Yeah, we are close. 10 minutes. Ragu interrupted Dajer and answered someone Dajer couldn't hear, but figured it was General D. Dajer, my master wants us to do something else after we rescue Keeley. He said you would be the only one crazy enough to do it. Hell Squad was created because we are willing to do all sorts of crazy things. And I am sure Commander Keeley will join us. What is it, General? Three hours after the battle for Dantuin had started, the 303rd Attack Legion had conquered five out of the seven trenches they had as a target. Without a minute of pause, the clones were now launching an offensive against the 6th Trench Line. On the right flank of the clone forces, a Jedi with dry, Brown Skin was swinging his lightsaber and leading the clones. On the left, the one commanding was a clone captain called Narza. And down in the middle of the battlefield, ahead of every other clone, was an AAT, 
crushing its way over the sixth trench and continuing without a stop. Left, left, left. Warned by brain, Dejer turned the cannon to a group of droids which were preparing some thermal detonators. After he sent droid parts flying, his vision seemed to clear, and he saw a crashed Republic gunship. The nose of the gunship was buried in the ground, and one of the wings had broken off and was nowhere to be seen. General. Straight ahead. Hell Squad, move up, form a defense line. As soon as Dejer warned him, Ragu left the cover provided by the AAT and ran to the lot. His supernatural Jedi instincts helped him dodge each and every laser fired his away. Dejer jumped out of the tank and also went for the lot. When he got to the crashed gunship, he saw Ragu was cutting a hole through the side of the lot. Since the metal frame of the gunship wasn't that thick, he soon had cut an opening. The interior of the lot was originally dark, but a circle of light fell on the clones inside when Ragu cut the side of the gunship. Dejer entered the lot, and saw a scene of destruction. Clones were laying on the floor, some clearly dead, with their bodies twisted in impossible angles, and others whose status was unknown. One of those covered his eyes with his hand when Dejer entered. Brother. Are you all right? It's you. Dejer had knelt beside the clone when he heard Commander Keeley's voice behind him. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the commander was lowering one of his DC-17, which had been pointed to Dejer's back. His other DC-17 was somewhere under a metal plate that was covering the entire right side of his body. Dejer pulled the plate, and Commander Keeley was able to move his arm, although he seemed to be in pain. Take it easy, Commander. Hell Squad is here to help. I know. It was just in case you were a clanker. General Ragu. Stay down, Keeley. When he saw the Padawan coming in, the wounded clone commander tried to get up, but Ragu stopped him. While Padawan and commander were talking, Brain got inside the lot and helped Dejer move the wounded. Hey, guard. Whoa, be careful, brother. Let me see this. Um. Dejer found Lieutenant Guard, one of the finest men of the 303rd badly injured, but still breathing. Err. I think you broke three or four ribs, and your arm is also not very good. But you should get back in shape pretty soon. Wait for a minute, let me see the others. In total, there were eleven surviving clones, including Commander Keeley. Some, like the commander, had minor injuries, and were able to get back to the fight. Others had medium wounds, and would need help to even walk. Guard was in this group. And two clones had heavy injuries. One of them, a pilot called Siege had knocked his head on the crash, and was just barely alive. The other was Orluo, who had lost both legs at knee length. He had lost a lot of blood, and needed emergency treatment, which Hell Squad couldn't provide. General Ragu. We need to get these men back to a medical base as soon as possible. We still have my master's task. We will split into two groups. I will lead those who can fight, and the wounded will use the AAT to get back. With our forces advancing, they should meet the vanguard soon. All of that was decisively said by Ragu, surprising Dejer, because that was what he was about to say. The Padawan was growing at an impressive pace, and Dejer couldn't help but wonder if this had something to do with Kovu's death. Yes, sir. Chapter 122 Keeley, you should head back with the others. The men need to see you in battle. With all due respect, General, they will see me when we take this damn hill. Seeing Commander Keeley and Ragu go back and forth with their argument, Dejer had to intervene. After all, there was still a battle raging outside. I've known Commander Keeley for quite some time. Unless you give him a direct order, he won't let us have all the fun. And he can help a lot. I don't know. Wait, let me talk to my master. If he says you have to stay back, you will stay back, understood? While Ragu was talking to General D, Commander Keeley approached Dejer. Dejer, thanks for coming after us. I am sure it was difficult, considering Hell Squad is two trench lines further than the rest of our forces. Helping my commander is amongst my duties. Thanks anyway. And, Dejer. I didn't see Kovu outside. He didn't make it. 
He was a good soldier. He was. While the two highest ranking officers of the 303rd were talking, Sel made his way inside the crashed lot with his hologram map open. Commander Keeley. Good to see you. Hello, Sel. What is it? We need to move, Commander. The AAT held pretty strongly, but if it stays under fire like that, its armor will soon be gone. Come with me. General Ragu probably made his decision already. The clone commander put back his helmet, and stepped outside of the gunship as if he hadn't almost died inside it minutes before. Dajer picked up the DC-15A he had left on the floor, and followed his commander. The bright sunlight blinded him for a second, but his eyes were used to it. The battlefield was still the same mess he had left behind, with the difference the clone vanguard was now closer. Dajer adjusted his macro binoculars, and saw they were almost in control of the fifth trench. Commander Keeley went straight to Ragu, who was talking in his comlink while spinning his lightsaber. General. Have you come to a decision? Huff. All right, Keeley, you will be coming with us. Dajer, get Hell Squad together. Shirley and Rocky, you will also come with us. Dajer, send the wounded back. We will leave when they are on their way. Dajer walked over to the AAT, and ordered Tech and Brain to leave their new toy. Then, he put as many wounded as possible in the tank. The rest would have to walk, but their injuries weren't so bad. Finally, he called Captain Narza, who had been leading the attack. Captain Narza, do you copy? We have Commander Keeley. I repeat, we have the Commander. I hear you loud and clear, sir. It is good to hear Commander Keeley is all right. From where are you coming back? I will send a platoon to secure the way. Coordinates 267D. The AAT we stole will be coming down with the injured. Commander Keeley and Hell Squad have a mission uphill. Copy that. In command of the AAT was Lieutenant Guard, who had a nasty arm injury, but insisted on holding his blaster with the other hand. Not that anyone tried to stop him, as having a weapon was the only way to guarantee one had a chance to live on a battlefield. Just before Dajer sent the clones off, Commander Keeley walked over to them. Guard, give me your comm link. I lost mine at the crash. Here it is, sir. A red laser hit the ground between the two clones, making them turn their heads to the source. The droids were getting more accurate, and now that there were so many clones, the chances of someone getting shot were growing. Go. Use that tank to blast as many droids you can, then leave it behind. Let's move. With the tank gone, so was a great part of the protection the clones who stayed had. All the time they were taking the clones out of the crashed gunship, Tech and Brain had been blasting the nearby droids. Hell Squad had to move to the last trench line before the droids realized they wouldn't get blasted anymore. All troops, this is Imagun D. Start to push up with all we have another blow and the Separatist will be crushed. May the Force be with us. From all comlinks came the voice of the Jedi the 303rd had learned to respect. Even with such a short message, all clones became more motivated, and doubled the effort they were putting in the offensive. The 5th Trench remaining defenses crumbled in seconds, and the Republic Army continued without stop. General D's Padawan pointed his lightsaber to the 7th Trench. Let's go. We are almost there. Oh no oh. BZZT. The B-1 battle droid fell to the ground slowly, his vocal controls falling as it shut down. Dajer stepped on the droid body with his DC-15A ready to the next one, but this was the last clanker on the bunker. Continue, don't stop. A loud clanging ladder, an AB-2 unit dropped to the droid in three smoking pieces. Ragu turned around looking for his next target, and found nothing but clones. Was that the last one? I think so, yes. The hill is ours, General. The Padawan turned off his lightsaber. His young face had been serious all the time till now, but when he heard Commander Keeley's words he relaxed. He exited the bunker, and looked at the long line of dead droids. They had lost Shirley to get there, but the hardest obstacle to the capture of Dantuin had been eliminated. 
Now, the Republic Army could build a base from where they could coordinate all the invasion. Ragu picked his comlink to inform General D of the good news. Master, we took the top of the hill. We won. We won this battle, my young Padawan. There is still a long way before Dantuin is on the Republic side. But you are right. We won. While Master and Apprentice were talking, Dager and Commander Keeley were strengthening their foothold on top of the hill. Admiral Dow sent down the troops and supplies. We need that base ready before nightfall. Captain Narza, hurry up and take the sixth trench. Then send all the ATS to the top of the hill. We need to make sure the clankers can't get it back. Commander, Subcommander, you should see this. Rocky called both Dager and Commander Keeley to the opposite side of the bunker. There, an opening let them see the path they would have to take until they had conquered the planet. Chapter 123 Dantuin was a mixture of grass plains and rock plateaus, and had no big water bodies. Most of the planet was flat, without mountains, and with just a few hills. So, when Dager and Commander Keeley looked south, they could see Garang, the capital city of Dantuin, without any problems, even if it was 200 kilometers away. The only things obstructing the view were the hundreds of thousands of droids in the way. Seeing the lines of clankers, the AATs, dwarf spider droids and whatnot, Dager started calculating what it would cost the clones to take Dantuin. There are a lot more clankers than I thought. Dager, organize the men. We need all troops well rested for tomorrow. And get a good number of patrols. I want every single corner of this hill under our eyes. If we lose it, we might not get it back. Dager turned around and grouped with his squad. Shirley had died, but no one else had gotten hurt, and although Hell Squad was very tired, they were still pumped up because of their recent victory. As per usual, the most talkative was Cell, followed by Brain. We did it, sir. Man, I was sure we would die. Did you see how many clankers we destroyed? It was easy. No Seppai can stay on the way of the Republic. Quiet. Listening to Brain and Cell discuss arrogantly, Dager yelled at them for the very first time since Hell Squad was created. He couldn't see Hell Squad members' faces under their helmets, but he knew that the two clones were only externalizing what all the clones were thinking. And he knew why they were thinking that. Ever since Hell Squad was created, on the first battle of the Clone Wars, they had sufficient nothing but minor setbacks. Even 3-4 injury didn't seem so serious, since they knew he would recover. Not too long ago, Dager had been thinking the same, but Kovu's death had impacted him, mainly because he knew it could have been avoided. As an officer, it was his responsibility to be confident, but not arrogant. You all think the clankers are so useless they can do nothing to threaten us. If the Separatists were as weak as you seem to think they are, wouldn't this war already be won? If they are so weak, why didn't we crush them immediately? Sir, we didn't. Silence. Your superior is speaking. Immediately, all the clones straightened their backs. They had been around Dager for so long that they unconsciously forgot he was their subcommander. When Dager yelled at them, the obedience on their genetic code kicked in instantaneously. Not only can the droids stay on our way, but they did it today. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking only with you five, but also with Kuvu, Shirley, Tutti, Leet and many others. Hell Squad stayed quiet. Dager didn't know if they understood what he was saying or not, but he couldn't care less. He looked down the hill to the sixth trench, where combat was still happening. Move out, directly north. When we get to the sixth trench, split into two groups. I want this hill clear from any seppies before sunset. Already scared by Dager's rage, Hell Squad moved immediately in orderly. Looking at them, unnoticed, was Commander Keeley. Only he knew what thoughts were on his head, but there was a smile on his face. Orange light shone upon the hill as the sun rose, illuminating the clone army. Dozens of ATES were on top of the hill, ready to crash down on their enemies. Behind the ATES were the smaller ATRT, All Terrain Recon Transport and all-terrain attack pods, at AP. Of course, those weren't the only ones who would attack. Behind the heavy vehicles, thousands of clones lined up, 
waiting for their orders. General D, his Padawan Ragu, Commander Keeley and Dajer were in the command center, discussing their plans with a holographic General Skywalker and Captain Rex. During the night, the 501st Legion had taken control of their landing zone, and would start to attack Kunda at roughly the same time the 303rd attacked Garong. That is, if both legions could get to the city today. Normally, advancing 200 kilometers in one day was nothing, but considering the number of droids on their way, anything could happen. When Dajer had discussed with Commander Keeley before, both of them agreed the estimated time to reach the capital was between 10 to 15 days. But the Jedis seemed to think it was too long. General D, General Skywalker, the only way to get to the capital is by using a frontal attack. No air support, no infiltration. They have AA turrets everywhere, and the whole city is filled with droids. I know. I am only saying that we can't spend that much time to take a single, almost unimportant planet. There are other places in the galaxy that need us more. No matter how hard Commander Keeley and Captain Rex tried to convince the young General Skywalker that it was impossible to hurry the conquest of a planet, it was for nothing. Even General D seemed to think that the 15 days estimation that the clones had given to him was too much. In the end, the three clone officers were forced to drop the matter, because the attack was about to start. This time Commander Keeley didn't do any speeches. With one order from him, ATTES and AT APS fired a volley with their mass drive cannons, and the clone army started marching downhill to meet their opponents. Let's get to work, boys. General, we just received updates from some battlefields. Cough. Cough. Tell me. General Grievous answered with his coarse voice. At the moment he was inside his capital ship, sitting in the captain's chair. Ryloth has fallen to the Republic. Kessel is still under our control, but it is slowing falling to the Republic. Felucia and Bespin are in a standstill. Christophsis and Deveran are under our total control, with only a few resistance pockets remaining. Dantuin. Don't bother me with those unimportant planets. What difference can a piece of rock like that make? Cough. The droid just ignored General Grievous' words. He was reporting this to the abomination under General Dooku's orders. Dantuin is falling much faster than we expected. Two legions, namely 303rd Attack Legion and 501st Legion. Ah! Before the droid had the chance to finish, his chest was trespassed with a sharp blade. What are you doing, Heige? This unit belongs to Count Dooku. The Mon Calamari said nothing, but the hatred in his eyes spoke better than any word. After he eliminated the droid, he gave General Grievous a sharp stare, then turned around and left. General, he left in his ship. General Grievous ignored the droid, and kicked the body of the unit Heige eliminated to the side. He walked to the end of the command bridge, and looked down. Below his ship, a Republic cruiser was split in half, its remains filling the empty space. Chapter 124 the initial charge the clones made had gigantic momentum, and with the support of the heavy vehicles, they tore straight through the first offensive line of the droids. The AT-RTS were the first to get to the bottom of the hill. Many riders were shot off their walkers, and some even blew, but many more made it, and fired their mortars in the middle of the droids, causing massive casualties. The Republic had taken action shortly after they received news that Dantuin had been conquered by the Separatist. Because of their fast reaction, the droids didn't have much time to build their defenses, and much of their effort went to the hill that the 303rd had already taken. The 303rd might have taken the hill in just one day, but that was only because they hadn't spared any effort or troops to do it. After the battle for Dantuin was over, Dajer would discover that one-fifth of their casualties came from the very first day of battle. Since the droids didn't have the time to set up more trenches, the battle for Dantuin was pretty much a pitched battle, with both sides colliding against one another. In a battle of such gigantic proportions, there was little Hell Squad could do other than charge with their brothers. The clone army made good progress in the first day of battle, nowhere near as much as the Jedis wanted, but above what Dajer and Commander Keeley had expected. When they stopped at night, they had conquered 27 kilometers of ground. If they continued like this, they would reach Garong in less than 10 days. 
But as the battle raged on, the droid resistance became stronger, and the Republic started to gain less and less ground every day. On the second day, they advanced 24 kilometers, and on the third day, only 20. By the fourth day, less than 20 kilometers were conquered. Both General D and his Padawan had lost their initial enthusiasm, and understood why the clone commanders were so serious. On the fifth day the Jedis didn't even have dinner with the clones, as they had been doing, but went straight to their tents and fell asleep immediately. Both Jedis had been on the front lines for the last few days, giving everything they had. But not only the progress was less than they expected, the casualties were also many. It was no wonder they were so tired, both physically and mentally. That night, while the Jedis were resting, Dager and Commander Keeley were talking with Captain Rex. Surprisingly, the Legion that had made the most progress on the battlefield wasn't the veteran 303rd Attack Legion, but the rookie 501st. When he discovered that the 501st Legion was an elite Legion, Dager had already given them a high evaluation, putting them on the same tier as those Legions that had joined the war in the second or third month. But it appeared he had underestimated the 501st. While the 303rd was still struggling with the remaining 90 kilometers they had to conquer, the 501st was just 30 kilometers away from Kunda. Captain Rex insisted that most of it was because of General Skywalker, but Dager wasn't so sure. Even a Jedi couldn't do that much on a big battle. From that moment onwards, Dager knew that unless the 501st was completely exterminated in one battle, they would be a major force on the Republic's side. Good job, Rex. How long before you arrive at Kunda? Two days, three at most. After that, we still have to evaluate how we are going to attack the city. Do you have enough troops? Even if I don't, is there anything we can do? You all have your hands full. He is right, Dager. The 501st has been doing okay for the last few days, they will have to keep that way. Captain, good luck tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Good luck to you too. Captain Rex out. Captain Rex ended the transmission on his side, and the blue hologram disappeared. Commander Keeley turned to Dager. He wasn't using his helmet, and Dager could see he was tired. Since they had the same face, Dager imagined he wasn't looking any better. Commander Keeley sighed. Go get some sleep, Dager. Tomorrow is going to be another hard day. The closer we get to the capital, the harder it becomes. I know, sir. Until tomorrow. Dager left the command tent, and went to where Hell Squad was sleeping. While walking he crossed with many patrols. Ever since the first day, they had suffered many sneak attacks during the night, so the number of clones on guard duty had been doubled. Dager sat down on the ground. While in battle, the clones didn't have many liberties, and all they had to sleep was a sleeping bag. It was better than what many had. When they were on Geonosis, they all slept on the hard ground. The moment Dager closed his eyes, he felt his sore body relax a little, and drifted into sleep. Still, he couldn't escape the nightmares. For days later, Dager stood up beside a dead clone, after confirming there was nothing he could do for him. He looked ahead. The once green field was now a mess of mud and lifeless bodies. Here and there, columns of smoke could be seen rising from the vehicles. Transmission from Commander Keeley for you. Dager turned on his comlink, and Commander Keeley gave him the first good news in the last few days. Kunda is ours. General Skywalker and his troops conquered it. They will come to help us as soon as they can. Yes. That is good news, Commander. It sure is. We have to hurry up. If the 501st arrives here and we aren't even at the gates of Garang, that will be the biggest shame on the 303rd history. You know us very well, Commander. Just tell the troops we are falling behind, and the 303rd will have Dantuan before nightfall. That is what I wanted to hear. On the evening of the next day, the last line of droid defenses around Garang fell. On the night of the same day, the troops of the 501st Legion arrived. On the twelfth day of battle, Garang was conquered, and Dantuan became part of the Republic. Twelve days might look like few to conquer a planet, but Dantuan was just an unimportant planet, 
with almost no value for both sides. So, the droid army that was protecting the planet wasn't strong. The only reason Republic and Separatist even fought for Dantuin was to show the other planets that they wouldn't give up without a fight, and to try and lure them to their side. It was too political for Dager to even bother trying to understand. Chapter 125 The clones had no time to rest after they took Dantuin. The Clone Wars had been raging on for five months now, and the Republic needed every troop it could get. So, no more than two days after Garong was conquered, the 303rd received their new assignment. General D called all the higher-ups of the 303rd Attack Legion to a building in the center of Garang, where the Republic had set their command center. Every officer from lieutenant to commander was there, which meant that something big was about to be announced. As soon as Dager arrived, the officers opened a path to him, and he stopped next to the hologram table. Different from other times, at this moment the hologram wasn't showing a specific planet, but a whole sector of the galaxy. General D zoomed into one system, called Durachner. We still haven't received our next target, but there is something the Senate wanted us to do before we go anywhere. He looked at Commander Keeley in Dager, and gave them one of his rare smiles. Dager hadn't known what this meeting was about before, but now he had a vague idea. Thanks to the efforts of your commander, Keeley, and other clone commanders through the galaxy, the Galactic Senate authorized the creation and mass production of a new type of armor. I will let Keeleen Dager explain all about it to you later. As important as the modifications and updates the Phase II armor has, it is the fact each Legion can customize their armor. Only the discipline ingrained in their bones stopped the clones from starting to talk. To them, being able to differentiate themselves from the other clones in the galaxy was as important as winning a battle. That was the reason why they had so many different haircuts and tattoos. I've passed to Keeley the responsibility of deciding what the armor will look like. But, we have to go to Durachner system, where there is a Republic factory, to pick it up. And we have to do that soon, otherwise we will be sent to another battle, and it will be some time before the 303rd have the chance to have its new armor. So, you have three hours to get every trooper on the cruisers. The 501st will stay here on Dantuin until someone is sent to guard the planet. Get going. Of course, all the clones were so pumped up that they got moving immediately. In no time, Dejer could hear orders being barked, and the sound of men rushing to tide up the supplies, vehicles and weapons. After making sure everything was on the right course, Dejer approached Commander Keeley, who looked surprisingly serious in face of the good news. You did it, Commander. All I did was speed things up. As soon as we started losing battles because our armor was inferior, the higher-ups would have changed it. I don't know, Dager. A new armor might save the lives of a few men, or even many, but it is for naught if the Separatists start overwhelming us. Do you remember what Lama Su said when we left Kamino? One battle and we all could return home. That didn't happen, did it? Look at us. Five months of war, and nothing have been decided yet. I am not complaining. I just wonder, how many more brothers shall lose their lives before the Seppis understand they can't win this war? When he heard that, Dager almost choked. What Commander Keeley was saying might seem like a complaint for many, but if someone deliberately misunderstood it, it could very well be seen as treason. In the middle of a war, talking bad about your superiors was punishable by court-martial. But questioning the purpose of the war, that was much worse. From that, it could be seen how much Commander Keeley trusted Dager. By all military laws, Dager should have denounced his commander. Of course he didn't. Commander. Keeley. Are you all right? Dager's words surprised Commander Keeley, and only then did he seem to realize what he was saying. Yes. Yes. Subcommander Dager, let's get to our duties. A few hours later, General D's fleet came out of hyperspace in the Durachner system. Dager boarded one CR-90 Corvette, and descend into the moon where the Republic factory was, to oversee the operation. The one in charge of the factory was one of the long-necked, calm, Kaminoans. Yadi Lu showed Dager around the factory, and the many different armors they were producing. There were armors painted with shades of green, others with red, blue and yellow. 
Deja could recognize to which legions they belonged just based on the color and patterns. But the one that interested Deja the most, was, of course, the new Phase II armor belonging to the 303rd Attack Legion. It wasn't much different from the old Phase I in terms of design, but its defensive capabilities were stronger, and the visors were better, able to provide night vision and a dozen other minor abilities that could enhance the clone army as a whole. Still, what was the most different of all, was, of course, the colors. Replacing the old all-white armor, this one had the brownish-red of the 303rd. There was a coating of paint around the T-shaped visor, and the whole chest area was brown. The arms also had a good amount of paint on them, and so did the back and the thighs. At first it seemed to be purely aesthetic, but Yadi Lu soon gave a surprising piece of information to Dejer. According to him, the armor had been designed thinking about General D, who, as a Nikto, preferred fighting in the desert. Because of that, when the clones laid on a muddy, dusty or rocky surface, they would have an extra layer of camouflage. But the surprises weren't over yet. Yadi Lu brought Dejer to a small set of crates, and asked him to open it. Inside, there were 303rd armors, but different from the others. Each set of armor had a different pattern, but all of them had the same helmet. Dejer recognized it because it was the same he had. On the left side, a single stylized horn came all the way from the bottom to the top. These are hell squads. Master Imagun D specifically asked us to make them that way. That is yours. Dejer picked up the armor set that Yadi Lu showed him. It had two black shoulder pads, and it was entirely brownish-red apart from the stomach and a zigzagging line on the arms and legs. He put the armor back in the crate, and thanked the Kaminoan, then closed the crate. Metal. Tech. Get this crate inside the ship. Lieutenant Shield, let's wrap this up. I want all this in the sincerity in two hours. Chapter 126 Metal and Tech grabbed the crate, and moved it to the CR-90 Corvette. After two hours, every set of Phase II armor was transported to the Corvettes. Now, all they had to do was distribute the armors, and the 303rd would be ready for the next battle. Dager, if the loading is over, get the Corvettes out of there, the 327th needs to dock. Dager looked through a window, and saw that another group of Republic ships had come out of hyperspace. Lieutenant, get everyone back to the ships, and return to the fleet. The 327th need this space. In a few minutes, all the 303rd clones were back in the corvettes. With almost no shaking, the ships took off from the moon's surface, and joined General D's fleet just in time to catch a transmission commander Keeley sent to Dager. Dager, we received relevant information about our next mission. I've sent it to your data pad. I also sent the jump coordinates to your ship's computer. We will make the jump in 90 seconds. Commander Keeley ended the transmission straight away. Dager first warned the pilot to prepare to jump, and then looked at the info he received. 60 seconds. 30 seconds. 10. 9. 8. Sir, there is a ship coming out from hyperspace. What? The mechanic voice was in the middle of the countdown when Brain warned Dager. A slim ship, about half the size of the CR-90 Corvette came out of hyperspace dangerously close to Hell Squad's ship. 5. 4. Evasive maneuvers. Evasive maneuvers now. However, it was too late. Even before Dager had finished yelling, the cannons of the unknown ship had already fired. 2. 1. The whole ship swayed, and clones and objects were thrown from one side to the other. As Dager fell to the ground, he saw the pilot hit the control panel, and push the hyperspace lever. Coordinates altered, initiating jump. The space around them distorted, and became white and blue lines. Dager got up and went to the control panel. Falco, how are you doing there? I bit dizzy, sir, but all right. Do you where in the galaxy we are going? No, sir. The coordinates were altered in the last second. Until we are out of hyperspace, there is no way to pinpoint our location. But I can get us out of hyperspace as soon as you want. Wait. First, scan the ship. Find out what is damaged. 
I don't want us getting out of hyperspace only to find out that the ship will leave us dead in the space. It will need a few minutes. Seeing Falco and the co-pilots get back to their seats, and start scanning the corvette, Dager went to find Brain. He found him, Tech and Cell putting some tools that went flying back in their places. Brain. You saw the ship first. Who the hell was that? I don't know, sir. It wasn't like any ship I have ever seen. Tech. Cell. Both troopers shook their heads. Dager was also lost. Who would attack a Republic fleet? The answer was obvious, the Separatist. But why would they use a single ship? That was. Still, Dager didn't believe that the ship attacking right when they were jumping to hyperspace was a simple coincidence. But there was another thing bothering Dager. Was Hell Squad's ship the target, or was it just another coincidence? At one moment General D's fleet was there, the other it wasn't. Only Heidi's ship was left in the space. Inside the cockpit, Heidi sat at the captain's chair as immobile as a statue. Then, his mouth opened, like he was about to scream, but no sound came out. He smashed his fist at the control panel, and it passed straight through it, until it was elbow deep in the control panel. Alarm. Alarm. Thermal signature 24. 870 meters and approaching. Heige looked up, and saw two missiles coming from the moon below. Unperturbed, he pulled a lever, and his ship disappeared in hyperspace. Damage report is ready, sir. Tell me. Engines 2 and 3 are dead. Engine 4 is slightly damaged, but it's still working. Compartments A12 to B2 have all suffered some kind of damage. And we also lost our long-distance transmitter. Any good news? The hyperdrive is still working, and we probably have enough fuel for another jump or two, no matter where in the galaxy we went. Also, the scanners are still up, and so are the defensive systems. What about supplies? That is the bad part. Since we were moving the Phase 2 armors, most of the supplies were moved to the Sincerity for the sake of storage. We might have enough for four days, or a week if we split it. Let's hope we can find supplies here, wherever here is. Falco, take us out of hyperspace. Everyone, brace yourselves. Forcefully getting out of lightspeed can be a little bumpy. Falco couldn't be more right. Even with his warning, when the corvette got out of the hyperspace, most of the clones almost fell, and stuff went flying again. What are our coordinates? Just a minute, sir. We are in Sector B, Olinda system. Any planets or settlements near? Iktach. It is small, but our archives say it should be habitable. Land on it. We will try to find the necessary supplies, and if possible, fix the transmitter. Dager flipped through his datapad, trying to find out more information about Iktach, but all he got was that it was a rocky planet. There were no intelligent beings, although lifeforms were abundant. But since there were animals, the clones would be able to at least get the supplies they needed. Hopefully, they would be able to fix the transmitter, or else they would have to travel all the way to the next Republic planet. Falco landed the CR-90 Corvette on a rocky plateau. Just as they had expected, life flourished in Iktach, but since the planet was so small and distant from everything, no race was interested in colonizing it. Dager got out of the Corvette, with his helmet on, just in case the air wasn't breathable, but it was. Just near where they landed, a herd of horned creatures was grazing. Lieutenant, start looking for the supplies we need. Hell Squad, let's have a look around, see what we can find. I am not sure there is much to be found. Our scanners detect nothing but this animals. There is a slight bigger signal to the west, but it is probably just more of them. We have nothing to lose. It is going to take some time to get the supplies we need, so let's go to the west. I have a feeling there is more to this planet than we think. Um. Chapter 127 Hell Squad crossed the plateaus of Iktach using their BRC speeders. The vehicles were small, but very useful, so each CR-90 Corvette had at least a few of them. They were mainly used for scouting, just what Hell Squad was doing at the moment. Leading Hell Squad, Dager was driving the speeder at the front of their triangle-like formation. 
There were two other speeders, each with two Hell Squad members on them, and another one driven by Tech, and slightly modified to have a bigger carrying capacity. It is about three clicks to the west. We should be able to see it at any moment, whatever it is. Brain had to say that using the comlink, because of the noise caused by the wind. Dajer checked his scanners and suddenly shuddered. Ever since they had landed on Iktach, Dajer had been feeling weird. Not in a bad way, though, but neither in an especially good. It was because of that feeling that he had left the ship as soon as they landed, and went after the big thing the scanners had captured. He was pulled back from his thoughts by Cell, who had speed up his BRC speeder, and was now by Dajer's side. Sorry, Cell. The wind is too strong, I couldn't hear you. Just ahead of us, sir. Cell stretched his arm and showed something in front of Dajer. When he looked up, he saw that a strange rocky formation had appeared. It was big, and quite conspicuous, because it looked like it was about to cut a hole into the sky. Like a dagger, the rocks pointed to the sky above. Dajer wondered how he hasn't seen it before, since it towered over everything else in the plateau. But it judging from Dab's words, it seemed they also hadn't seen it before. It's weird. It is like we could see it all the time, but it suddenly got much bigger. The signal is coming from it. Sir, do you think there is something up there? Let's go. Dajer didn't answer Tech. He knew what they were looking for was in the rock spike. Although he himself did know what it was, he also knew it wasn't a bad thing. When Hell Squad finally arrived at the bottom of the rock spike, they realized how big it was. When they entered its shadow, it encompassed the entire sky. Brain checked the scanners again, and sure enough, the signal was up the rock spike. What do we do now, sir? We didn't come prepared to climb a mountain. There is no need to climb. Get back on the speeders. Circle it. The clones looked at each other. It seemed a little unusual for their usually cool-headed subcommander to be so insistent at chasing what was most probably a flock of unintelligent creatures. However, Dajer did as he said he would, and got back on the speeder. Lifting a cloud of dust, he started circling around the rock spike, and eventually found what he was looking for. At the exact opposite side of where they first arrived, there was a very steep cleavage on the rock spike, but they could use it to get to the top. How did you know this was going to be here, sir? I don't know, brain. I just... I knew it was here, for some reason. Sir, are you okay? Quit talking, let's get up there. Every clone shut up after Dajer ordered them to do so. Questioning a superior wasn't something they usually did. Although they had to leave the BRC speeders behind, it didn't take them much time to get to the top of the rock spike. What they found up there, however, surprised them more than anything else. On top of the rock spike, in the middle of a rocky plateau, there was a house. Actually, it was more like a hut. It was shaped like a semicircle, with a small chimney. The door was just a hole, and although it was day, and light should be shining inside the hut, Dajer could see nothing after the doorway. For all reasons, that hut shouldn't be there. Iktach was a planet that nobody ever colonized, so either the hut was property of some hermit, or the Republic archives were incomplete. Dajer was more inclined to think the first option was the correct one. Tech, metal, dab, stay here. Brain, cell, come with me. The weird feeling was stronger, and it was telling Dajer he didn't need to worry, but he was more inclined to trust his experience. He would never enter a house with his guard down, especially when he wasn't in friendly territory. His DC-15A loaded and ready, he crouched to enter the hut. The first thing he did, as soon as he crossed the doorway, was to aim his blaster at the immobile figure at the opposite end of the hut. Cell and brain covered both his left and right. After making sure there were no threats, Dajer finally turned to the figure. It was vaguely humanoid, but instead of the skin that humans had, it was more like a lizard. Its scales were so white that they seemed to shine. It had a short neck, but a big head, with small and sharp teeth appearing on the sides of its face, even with the mouth closed. Also, it had a big tail that coiled around itself. You. You are the same. And one. When the lizard spoke, it didn't open its mouth, 
but the sound reverberated inside the hut. Although it spoke slowly, Dejer could understand it. Who are you? This planet doesn't belong to any force. I am me. You. You are you. But you are also them. And they are you. The white lizard moved its tail, and pointed at Dejer, then Cell and Brain. Everything it was saying was confusing, but it was weirdly relaxing, to the point that the clones lowered their blasters. Are you a native of Iktach? Thyrila. Not Iktach. Iktach is the name you gave. My people. My planet. Thyrila. So you are a native. We didn't know there was an intelligent life form on this planet. Our ship is damaged. Is there anywhere we can repair it? We left. And now we are back. Maybe it is because of you. Maybe it is not. Sir, he isn't making any sense. Shoo. Sure. Let him talk. He is a native from Iktach, he probably knows where we can fix the transmitter. Many, many years ago. We left Thyrila to find peace. But war found us before. Now we are back. Are you this war? Um. Are you talking about the Clone Wars? Yes, we are soldiers, on the Republic side. Republic. Separatist. All pieces in a scheme. The Dark Lord watches and controls. We left because we couldn't fight the Dark Lord. Now we are back. Who is this Dark Lord? What do you mean by pieces in a scheme? You. I can feel the force around you. Not in you. Around. Following but never touching. Watching but never moving. You, you are important. But you will never change the future. You only moves towards it, another tool of the Dark Lord. But maybe. Maybe. Chapter 128. I can feel the force around you. Not in you. Around. Following but never touching. Watching but never moving. You, you are important. But you will never change the future. You only moves towards it, another piece of the Dark Lord. But maybe. Maybe. This time, Deja was utterly confused by what the lizard was saying. What did he mean by saying the Force surrounded Deja? Wasn't this the thing only Jedi's could use? But the lizard just ignored Deja's confusion. You will have influence. For good or bad, only time can say. You need to be careful. Using the Force is a blessing you don't have, but it revolves around you. And it affects you and those close to you. Be careful. Go back, and be careful. Be careful. Be careful. The lizard just repeated two words over and over again, but instead of getting upset, Dejer felt relieved. That was because the weird feeling he had been sensing all along had disappeared. He took another look at the white lizard, and saw it had closed its eyes, and was swaying in place. Let's go. There is nothing we can get from him. Berm. Sir, are you sure we can leave him like this? He had been here before we arrived. He will do just fine. Let's go. We need to get back to work quickly. Our legion is probably already near the next target. You give the orders. Yes, I do. Move out. Hell Squad stopped the speeders near the CR-90. As soon as Dager got out of the speeder, Lieutenant Shield came to him. Sir, we got the food we needed, but we are low in medical supplies. However, I don't know if we can really find anything here. You are right. Falco. Yes, sir. We are taking off as soon as possible. Fire up the ship. Lieutenant Shield, come with me. Hell Squad, you too. Deja ordered someone to get the BRC speeders inside the cargo compartment of the CR-90, and told a few clones to follow him. They moved through the corridors of the ship easily, and arrived at the command bridge. Deja signaled to Brain, who went ahead and turned on the hologram projector. He typed on the table, and a blue hologram of a planet disappeared. This is my Jito. A cold but important planet for both Republic and Separatist. And it is where our next battle will be. 
Just before we were attacked in Durachner, Commander Keeley sent me the battle plans. If the fleet followed standard protocol, after we split, they must have continued to Majito. Our transmitter is broken, so there is no way to confirm this, but we are going to there, and hoping that they are on Majito. Falco, are we ready to take off? Then do it. I sent the coordinates to the ship's computer. The reason why Dager wanted to leave Iktach so badly was because of the lizard. He didn't know if it was just coincidence that they had stopped at Iktach and found the old white lizard, but it was getting harder and harder for him to believe in coincidences. So, he wanted to get off the planet as soon as possible. Besides, there was a battle in the galaxy waiting for them. Any questions? Is there any blockade around Majido? Shield, the lieutenant, seemed to be worried about what was expecting them on Majido. Dager checked the data pad once again. The fleet will already be engaging with it. We join the fleet and get back to the action. Any chance we can surprise them? What do you mean? Well, since the Sepis are fighting our fleet, is there any way for us to appear behind them or do something? Um. Dejer would have liked to do something like that, but after racking their brains for almost an hour, they still couldn't think of anything. By this time, the CR-90 Corvette had already left Iktach, and was in hyperspace. If nothing else happened, it should take them five days to get to Majido. Hell Squad would then be two days late, but considering there was a separatist blockade around Majido, they probably would find General D's fleet still engaging with the enemy. With little to none bumping, the CR-90 Corvette came out of hyperspace, and faced the usual scene of destruction that a space battle caused. It was at the same time much bigger, but also more insignificant than a ground battle. Cruisers, destroyers, frigates, battlespheres, starfighters and many other kinds of ships were torn apart and floating in the vacuum. Each ship that blew meant the death of hundreds, or even thousands of clones and droids alike. For those who used an escape pod, it was all down to luck. Falco, connect us with the sincerity. Now that they were close to the fleet, their short-range transmitter could finally be put to use. Shortly, General D's voice was heard. You made it back. Where in the galaxy were you? Sorry, General. When we were attacked, the coordinates on the hyperdrive changed. We were sent to Iktach. It took us a little bit of time to get to here. Now that you are here, join the fray. I will send someone to pick up you and Hell Squad. Let your ship join the formation. You heard him. Falco, get ready to join the battle. Hell Squad, Lieutenant Shield, Tyrio and Faust, prepare to leave. Hell Squad, come over here. Lieutenant Shield and the other two clones started packing up their weapons and armors. Meanwhile, Hell Squad formed up on danger. Metal, Dab, grab that crate. The two clones followed his orders, and picked up the crate containing Hell Squad's Phase 2 armor. Dager opened it, and showed the contents to a surprised Hell Squad. Hurry! Suit up! All the 303rd is already using the Phase 2 armor. We can't be left behind. Everyone grab yours. A few minutes later, a lot entered the hangar of the CR-90. Very quickly, the clones boarded it, and left only the crew in the corvette. Good luck, Falco. To you too, sir. The lot left the corvette. Thanks to them coming out of hyperspace away from the battle, their journey to the sincerity was calm. After they arrived at the capital ship, Dager saw that every clone inside the ship, be it infantry or crew was using brown armor that represented the 303rd. However, Hell Squad's armor was vastly different from the standard one, and they caused quite an impression when they entered the command bridge. Chapter 129 Usually, just by walking around, Hell Squad would incite salutations from the other soldiers. Dejer was a sub-commander, so he was only under commanders and Jedi generals. But all the other Hell Squad members, namely Brain, Metal 3-4, Tech, Cell, and Dab, were normal troopers, at least in rank. Nevertheless, because of their status as a special unit, most clone soldiers, and even low-ranking officers were respectful to them. So, like it was said before, there was always some kind of reaction when Hell Squad passed. But now, when they entered the command bridge of the Sincerity, 
every crewman and trooper stopped for a second before resuming their work. Dejer's armor was the one which was almost entirely brown, with just a few white patterns. This clearly set him apart from the other members of Hell Squad, since their armor was mostly white, with the exception of Cell. As a scout, Cell had two requirements. He had to be quick and silent, and he couldn't be noticed. So, his armor had even less white than Dejer's. It was a mix of brown, red and white, with darker and lighter shades, and in random shapes. That way, he would be indistinguishable from the surroundings. To the right of Cell was Dab, carrying his DC-15X over his shoulder. As a sniper, he was way from the thick of the battle most of the time, so he needn't worry about camouflage. His armor was the one with less paint, only a circle around his chest and back, and a small triangle in the back of his hand. Brain's armor had the Republic symbol on the left chest, the right arm was painted all the way from the shoulder to the back of the hand, and the paint created irregular patterns on his right chest, making it seem like he had dipped his entire arm in a can of paint. The shins and feet of his armor were also brownish-red. On the left of Dager were Metal and Tech. Metal's armor was a tad more eye-catching than the others. It had a brown shoulder pad, a symbol of his identity as a heavy machine gunner. The paint job was composed of a vertical strip going all the way from his left top to the left bottom, and encompassing about half his armor, and his entire left leg. Tech's armor looked like paint was splashed in his chest, making an irregular circle. In fact, it was so similar to a splash of paint that it even had small stripes going down from it and into his legs, as if they were droplets. Of course, they couldn't forget 3-4, who was still in the infirmary. Out of curiosity, Hell Squad had taken a look at his armor. It had the symbol of a Republic medic on it, but crossed over the symbol was a big line, going from the left shoulder to the right side. Its calves and back were also covered in paint, but with a clean spot in the middle. All in all, when Hell Squad entered the command bridge, it was quite the sight. They stopped in front of the hologram table, where Commander Keeley, General D, Ragu and Admiral Dao were. Expressionless, Dajer took off his helmet and held it under his arm. Hell Squad reporting for duty, General. I see you liked your new armor. It is good, General. General Ragu, Commander, Admiral Dao. Welcome, Dajer. Subcommander Dajer. I am glad you brought my corvette back intact. Ahem. Dajer, you are aware of our battle plans to Majito, right? Pass through the Separatist blockade, capture or destroy their airbases and hold our ground until the Galatic Marines arrive. Then there isn't much to discuss. You and Hell Squad should rest. We will have to wait until we are on the planet to do anything. Actually, General, there is something I wanted to tell you. About Iktach. General D frowned, and so did Admiral Dao and Commander Keeley. What Dager did was highly informal. According to the protocol, he should have written a report, and handed it over to Commander Keeley, who would then decide whether or not to pass it to General D. Dager, write your report, and give it to me. Then go get some rest. It appears you are tired. Commander Keeley broke the awkward silence, and said harshly. But for the first time, Dager ignored his commander, and looked at General D. The Jedi seemed to sense something, and made a sign for Commander Keeley to stand down. What is it, Dajer? We met someone at Iktach, General. I didn't recognize him, but when I searched our archives later, I found his species. An Iktachi. The only thing is. They were supposed to be extinct for hundreds of thousands of years. But that wasn't all. As soon as we found him, he started talking alone. At first we thought he was crazy, but. But what? He said something about the Force. And then about the war that is happening, and that it is all just because of the desires of a Dark Lord. A Dark Lord? He said this whole galactic war is because if one person. Not like that, but. Yeah, I think that was what he meant. General D went deep in thought. All the dissatisfaction he was feeling about Dajer had disappeared, replaced by a hard frown. Even his apprentice was serious. Suddenly, Dajer had the feeling General D was sensing the same thing he had when he stepped into Iktach. When this battle here is over, 
I will go there to have a look. A dark lord. I need to talk to the council. Ragu, come with me. Yes, master. Master and apprentice left the command bridge, even though the battle was still raging outside. As soon as they crossed the door, Commander Keeley approached Dager. What was that? Subcommander Dager, you understand that is highly irregular, right? It is good the general took you seriously, otherwise you would be in big trouble. Bigger than now, I mean. I want that report. Return to your quarters, you and your squad. Now. Dager turned around, out his helmet back on and marched out of the command bridge. Steel 5, you have two on your tail. Try to shake them off, I'm coming. Rosal spun his starfighter, dodging an incoming missile. Two vulture droids were chasing a fighter of his battalion, and he was after them. His aim locked in one of them, and he pressed the trigger, sending a spray of blue lasers on the vulture. The droid was hit, and was sent spinning off into space before blowing. After taking care of the other droid, Rosal set his eyes on a small separatist transport ship. Steel 1 to 7, form up on me. Target, transport cruiser on marking 109 to 983. Chapter 130. Chaos. That was the only word that could describe what the aftermath of the battle looked like. Just like always, debris and bodies filled up a small parcel of the space. In the distance, CIS Lukahulk class battleships, Providence class dreadnoughts, and Munificent class frigates were guarding my Jito. It was difficult to tell the passage of time in the vacuum of space, but the number of destroyed ships was enough to make one understand that the Republic had been trying to break through the Separatist blockade for quite some time. Without success. The 303rd had paid a hefty price, but all they had done was damage or destroy some ships. After noticing it was impossible to win, General D had ordered the retreat. It was a wise decision. Even Dager, who was a ground soldier, with zero experience in space combat, could see that the Republic was being crushed. It didn't feel good, but it was the truth. Rosal was at the lower hangar, working on his Arc 170. There was a big blast mark on the turret, showing the interior of the starfighter. That was the position where his gunner, Spark should have been, but he had died instantly. And he wasn't the only casualty that Steele had. They lost about one-third of their forces between dead and wounded. And when a pilot got wounded, that usually meant his fighter was also out of the fight. Steel Battalion hadn't lost so many troopers and ships in vain, of course. They were the pilots with the most number of kills, including one dreadnought and two frigates. But considering the Republic made no progress, it all seemed useless. Rosal was working with a droid to take out the broken pieces of his Arc 170 when he saw a clone entering the hangar. Subcommander. Rosal stopped what he was doing and saluted Dager. It was even easier to recognize him now that he had his custom armor. At ease. Rosal, I heard you lost Spark. He was a good soldier. Thank you, sir. This is your starfighter, right? Get another one. I want Steel Battalion on the air. Sir. We intercepted a Separatist transmission that gave us some new info. Get your men on the air. After giving Rosal his orders, Dager went to the other pilots. Minutes earlier, the Sincerity had intercepted a long-range transmission from Christophsis. Long story short, the Separatist troops on Christophsis were facing trouble with the 212th Legion, and needed reinforcements, which would come from Maijito. Apparently, the Clankers thought the 303rd wasn't strong enough to break through their blockade, even if a few ships were taken away. Dager couldn't wait to prove them wrong. All the clones needed to do was make a hole in the Separatist blockade, and it would crumble. Dager returned to the command bridge, and nodded to Commander Keeley. Everything was ready, now what they needed to do was strike the moment the Separatist left. Hell Squad leader had said it might be a trap, but General D denied. According to him, it was possible to be a trap if they waited for too long, because the ships that had just left could return. But if they attacked the moment they left, the massive frigates and dreadnoughts wouldn't be able to get out of hyperspace without a great deal of damage. The bigger the ship, the harder it was to turn or stop it. As the officers of the 303rd looked at the space outside, 
and the separatist fleet, time seemed to pass slowly. Dager had his arms crossed, and his eyes fixed on the enemies. Commander Keeley and Admiral Dow were moving around in the command bridge, the first barking orders, and the latter whispering them. General D and his Padawan, Ragu, were sitting on chairs, their legs crossed and eyes closed. Ragu had his mind empty, and was concentrating in feeling the force. General D, however, was contemplating the conversation he had with the Jedi Council. After reporting all Dager told him to the Council, he had been assigned the task of investigating Iktach. Master Yoda went deep in thought when he listed to General D. The first time we heard of the Dark Lord, this is not. Find that being your soldier did, you also have to. Yes, Master. The first thing Ragu did after General D finished the transmission was to ask about the Dark Lord. But his master didn't answer him. General D could sense something moving in the depths of the Force, and he didn't like it. Returning to the present, General D opened his eyes milliseconds before a crewman shouted. Admiral. They are turning around. Five. No, six dreadnoughts, thirteen frigates. They are leaving through section 209-003, and about to enter light speed. There they go. A huge section of the separatist blockade split from the major force, and turned to one side before disappearing. Commander Keeley put two fingers in the side of his head, then pointed to the outside. Dager nodded, and turned on his comlink. Rosal, Hawk, Rip, get your boys on the air. Attack the nearest enemy ship. If you get no response, turn around immediately. If they send the vulture droids, press the attack, backup will be arriving soon. Dejer gave the order so naturally that it took a moment for the Navy officers to understand that they seemed to be inverted. Sir. Retreat if we have a free path, attack if we don't. You heard me. Go. The hangar doors in three different cruisers, including the Sincerity, opened, and three different squadrons left. They left some spacing between themselves, but were all aiming for the nearest frigate. When they passed the three clicks mark, a cloud of vulture droids flew towards them. Rosal dove straight into it, spinning his arc 170 to avoid the incoming lasers, and blowing a path amidst them. Subcommander, we are facing opposition. Confirming orders. Do we press the attack? Carry on. All ships, attack. Starfighters, get out there. Admiral Dow answered for Dager, and the fleet sprung into motion. The reason why they had waited for the Separatist counterattack was to confirm it wasn't a trap. If they sent a squadron, but incited no response, chances were the Separatists were trying to lure the rest of the 303rd fleet. Once more, Dager found himself with nothing to do but wait. The ground troops had to be prepared for two things in a space battle. Either board an enemy vessel, or be boarded. Meanwhile, their fates were in the hands of the starfighter pilots. Chapter 131 Explosions after explosions, some bigger, some smaller, happened all around the space, only to be instantly extinguished by the vacuum. Rosal already had a faltered battalion, and he was losing more and more men. But it was just his, and theirs, duty. Since the Republic was losing some, of course they were also winning some. Steel Battalion blew up their fourth target since the attack had started, and the Munificent Class frigate broke in half. That opened a clear path for one of the Acclimator Class cruisers to dive straight in between two badly damaged Separatist ships. The batteries on both sides of the cruiser opened up, tearing holes in the enemy ships. Each time one of the highly concentrated energy beams hit the ships, droids were sucked into space, screaming. Suddenly, one of the lasers hit an ammo deposit on a separatist dreadnought. The capsules of Tabana gas were very unstable, and couldn't handle a direct hit. They blew up, and caused a chain reaction. Sequences of explosions started in the middle of the ship, and extended to both sides. In a few minutes, the command bridge lost its support, and crashed down on the top of the dreadnought, creating yet another hole. Without its head and fangs, the massive ship started falling down, pulled by the gravitational field of Maijito. As the broken dreadnought entered the atmosphere, the friction caused it to catch on fire, and break down even more. The Republic cruiser, having gotten rid of one enemy, 
focused all its firepower on the other ship, and also destroyed it, although it took heavy damages. However, it had opened the path the clones needed. At the Sincerity, and a dozen other ships, the ground troopers were already on their lots, and taking off. This time, General D and his Padawan were on the same gunship as Hell Squad. Admiral, I'm leaving the fight up here to you. May the force be with you. Good luck, General. Lot after lot left the Republic cruisers, and started to descend on the planet below. Some were shot down, but many more touches the ground safely, including the one Hell Squad was. Majito was very different from any planet Dager had fought in before. Geonosis and Renvar were desolate. Scarif and Moncala were full of water. Coruscant was a city, rather than a planet. Dantuin and Iktach were flourishing with life. But Majito was a cold, barren desert of snow. As soon as Dager jumped out of the lot, his legs burrowed into the snow, up to his knees. Dager cursed. With snow that high, their movement speed would slow down tremendously. Luckily for them, they didn't come under direct fire right after they landed, but had some time to form up. The objective was a small city called Tequila. Like most cities on Majito, Tequila was built on the edges of a cliff, and it was mostly vertical, not horizontal. The natives of Majito, a small, furry species called Lerman, had been forced out of the planet by the intergalactic banking clan. The banking clan had maintained a neutral position in the war for just enough time to get their assets out of Coruscant and the Corps. After all their most valuable possessions were safe, they aligned with the Separatist and started funding their large droid army. Majito was one of the planets that the Separatist had given to the banking clan, without worrying that the Lerman would complain. Since the Lerman were pacifists, most of them had left the planet on their own volition, and those who didn't were driven away. Of course, none of this mattered to Dager. In his thinking, driving away the Lerman was only another injustice the Separatist had committed. What really mattered to Dager was knowing how and where the Lerman lived, because that would be his battlefield. As said before, the cities in Majito were built on cliffs and connected by bridges. The bridges had a handrail about waist high, which was good for the small Lerman, but just high enough for clones and droids to trip and fall. That being said, the bridges were also an open space, with no cover. Tequila, in specific, was just a small city, and as such, didn't have a very big droid force. It had, however, one AAT and two E-Web turrets that were causing many casualties. As another of his brothers fell by his side, Dager lobbed a thermal detonator over his head, trying to hit one of the E-Webs, but it fell short. The detonator bumped on a piece of metal, and fell on the snow. When it blew up, dirt pieces of snow and ice were sent flying, partially covering the nearby droid units. One of them was even hit by a bigger shard, and fell in the snow. We need to get closer. Go, go, go. Commander Keeley rushed the clones, but the thick snow made moving fast difficult. Each step the clones took needed their knees to get up to waist level before stepping down again. But that was the case just for the clones. The Jedi seemed to be unaffected, and were running as if they were on solid ground. Their steps were light, leaving only a small footprint on the snow. The droid sergeant commanding the AAT had already seen General D and Ragu, and had focused the tank's main cannon at them. Meanwhile, Hell Squad finally made it to the first building, a small hut that was slowly being transformed into a sieve by red lasers. There was a side benefit to officially stepping into Tequila, which was that they were out of the snow. The droids kept the streets clean of snow, so it wouldn't hinder their movements, and this was now working in the clone's favor. One knee on the ground, Dager was just barely out of the sight of the droids. By leaning to the side, only his DC-15A and a part of his head were shown. Thankfully, the clankers were never very good at aiming. Red lasers passing by his head, Dager aimed at one of the Ewebs gunner. It was a long shot. He took a deep breath, and for a moment the noises and the surroundings seemed to vanish, and only his target remained in his vision. Dager pulled the trigger two times in succession. Quite a distance away, the droid managing the E-Web was first thrown back after being hit in the chest, and a millisecond later his head acquired a new hole. Dager had taken out the gunner, but it was for nothing, since another Seppai took control of it. 
The ammo box. Cell also fired in the direction of the turret, but his DC-15S had a much shorter range, and less accuracy, so he missed. He did, however, spot the weakness of the E-Web. Chapter 132 The Ammo Box When Cell yelled that, Dager's eyes instantly looked for the ammo box of the E-Web. It wasn't very difficult to find it, since it had to be close to the turret. The black box wasn't a big target, but it was worth a try. Once again, Dager aimed, took a deep breath and only then fired. The blue laser hit the ammo box, and made a hole in it, but it didn't look like it affected the turret. He lowered his macro binoculars, and saw that green mist was leaking out of the ammo box. It wasn't what he was expecting for, but it would also work. He took three more shots. One missed, but the other two hit the target, and now the green mist was leaking profusely. Soon, the e-web stopped working. No matter how much the droid controlling it pulled the trigger, not a single laser left the barrel. The green mist was, of course, Tabana gas. When the Tabana gas was transformed into ammunition, it had to be condensed into liquid. When that liquid entered in contact with the air again, it reversed to its original condition. With one of the turrets out of combat, the attack became a little bit easier. Just a little bit, because the AAT and the other E-Web were still active. Ragu. The screen from General D cut the battlefield. Instantly, Dager looked away from the droids, and to where the Jedi was. That was a mistake, because if Brain didn't pull him back to behind the building, he would have died. Firstly, Hell Squad's leader saw General D deflecting lasers while spinning, and cutting droids like they were nothing. Then, his eyes scanned the dirty snow, looking for the Padawan. He found Ragu laying beside a hole that most likely resulted from an AAT round. The youngling wasn't moving, but Deja knew that being knocked away by a cannon blast was more than enough to make anyone unconscious. He himself had suffered from that. General D was moving to his Padawan, but he would have to cross the whole battlefield to get there. And the tank was still active. Seeing that, Deja yelled at him through his comlink. General D. We will get General Ragu. You need to stop that AAT. General D looked over at Dager, his thoughts conflicted. His emotions were telling him to disregard the battle, and go after his apprentice. But the rational, and calm, part of his mind knew that he couldn't do that. Dager's tipped the balance, and he started running towards the AAT. After he told his general he would rescue the Padawan, Dager didn't even wait to see what the Jedi would do. Followed by Tech and Cell, he ran to the Padawan's position, in open ground. As he left the outskirts of the city, the terrain changed from clean ground to snow once more. While dodging red lasers, Dager got to the unconscious Jedi. He grabbed the young Tegruta, and put him over his shoulders. Securing Ragu with one hand so he wouldn't fall, and his other hand holding his DC-17, Dager made a sharp turn and started heading back. Thanks to Cell and Tech, he made it back safe and sound. Without much time for graciousness nor respect, he dropped Ragu on the ground. Brain checked the pulse of the Padawan, and nodded. Dager turned on his comlink. He is just unconscious, General. However, there was no response. Peeking from behind the building, Dager saw that the Jedi was too busy to answer. General D was having a face-off with the AAT. He dodged one laser blast after the other, and was getting closer and closer to the tank. Seeing the Jedi approaching, the AAT started retreating, instead of attacking. It was an awesome and at the same time awkward sight, a big AAT running away from one person. But the AAT was soon pinned down by General D. It had retreated so far that it was at the bridge now, and all that it had behind it was an abyss. The tank stopped, but didn't fight back even if General D was just a few meters away. Dager eliminated another droid, then walked out in the open, and positioned himself behind General D. Commander Keeley and Hell Squad soon followed, as well Ragu, who had just woke up. The reason why the clones did that was that each and every clanker in Tkala had been eliminated, the only exception being the AAT. A few ten seconds passed as the clones surrounded the tank, and about ten RPS, six rocket launchers were aimed at it. The hatch on top of the AAT opened, 
and a droid sergeant, recognizable by the blue marks, appeared with his hands up. Berm. We would like to discuss the terms of our surrender. Humph. In response to the droid's shameless surrender, all that General D did was snort. With a lifting motion from his arms, the droid sergeant was pulled off the tank while screaming, and cut in midair by General D's lightsaber. Then, the Jedi extended his hands, and the AAT creaked as pushed back by an invisible hand. The might tank, who could eliminate countless clones in a battle, fell in the abyss just like that. For a few seconds, it was possible to hear the sound of it crashing against rocks. Don't waste time. We are moving to the next separatist outpost. It took a few seconds Dager and Commander Keeley to assimilate what the Jedi had said. They were still in awe for how he had handled the AAT. Cell, Gar and Hammer, take three speeders and scout ahead. Dab, Hurricane and Vigo, go with them, find a suitable spot. Dager sent three teams, with the standard configuration of one scout and one sniper. They couldn't afford to send much more than that, mainly because snipers and sharpshooters were few, even in an elite legion like the 303rd. The main reason why he sent them ahead wasn't really to scout, but to position the snipers where they could take out enemy officers and other important units. In a small city like Tkala, Dab couldn't find a spot to take out the E-Web gunners because he didn't have the time to. The clones had been marching for half an hour waiting for the scouts' report to come in. In the meantime, General D had contacted Admiral Dow, but the fleet was still engaged in a fierce battle. Not long after that, they received some intel from the clones ahead, and a few minutes later, reunited with the scouts. The first thing Cell did after they grouped was, of course, report to Dager what he had discovered. It is a normal Sep-Pi outpost, sir. High walls, spider droids, loads of clankers and at least two AATs. Nothing unusual, as far as we can see. Dager lowered his macro binoculars, and looked at the outpost. It was just like what Cell said. By the amounts of droids he could see on the top of the walls, it was fully guarded. Sir, I think I found something. Permission to shoot. Chapter 133 Sir, I think I found something. Permission to shoot. Dab asked Dager one of the weirdest questions he ever had heard. Hold. Let me see it. Asking to shoot directly, without even identifying what it was. According to clone army regulations, a sniper would only ask that question when he thought that the unknown object was of a higher risk than alerting the enemies. And Dager knew Dab for a long time. He wasn't a rash soldier, otherwise he wouldn't have been trained to be a sniper. Without wasting time, Dager got to Dab's position. He and two other clones were on top of a hill, directly facing the separatist outpost. But there was something wrong. Their blasters weren't aiming at the enemy base, but the huge open field between the 303rd and the outpost. What is it, Dab? Look at the snow, sir. Anywhere you want. Dager lowered his macro binoculars, and swept his glare over the ground. As it was expected, it was all white, because of the snow. He could see droid footprints, and even signs of where the dwarf spider droids had passed, following a path to the gate of the outpost. I don't see anything unusual. The snow seems clean. What do you want to shoot? That's what I thought, sir. The snow is too clean. Why did they worry to follow all in the same trail? They even did some turns, when the gate was meters away from them. Dager frowned, and looked at the outpost again. It was really as Dab said. The path the droid footprints created didn't make sense. If Dab hadn't warned him, he wouldn't have noticed, and he doubted the others would. He searched in his mind what that could signify, and he arrived at only one conclusion. One he didn't like. A minefield. Dab nodded. That is what I think. I locked onto something that could be a mine. Or just a stone. We can't be sure. Let me look at it. Dab got up, and Dager took his place. He laid down with his belly on the ground, and looked at the so-called mine through the scope of Dab's DC-15X. It was a gray spot in the middle of the snow, about 40 meters away from the path. It was very inconspicuous, and out of the way. Unless someone, like Dab, was looking for it, 
it would be very hard to find. Dager also couldn't identify if it was really a mine or not. Permission to shoot. Hell Squad's leader got up, and Dab asked again. Wait. All troops, halt. Dager ordered a stop in the open channel, his order going to every clone, without even passing by the officers. Instants later, Commander Keeley contacted him. What happened? We found what might be a minefield. You should get up here and see it by yourself, Commander. A minefield? That is bad news. Wait for me. Lieutenant Shield, bring the scanners. Soon, Commander Keeley arrived together with General D. N. Ragu, as well as Lieutenant Shield. Dejer showed Commander Keeley where the mines were, and then showed it to the others. Lieutenant Shield programmed the scanners, but they captured nothing. Dejer wasn't surprised, because he had the time to analyze the mines. If it really is a mine, then it is most probably an ion mine. Commander Keeley went silent. The clones knew that ion mines were bad news, but the two Jedis appeared quite confused. Well, Ragu appeared confused, and General D frowned in a different way than he usually did. The clones already knew that this was his way to show he didn't know or understand something. What is an ion mine, and is it so bad? Deja was surprised, but then remembered that Ragu wasn't a soldier, and ion mines were quite rare. It was normal that he and General D didn't know about it. There are three types of military mines. The first are the big ones, used on space, usually on asteroid rings. The second are normal short-range mines. And the third are ion mines. They have a bigger radius than the normal ones, and they also send an electromagnetic wave that turns off communicators and vehicles. They are quite rare, mostly because they are expensive, and secondly because clankers are also included in the things it turns off. Dejer gave a short but detailed explanation. He did this not because he wanted to show off, but because knowing more about your enemy and their weapons were always better. But General D still wasn't satisfied. The scanners showed nothing, but I can sense you are still worried. Commander Keeley answered for Dejer. Ion mines also have another feature. They are almost undetectable, unless you are very close to them. In that case, they usually had already blown up. But they also have a downside, aside from the costs. Because of their design, they have to be very close to the surface, so they only work only soft grounds, like snow or mud, where they can be buried with a small portion of soil. Also, as Dager said, they are expensive. I doubt the clankers here have more than a few of them. You were discussing before we arrived, Dager. How do you plan to get past them, even if they are what you think they are? The Jedi answered immediately, without needing to think much to arrive at a conclusion. Dab looked at Dager, and when he saw his squad leader nodding, answered General D. I can shoot it, General, sir. It is the best way to know. If it explodes, it will alert them, but... But at least we will know what we are dealing with. Do it. General D was very decisive. After getting a confirmation from Dejer and Commander Keeley, Dab aimed at mine, and shot. An explosion with a three meters radius happened, and it blew snow everywhere. Then, a blue circle about five meters followed, but since there was no one in the area, nothing more happened. With their suspicions comproved, the 303rd came to a total halt. The droids on the outpost obviously detected the explosion, but decided to stay barricaded in the walls. Find and destroy all that you can. For the next hour, scattered explosions happened as the sharpshooters found and destroyed every ion mine they could find. When half an hour had passed without them finding anything more, Commander Keeley went to General D with two options. There was still a battle happening in space, and the clones didn't have that much time to spare. As Commander Keeley said, they could either come to a total halt and risk losing my Jito, or they could advance, even if they lost some soldiers. The way Commander Keeley laid down the options didn't really give much if a choice, and in the end, General D chose the only real option he had. Title, Minefield. Chapter 134. Dejer would have liked if the clones could all follow the same path that the droids did, to enter the outpost. But doing that would cluster all the clones together, 
and they would be an easy target for the dwarf spider droids and their laser cannons. So, at some moment, the 303rd would have to spread out. Dejer could only hope that Dab and the others had found all the ion mines, or at least most of them, otherwise it would be a massacre. As he stepped into the snow, Dejer was searching every corner of the path ahead with his eyes. He didn't want any of his brothers to step on a mine, and he certainly didn't want to step on one himself. It was when the clones were 300 meters away from the outpost that the droids opened fire. As they had practiced thousands of times, the clones split, and advanced while returning fire. With his every time better accuracy, Dejer shot down a droid after another. The droid lines up the walls were being cut down faster than the clankers could replenish them, but the 303rd was also suffering many casualties. The main culprits were the dwarf spider droids, that could strafe a whole area in one blast. Although the clones were focusing their lasers on the spider droids, their armor could take a lot. At the same moment that one of the dwarf spider droids finally died, an unlucky clone also detonated one of the ion mines that hadn't been found. Three other clones were caught in the blast, which were quite few, considering the 303rd still was closely packed together. The second blast, the electromagnetic pulse, was almost harmless, only putting a few detonators out of use. Here the screams of the wounded was always terrible, even more so when one couldn't do anything about it. War was horrible, and it showed no mercy. Missing limbs, gaping wounds, soldiers bleeding to death. All of that was still better than the silence of the dead. After Kuvu's death, Hell Squad didn't get a new medic. A part of it was because they always had some 303rd trooper tailing them. Dejer was, after all, the subcommander of the 303rd. The other reason was that deep inside, Hell Squad thought that having another trooper that wasn't part of their squad would slow them down. That was arrogance, but they had earned the right to be arrogant. So, when they heard the injured crying, Hell Squad kept their heads down and carried on. They didn't like it, but their job was to attack. Another two or three ion mines exploded before the vanguard reached the walls of the outpost. They eliminated a dozen men when combined, but the number of troopers that reached the walls was more than enough. Just like Thule, right, Dejer? By his side, also flattening himself against the wall, was Commander Keeley. Dejer shook his head. All I remember of Thule were two crazy men going against an entire base by themselves. At least this time we have more men. I am glad we brought more hooks this time. On three. A row of about twenty clones, including Hell Squad, put their DC-15 as on their backs, and pulled out hooks. Quickly, they started climbing, and breached the outpost using the windows. As soon as they let go of the cables, more clones started climbing them. In a few minutes, an entire section of the wall had been taken. It might also have something to do with the fact that two Jedis were helping them. Dejer was organizing some clones to move the dead droids out of the way when Tech came to him. Sir, General D asked you to go to the prison area. What is it about? I don't know, sir. Shield, Fonder, get this base clear. We won't advance anymore. Let's wait for the Galactic Marines. They will take it from here. The Galactic Marines were another elite legion, lead by Commander Bakara. Their general was Jedi Master Kiari Mundi. Both general and commander were known for their aggressiveness and relentlessness in battle. They were the legion assigned to Maijido, but since the 303rd was close, the Senate decided to send them as the first wave the results weren't great, as the clankers had to remove some troops from the sector before they could break through. The prison was just a small bunch of cubicles, hardly enough for someone to survive. Dejer doubted that the droids actually wanted anyone to live. They didn't take prisoners. What he discovered when he entered, however, was that he was wrong. There were not one, but three prisoners, all clumped up in one single cell. General D and Ragu were talking with the prisoners. They were one human, a Radian and a Duros. When General D saw Dejer, he introduced the prisoners. Dejer, those are Bond Lee, Anaconda Far, and Torado. They are Republic Senators. Senators, this is Subcommander Dejer. The Radian, Anaconda Far, nodded to Dejer. His dark blue eyes seemed to have stars on it, 
and although the senator was a prisoner bought long ago, he appeared very calm. The others weren't as calm as him. Bond Lee, the Duros, was sitting on the ground and grabbing his head, while Torado, the human, was talking without a pause. Thank you so much, Master Jedi. I don't know what those horrible droids would have done to us if you did not come. I own. General D just ignored the blabbering of the senator, and turned to Senator Farr. When Torado saw that he was being ignored, he slowed down and eventually started muttering to himself. Master D, we really need to thank you. I didn't think the Republic would send a Jedi for us. The Republic didn't. It was entirely coincidental. In fact, I wasn't even informed you were captured. That is why I need you to tell Dajer the details. Oh. We were going for a meeting on Naboo, when our ship was attacked by that separatist scum. All our escort was eliminated, and we were captured. Do you know what they wanted with you, senators? We were brought here, and they said nothing more. In fact, where is here? It is so cold. You are on my Jito. And in the middle of a republic invasion. What? That is not even close to our route. Why would they bring us here? That is what I want you to tell me, Senator. Meanwhile, you better get some warm clothes. When he heard Dajer say that, the Duros, who had been sitting on the ground quietly, suddenly got up, yelling. Why? We need to get out of this planet now. Dajer frowned. Bond Lee's eyes were shifting from his face to the entrance, to the others. That were the eyes of a terrified man. Chapter 135 Dajer wasn't the only one who found Bond Lee's attitude weird. Anaconda Far was also looking at the Duros with sharp eyes. My dear Lee, is there something you want to tell us? And no. I am just. Afraid? We all are. Maybe you should take a rest. Why yes. Thank you, Senator Farr. The Duros left the room quickly, all the while holding his hands near his chest, his feet dragging on the ground. Dajer intended to stop the man, but Senator Farr glared at him, stopping his actions. As soon as Bond Lee left, Dajer called Brain. This time, Anaconda Farr didn't oppose to his actions. I want a two-man escort with the senators at all times. And I want one of us with the Senator Bond Lee. Keep an eye on him. When he said us, Dajer wasn't talking about the clones in general, but Hell Squad. After giving his commands, Hell Squad's leader turned to the Rodian. Senator, I need a good explanation, or I am arresting both you and Senator Lee. I want to talk with Master Imagun D. Anaconda Far didn't flinch, even under the threat of being arrested. His eyes stared straight at Dajer's, and for a moment the clone felt like he really should call General D. Then he shook his head. The general ordered me to stay with you and the other senators. If you have anything you want to say, you can say it to me. Senator Farr glanced at Dajer, then smiled. He approached Dajer, and took his hologram projector, without caring that the clone had almost aimed his blaster at him. Of course, Dajer would never do that unless he was ordered to, because as a senator, Anaconda Far was much higher in the command chain than him. Using the hologram projector, Senator Far showed Dajer a path between two star systems. Subcommander, that was the path our ship was supposed to take. Using his finger, he changed the path to another one, that followed the same line most of the time, but at the end diverged completely. And that was the path it actually took. Can you tell me what is wrong? Dajer didn't answer. The senator was clearly on the Republic side, but he was just too cunning. He remembered Dajer of the Jedis, but without the crushing feeling that the Force provided them. Someone altered our route. Someone from the inside. If such person really did so, then I have reasons to believe he will try to contact the Separatist again. Once more, Dajer kept his thoughts for himself, and let Senator Farr continue talking. The Rodian didn't stop as if he was already expecting Dajer to agree to everything he said. I believe you know what we should do if we catch him contacting the Separatist. I and the Senate are very much interested in knowing if and why a Senator betrayed the Republic. Senator Farr walked past Dajer, and left the prison area. For someone who was used to all the comforts of life, 
he had dealt with his short capture just fine. Seeing the Rodian disappear in the stairway, Dejur gave the prison one last look before talking in his comlink. Brain, change of plans. I want four men with every senator. You and Tech take turns with Senator Lee, and have Cell follow Senator Far, without anyone noticing. I have reasons to believe he might be a target. Two weeks passed by, each day marked by a deadly battle after another. Many things had happened in those two weeks. The Galactic Marines had arrived, and one or two of their cruisers had forced their way through and landed on Majito, and reinforced the 303rd. The Sincerity had taken severe damage, and was forced to leave the combat. The battle in space had entered a stalemate, and while the Separatist couldn't totally repel the Republic, the latter also couldn't break through the blockade. Meanwhile, the troops on the ground, although reinforced by Jedi Master Kiari Mundi and Commander Bakara, could at most enter a war of attrition with the droids. It was a battle fated to last, and the clone commanders knew very well that it could continue until the clone wars were over. Being tied to the ground, the clones couldn't send the rescued senators away. So, Bond Lee, Anaconda Far, and Turato were forced to follow the clone army wherever they went. On those two weeks, Senator Lee hadn't tried to contact anyone, but each day he seemed more and more terrified. Dejer also received reports of Senator Farr talking with him several times, but when he or General D questioned the senator, he said he still hadn't discovered anything. But now Dejer hadn't the time to worry or ponder on that. He was in a precarious situation, caught between a rock and a hard place. The city that the clones were currently holding was attacked, and they were forced to retreat. On the confusion, Hell Squad and 30-odd clones were left behind. Well, it wasn't totally accurate to say that they were left behind. Their path of retreat was cut off by a bunch of clankers, but if they could force their way through, Commander Keeley had some men waiting for them. Situations like that were the ones on which Hell Squad was most proficient. Watch south. Peeking from behind a house, Dejer heard the soldiers' warning, and crouched just in time to dodge the lasers fired by two B-1 battle droids. From the same position, he returned fire, and took out the droids. Urban combat was very favorable to the clones. Clankers weren't good at dodging or hiding, but at firing without stop. On an open field, the Separatist had the absolute advantage, but inside a city, Dejer was confident to force his way out. Sir, destroyers, 200 meters south. Amongst the men that Dejer had with him were Barrow and Shield, and the first had just spotted three droidikas at the far end of the street. Lieutenant, we don't have time for this. Deal with it quickly. The lieutenant grabbed an RPS-6, a bazooka, from his back, knelt to get more stability, and fired the rocket. The blue ball of destruction struck the destroyers right on the middle of their group, and exploded. Their energy shields could protect them from most types of lasers, but not from a ball of fire like the one that engulfed them. Lieutenant Shield dropped the RPS-6. Usually, a powerful and expensive weapon like that wouldn't be used to deal with mere droidikas, but the clones were running out of time. Keep going. Chapter 136 The safe passage that the few clones that Deja was leading had was just a small bridge. The city they were at the moment was split into two, an east and a west part. At the moment, Commander Keeley and some troopers of the Galactic Marines were holding the East City, and half a platoon, under the command of Galactic Marine Sergeant Rothax, was waiting for Hell Squad and the others on the bridge. The entrance of the bridge was just big enough for two men to pass side by side, and just like any other part of the city, it was under heavy attack. Dejur saw about fifteen clones, using the characteristic red and white armor of the Galactic Marines. Hurry up! We are outnumbered. Rod Hacks, the sergeant, saw Dejer and the others arriving, and urged them. The 303rd clones stopped shooting back, and just ran to the bridge, losing one or two men on the process. They were only twenty meters away from the bridge, and from rescue, however, they were destined not to have it. Who is that? Dab shouted, and drew Dejer's attention to someone in the middle of the bridge. The person pulled an old K-7 Watchman blaster pistol from under his cloak, and fired at the back of the clones. Without any chance to react, the Galactic Marines were shot down one after the other. 
Before dying, Rothax tried to turn around, but was shot in the head, and fell from the bridge, his body lost in the snowstorm below. Suddenly, there were two small explosions, one on either side of the bridge. It started shaking, and the person turned around and left it right before it fell. With rumbling and tumbling sounds, the escape route of Hell Squad, and the remaining twenty clones was lost. Deja was still looking to the rising dust when he heard the robotic voices of the droids. Stop. Surrender. Slowly turning, Deja saw dozens, maybe even a hundred droids around the small group of clones. For some reason, the droids were not firing, and so, the clones also stopped. They all came closer together, prepared to make their last stand. It was an honor serving with you. There is no need to say that yet, Barrow. It is only a few dozen clankers, we can take care of them with our eyes closed. There are a lot more than a few dozen. Barrow, Shield, and Cell tried to make the situation seem a little less dire, but the truth was that the number of clankers was only growing. No matter what they said, there was nothing they could do to change their destiny. Surrender, Republic scum. Captain, I thought we didn't take prisoners. Quiet, Sergeant. This is a secret, we can't let anyone know this. Air. They heard you, Captain. That is your fault, Sergeant. Take them. Following the Captain's orders, the droids started approaching the clones. When those were almost firing, and consequently provoking their doom, Dajer ordered them to stand down. Sir, are you sure? It is better than dying outright. At least we might be able to. Before Dajer was able to finish his sentence, a droid hit him with an electropole. Light blue energy stripes ran across his body, and he passed out. At almost the same time, the same thing happened to the other clones. Before long, the unconscious clones were laying on the ground, and B2 super battle droids picked them up by their feet, and dragged them away, without caring if their heads were hitting rocks and rumble on the way. Bond Lee was a senator for the Duros faction, but he had never been able to do much for his people. One day, while on a diplomatic mission, his ship was captured by the Separatist, and his life threatened by the one he least expected. Luckily, he had been saved by the clone army, and thought that everything would end well. But now, the same clones that had saved him were aiming their blasters at him. I, I don't understand what is happening. Why are you doing this? I did nothing. I am on your side. Are you, my dear Lee? We saw you blow that bridge, and leave those poor troopers to die. We have been watching you talking with the enemy for quite some time now. A person using purple robes walked from the midst of the clones. Senator Farr still had the same expression as he always had, but his eyes carried a dangerous glint that Bond Lee never expected the usually kind Rodian to have. Senator Farr, I, I. Please. Arrest him. Two Galatic Marines grabbed the stuttering senator, and took him away. Seconds later, General D arrived. He looked at Senator Lee being dragged away, and then at Senator Farr, but said nothing. Without anyone noticing him, he left, and went to his chambers to meditate. Eliminate. Jedi. Jedi. Eliminate. Mwakakakaka. Eliminate. 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 Ugh. Dejer woke up, his head hurting. He tried to support himself and stand up, but his hand slipped in something soft, and he fell down again. He looked down, and saw the same men that had been with him on the bridge, and about two dozen more. They were all on a prison cell, but it wasn't dark and claustrophobic like others he had been to. Instead, there was a whole wall missing, and after it was cold, blowing wind. Dejer walked till the edge of the abyss, and saw why nobody worried about building a wall there. The wind was so strong that anyone who tried to escape by there would fall to his death. Brain. Wake up. Wake. Up. Dejer kicked Brain, and the clone started moving. It was only then that Dejer noticed that they were all without their armors and helmets. Wake the others. See how many we are. Slowly, all the clones woke up. In total, there were 73 captured soldiers. Surprisingly, none of them was injured. 
Or maybe the droids only captured those that were of use to them. What use was that, Dager still didn't know. Sir, any idea of why they captured us? I know just as much as you do. But I bet we will know soon. The Seppis are here. A group of standard B-1 battle droids opened the cell, and started pulling and pushing the captives. Walk, Republic scum. You have work to do. Keep walking. Sir, we could try. Stop whispering. Walk. The droid used his E-5 to hit metal, and force him to move. Dajer knew what his subordinate was thinking, but there were too many droids, and the clones were unarmed. Dajer shook his head. Now was not the time. Chapter 137 The droids led the captured clones through tunnels and bridges, until they found themselves on a snow valley. The clankers didn't hesitate to give some incentive to the clones, so most of them arrived at the valley with a few more bruises than when they left their cell. They were astonished by what they saw when they got to the valley. Half buried in the snow, a massive structure was being revealed. It was triangular, made of rocks and hundreds of meters tall. And by the looks of it, it wasn't totally in sight yet. But Dager's attention soon shifted to the people working on the building. Hundreds of clones were digging in the snow under the watchful eyes of heavily armed droids. Those clones were supposed missing in action, and most likely dead. Keep walking, clone. A droid pushed Dager, making him trip and fall in the snow. Without the thermal isolation properties of the Phase II armor, he soon started to feel cold where his body touched the snow. Metal and Cell almost reacted when their commander fell, but Dager stopped them with a nod. He got up, and continued walking. Soon, he and the other clones were given a bucket and a shovel each, and ordered to dig. Those who complained were brutally repressed. I am the sub-commander of the 303rd Attack Legion. Who is the highest-ranking officer here? When he had the chance, Dager approached one of the clones who were already at the Snow Valley. It was obvious that the soldier was so tired that he could barely walk, but he still gave Dager a standard military salute. Captain Narza from the 303rd Legion, and Captain Hylix from the Galactic Marines, sir. Narza is here. We thought he had died. He is all right. At least as much as any of us can be here. In a way that didn't alarm the droids, the clone brought Dager to the other side of the building. There, Captain Narza and another clone who identified himself as Hylix, were digging in the snow. You were also captured. I certainly ain't here by choice. It is good to see you are alive, Narza. We were almost choosing a new captain for your company. The captain from the Galactic Marines, Hylix, saluted Dager quietly, and looked at him expectantly. After a few seconds, Dager realized that the captured clones were hoping for news about the battle raging on the rest of the planet. There was no way the clankers would let them receive any news from the outside. Everything is the same as before. We conquer a city, they take it back. We destroy an outpost, they build another. Oh. You have been missing for almost a week, Narza, so you don't know about it, but things are looking dire now. The clankers have been beating us back to our original bases, and we even lost some of them. I know what you are thinking, but don't expect rescue any time soon. I wasn't thinking about getting rescued. We have you, sir, and Hell Squad, with us. It was curious. No matter how dark and desperate things seemed, as long as a person had somebody he or she could trust, it wouldn't be afraid. Clones were by no means unrealistic, but Captain Narza had seen Hell Squad do so many impossible things, and survive so many dire situations, that even though he was half-joking, there was still some hope on his eyes when he spoke. Even Captain Hylix, who was from a totally different legion, had heard about Hell Squad. Dager didn't know it, but since Hell Squad was one of the first special units to be created, they had been used as a model for many others, and so, many of their achievements and battle stories were circulating amongst the clone army. It looks like we have someone important here. Am I right, sweetie? Right beside Dager's ear, awfully close to him, a woman's voice said those otherwise normal words. Dager shivered when he heard the creepy voice, and turned around immediately, raising his elbow to where he thought the head of the person was. 
It was a movement all clones trained when they were cadets, and it had a lot of strength to it, usually enough to throw the attacker away, or at least to know it a few steps back, so the clone had more time to react. But when his strike, which was supposed to knock the opponent away, hit the person, Dejer felt as if he had hit a wall. The person didn't move in the slightest, and Dejer felt cold fingers wrapping around his arm. Now, honey, that is not how a man should treat a lady. Despite speaking calmly and with a sweet voice, the woman showed no mercy, and twisted Dejer's arm hard. Grimacing in pain, his whole body bent, and he had to use sheer willpower not to kneel. Narza, Hylix and all the other clones tried to help Dejer, but were thrown away by an invisible force. Most of them had either passed out, or were too dizzy to get up. Dejer recognized the attack instantly. It was the force, the same thing General D and his Padawan used. This meant. A Jedi. Apparently, it was the wrong thing to say, because the hand gripping his arm exerted more strength, and twisted harder. With a sickening sound, his shoulder and elbow broke at the same time. No matter how strong his willpower was, Dejer was unable to endure such pain without making a sound, and screamed loudly. The droids might be dumb, but seeing clones being thrown in the air, and hearing Dejer scream, they quickly surround the prisoners and the woman. Wait. Who are why? I am sorry, milady. A droid sergeant started yelling, but when he saw who the woman was, he stopped mid-sentence, as if his circuits were broken, and then became much more respectful. Ignoring the sergeant, the woman commanded them coldly. Bring this one to level A-3, and find the other members of a hell squad. Immediately, or you die. Yes, milady. Two droids grabbed Dager, without care for his broken arm. Amidst the increasing pain that was clouding his eyes, Dager saw the attacker. A slender body, wrapped in tight-fitting clothes, showing off her body. Her skin was white, but not as much as the snow. Depending on the angle, sometimes it got a little red. A sinister red. She was bald, and had bright red lips, with two dark blue stripes on each side of her mouth. If Dejer had to describe the feeling she transmitted to him, it was that of a beautiful but poisonous flower. He had no doubt she could, and would, eliminate him at any time, without any remorse. Chapter 138 When Dejer woke up again, he found himself floating in the middle of a room. His legs and his left arm were tied by anti-gravity locks. His right arm wasn't tied, but considering it was broken in at least two places, it might as well have been. Groaning, he tried to move his body to look around the room, and found out that if he leaned to one side, the locks would move with him, and his whole body turned. Next to him, seven other clones were chained just like him. Narza, Hylix, Dab, Metal, Brain, Tech and Barrow. Thinking of what the woman said before he passed out, Dejer found it weird that Cell wasn't there. The first thing that came to his mind was that he had been eliminated. Cell had always been impulsive, and without Dejer to command him, he might have tried to fight back against the powerful woman. You are awake, sir. Tech saw Dejer moving, and turned slightly to talk to him. Dejer was about to ask what happened to Cell when he saw a warning on Tech's eyes, and swallowed his words. It was only when Tech turned back that Dejer saw the mysterious woman leaning against a wall. Tech had used his body to cover the woman's view, and to stop Dejer from talking. Presumably, Tech knew that he would ask about Cell. It was a long shot, but Dejer thought that maybe, Cell was still alive, and had somehow escaped from the hunt for Hell Squad. You are awake. Had some good dreams, I hope. Smiling, the woman approached, walking slowly, almost hypnotically. She caressed Dejer's belly, chest, arms, neck, and finally his face. Although she was always smiling, Dejer felt a sense of danger bigger than any he had ever had. Suddenly, her soft hand became hard, and she grabbed his cheeks. He struggled, but her hand remained unmoving. Now, what should I do with you? Who are you? A Jedi. Her hand moved so fast that none of the clones saw it. With a loud sound, a red handprint appeared on Dejer's face. His whole body shook from the impact, and he felt blood inside his mouth. Still, he kept his eyes locked onto hers. 
Don't. Ever. Compare me to those filthy animals. Or I will eliminate you. Blood started dripping from his mouth, but Dager suddenly smiled. He liked the angry woman more than the cold and smiling one. At least he could read her better. Sorry. I shouldn't compare you with the Jedis. They are honorable, and much better than you can ever be. So who are you? I never saw a force-wielding Seppai. This time he really succeed in pissing off the woman. She turned around as if she was leaving, then punched not him, but Tech. His brother instantly passed out, but white foam trickled in the corners of his mouth. Tech. Tech. Brain and metal tried to free themselves, to no avail. When the woman turned to Dager again, she had a smile on her face. My name is Asajj Ventress, clone. Make no mistake, if I could you would be dead already, just for talking back to me. Unfortunately for you, you might have some useful information. If you don't give it to me willing, I will have to take it my way. You will ask for me to eliminate you, scum. Giving Dager a last stare, Ventress left the room. With a tacit understanding, the clones waited a few minutes, to make sure she wouldn't come back, or that anyone listening to them wasn't paying that much attention. How is Tech? He will be okay. How is your arm, sir? Everyone could see that his arm wasn't doing well. It wasn't just hanging by his side, but also swollen. Dager wasn't one that enjoyed being taken pity upon, and injuries like that were too common for the clones, so he just ignored it. Cell. The clankers came for us, they knew that Hell Squad had seven members, but not who we were. We stayed quiet at first, but. They eliminated Trap. Then that Ventress said she would eliminate us all one by one unless Hell Squad showed themselves. It took some time to convince her that 3-4 wasn't here. Get straight to the point. What happened to Cell? He was about to turn himself in when Barrow here decided he wanted to die, and said he was Cell. Dager looked at Barrow. The clone was serious, but he didn't seem to be ashamed. He had no reason to, because all he had done was protect a brother. And Dager had to agree that Cell was more useful outside than he would be hanging from the ceiling like Dager and the others. Dager didn't know how much time elapsed, but he was starving. If the droids waited for too long, the clones wouldn't be able to give them information even if they wanted to. Of course, Dager preferred to be dead than to betray the Republic. As if reading his mind, the door opened, and a cleaning droid modified to carry plates appeared. It was clumsy, but somehow, it managed to feed the clones. It was very insulting to be fed by a droid, but it was better than dying, and the clones couldn't eat by themselves, since all their limbs were tied. Many hours later, the door opened again. Dager was sleeping even in such an uncomfortable position, but as a soldier, he woke up when he heard something. Ventress walked into the room, complacent as always. She stretched her head and touched Dager's face intimately. He was disgusted. Dager, right? I need you to tell me everything you know about the Republic operations on Majito. Dager sneered. There was no chance he was going to tell her about his own squad, whatsoever about their operations on Majito. Still, it should have been pretty obvious, what the Republic wanted. Tell me. What do you want on Majito? Ventress showed her palm, and waved it in front of Dager. Suddenly, he felt dizzy. Ventress, the room, the other clones, everything, became blurred, and covered by darkness. He heard Ventress voice over and over again. At first, he denied her request, but after time, her voice became softer, and it also didn't look so bad as before. What could happen if he told her this little information? In fact, he wasn't even sure why he thought Ventress was bad. My Jito. Is an important location. We came here to take it from the Separatist. Chapter 139. Only that? Why yes. Dager frowned, thinking that something was wrong. He vaguely remembered that he could not say anything to anyone. But there was nothing wrong if he told Ventress, right? After all, the Republic's intention on Majito were pretty obvious. What do you know about the Sacred Temple of Asherus? Saw Sacred Temple. Dager shook his head. He knew nothing about this Asherus temple. 
something was bugging Dager. There were several faint callings for him, but he couldn't understand them very well. Dager's eyes were rolling inside his eye sockets, but when his brothers started calling for him, they started to gain focus. Sensing her control over him get weaker, Ventress became upset. Shut up. Dager couldn't see clearly what she did, but the clone stopped yelling, and her voice became louder, throwing him back in confusion. You will tell me about the sacred temple of Asheris. I, I am going to tell you about. The sacred temple. Sacred temple. Dager searched his memories, but he had never heard of this sacred temple of Asheris. Ventress started to get frustrated. Why are you a sub-commander if you know nothing? Useless. Ventress was more and more upset. Suddenly, Dager felt pain. Incredible pain. He felt as if his head would break in half, or as if someone was hammering it. He struggled, trying to free himself from the pain. The Jedi. The one you work for. Tell me about the Jedi. Jedi. That was the only word that he understood. Maybe it was because his mind was almost breaking, but his nightmares came back to him. In his head, the word Jedi echoed over and over again, while an evil laugh sounded. Only that this time, it wasn't a male voice, but Ventress. General. General D. He. He is. Sir, no. Somehow, Barrow yelled. Before, nothing that Dager said was critical, but any information about the Jedis was extremely classified. Inside his head, Dager knew he couldn't tell Ventress anything, and was struggling to free himself from her control. Barrow's yell was all he needed. The pain he was feeling, the words that Ventress was uttering. Being forced to think about General D had brought all his nightmares forward, and it all melted into one, big ball of pain and darkness. The mist clouding his eyes faded, but the pain only became stronger. Struggling for breath, he saw his men looking at him, and Ventress glaring ferociously. Fear rose from deep within his heart. That woman was able to torture someone like that without even touching them. She almost made him, a battle-hardened soldier, spill classified information. She was terrifying. Seeing him wake up from his trance, Ventress decided to take a more violent approach. She was a few meters away from Dager, but when she stretched her arm, he felt pressure on his throat. Veins and sinews showed in her hand, as if she was exerting incredible strength. As her grip became stronger, so did the force on Dager's neck. Soon, he wasn't able to breathe. Tell. Me. Everything. He started floating towards her, the only thing holding him being the chains with which he was tied. His vision started turning red, purple, and then black. Probably sensing that she was about to eliminate Dager, Ventress released some pressure, just enough for him to barely breath and speak. Once more struggling to breathe, Dager locked his eyes with Ventress. Small veins had ruptured on his eyes, due to the lack of air. Don't test my patience, clone. Uff. Cough. Cough. Why should I tell you anything? Ha ha ha. Because if you don't, I will eliminate this garbage you call brothers right in front of you. Before he could answer, Barrow had already done it for him. His eyes were resolute, and so were the others. Eliminate us then. We are never going to tell anything to a traitorous Jedi like you. Pfft. There was no fear on Barrow's face, only unwillingness. He didn't want to die. None of them did. But they were prepared to give up their lives for the Republic, and they preferred to die than to betray all they believed. Dager stayed quiet. The moment they had been captured, Dager knew that they would die. And as much as he wanted to save his brothers, he wasn't able to, neither could. Even if Ventress eliminated Hell Squad, Captain Narza, Captain Hylix, Barrow, and every clone prisoner, he still wouldn't utter a word. That was something ingrained in his genetic code. Ventress glared at Barrow angrily, then turned to Dager again. She understood that only he could give her what she wanted, so she couldn't eliminate him. Yet. This time she approached Dager, grabbed his neck and squeezed hard. He felt an invisible force swirl around him, and clash against his head. But he wouldn't fall for the same trick twice. 
Besides, he had been fighting alongside with a Jedi for a long time. He was never the one on which General D used his power, but he knew some things about it. He blocked his mind with imaginary walls, and did his best to keep Ventress out. At first her face was calm, but when she found out that she couldn't break through Dager's mental defense, she became increasingly angry. Tell me. Tell me now. Unconsciously, she gripped his throat stronger, and he started to choke. And no. Berg. Berg. Suddenly, she released him and stepped back. Dager saw her reach her hand inside her robe, but didn't think much of it. If you really want to suffer, so be it. I will have my droids visit you on the next days. Dager had the feeling she wasn't talking about the normal B-1 battle droids, but something worse. He had heard about the methods the Separatists used to get what they wanted, and he didn't like it. But if that was the cost of keeping his brothers safe, he was happy to pay it. But I only need you, not your friends. I will make sure they get a chance to work out. Most of them, at least. I don't like it when people mistake me for a Jedi. Deja knew what was going to happen seconds before it actually did. The hand that Ventress had put inside her clothes came out holding a short metal stick, very similar to the ones that General D and Regu had. There was a flash of red light, and then a dull thud as something hit the ground. Ventress showed her red lightsaber to Dager, as if to make sure he knew she wasn't a Jedi. But his attention wasn't on her or her weapon. No. Brain broke the silence, and he and the other clones started cursing Ventress. But all Dager could do was stare ceaselessly at the headless body of Barrow. Chapter 140 Under the curses of the clones, Ventress left the room. Dager stared down at Barrow's head. After it was disconnected from the body, the head fell on the ground and rolled over until it was leaning sideways. Dager could see half of his face, looking angrily at the floor. At least his death had been painless. Ten minutes later, a group of droids entered the prison cell and took away Brain, Tech, Dab, Metal, Narza, and Hylix. No matter how they struggled, they were still carried away. However, nobody came to take away Barrow's body. Dager tried calling for the droids outside, but nobody answered. Either there were no guards, or they were programmed to stay put. So, Barrow's body kept hanging on the anti-gravity locks. After one hour, there was a puddle of blood below his corpse. The blood had stopped pouring out from his neck, but as soon as it dried, it only made everything worse. Stains of dry blood were all over his body, and no matter how much Dager wanted to look away, he just couldn't. He didn't feel more responsible for Barrow's death than he felt for any other brother of his. But Barrow had been one of his closest friends, and they had gone through a lot together. If he had died on a battlefield, Dager would have been sad, but not as much as he was now. The death of Barrow seemed meaningless. It was obvious that Ventress didn't plan to let any of the captured clones walk out alive. She couldn't afford it, neither could the Separatist. If news about them using war prisoners to excavate a temple spread, their support throughout the galaxy would be gone in a matter of hours. At some moment, Dager fell asleep from pure exhaustion. He woke up when he heard the door open, and saw five droids. Two of them were standard B-1 battle droids, complemented with red paint. Dager remembered reading about them in a Republic report. They were guard units. The third droid he didn't recognize, but it served as a moving table, and was carrying all sorts of items, from knives and syringes to fabrics and medicines. The two remaining droids were the ones that worried Dager the most. One of them was a black medical droid. However, it also seemed heavily modified, and handed the syringes and the medicines skillfully. The last droid was one that Dager had only heard about, but never seen. If a droid could ever be called slim, then this one was. It also looked strong. It was black, just like the medical droid, except its joints, which were brown. It had a beeping red button on its chest, but its most striking feature were the bright white eyes. If it really was the kind of droid Dager thought it was, then he was screwed. There were some stories that the clones told. One of them was about a super expensive droid unit, called Droid Commando. 
Those units had such powerful armor that nothing short of a full magazine from a Z-6 rotary or a point-blank shot to the head could eliminate it. They were extremely deadly killers, and the most elite units that the CIS had. However, nobody knew how they were, because they never left anyone alive. All the Republic found were outposts full of dead soldiers, but no droid corpses. Even if some of them died during an attack, the others made sure to take the body away, so the Republic scientists couldn't discover anything about it. Seeing that, Deja was even more sure that he wouldn't make it out of there alive. Since that was the case, he threw all his worries to the back of his mind, and looked at the droid commando determinately. Hey, Clanker. Tell your master that she will have to send someone better than you to deal with me. The droid looked at him with its lifeless eyes. Somehow, he seemed much more articulated than a normal droid. Your provocations won't work. With me. You will. What I need to. No. Tech would have been impressed by the droid commando. Deja not so much, since the droid was about to do some horrible things to him. He thought the droid was going to ask him questions, but it didn't. The first thing it did was grab a syringe that the medical droid handed to him, and stab it on Dejer's arm. Dejer felt something cold merging with his blood, but it didn't seem to have any effect. This will make you more susceptible to answering questions. And this. The droid commando picked up another syringe with a yellow liquid. Will make your mind feel free. After another injection, Dejer started feeling the effects of the drugs. His tongue felt bigger, and his body lighter. His mind, however, became increasingly clear. After a few minutes, the droid commando started asking questions. What is your serial number and indication? It was a basic question, one that the droid commando certainly already knew the answer for, since it was printed on the clone's armor. Still, Dejer wouldn't give him what he wanted. He had to show he wasn't easy to crack. My name is. His tongue still felt weird, so he mumbled the words. The droid didn't seem happy with his answer. The prisoner. Is not collaborating. Initiate protocol. A2JJ8. Protocol A2JJ8 wasn't complex. The medical droid picked a short metal baton from his many tools, and turned it on. Small, purple, lightning arcs appeared at one end of it, and the medical droid hit Dejer with it. Instantly, he felt searing pain all over his body, as the purple lightning ran all over him. His body arched, but the anti-gravity locks. Thankfully, the medical droid didn't leave the shock baton on Dejer's body for much time. Still, his entire body was aching, and in pain. What is your Serial number and Indication CT-4063 Infantry Trooper of the 303rd Attack Legion He would have to be stupid to keep resisting just for this question. His intention was to trick the droid commando into thinking he had given up, and that he was a low-ranking soldier. That way, they wouldn't insist on the most important questions. He was confident in his ability to withstand interrogation, but not under drugs and torture. But he had been too naive to think that the clankers would believe him. What is your position on the Republic? Army? I am a sergeant. He is lying. The medical droid spoke, and Dejer couldn't come up with anything in time. His screams of pain could be heard for many hours, but unfortunately, the only ones to hear it were the emotionless droids. Chapter 141 Three days had passed since Dejer had been captured. During those days, he had experienced many means of torture, from being electrified to being injected with a huge amount of unknown drugs. He didn't really remember when, but at some moment he had disclosed his identity of the subcommander of the 303rd Attack Legion. Because of that, he had been asked about the military plans for Majido. Once more, Dejer refused to answer. Once more, he was tortured until he spits it out. The only consolation he had was that what he knew was old, so it might not be accurate. Also, he had been slipping in some lies in the middle. Nothing big, otherwise the medical droid would know he was lying, but hopefully enough to misdirect the clankers. 
Hearing the door opening again, Dajer didn't even turn around. His mind was working slowly from the excessive amount of medicines he was given. My dear Dajer, don't be so sad. Dajer tilted to the side, and the anti-gravity locks rotated, putting him face to face with Ventress. He looked at her with fire burning in his eyes. He wanted to destroy every single droid that had eliminated one of his brothers, and eliminate every last bounty hunter that had harmed clones, but he couldn't say he really hated them. That was just his job as a soldier. But not Ventress. She was the first one he really hated. She had captured hundreds of clones, and was forcing them to do an inhuman work. She had eliminated Barrow in cold blood. His body was still hanging on the anti-gravity locks, and his head had been kicked to one side so it didn't bother Dager's interrogators. All he wanted was to get off his chains, and eliminate her. My love, you still haven't told me anything useful. Your information was outdated, and the only thing you have told me about Imagun D is that he is going to meet with a force-sensitive lizard. That is not helpful at all. His eyes widened. He didn't remember telling her or the droid commando about the Iktochi. And if he didn't remember that, what more had he told her? Oh. You are surprised. I told you I would get what I wanted. Now, your next session is about to start. Please, sweetie, tell HD-22 what he asks you about, otherwise I will have to start picking up your friends. We don't want that, do we? However, Ventress left before he could say anything. Not long after, the droid commando, HD-22 entered the room, followed by the medical droid. Dajer prepared himself for another round of questions and torture. Arg. Arg. Subcommander Dajer. When was the last time? You have you seen. The Jedi Imagundi. Dajer stayed quiet. Since he wasn't going to tell the droid commando anyway, he would do better by saving his breath for later when the torture started. And he was right to do that. Soon, the medical droid injected him with a myriad of unknown drugs, and he became lightheaded again. When he once more refused to answer, this time with more difficulty, he met the Separatist tools again. Arching his body, Dajer tried in vain to escape from the torture. Suddenly, he heard the door open, and the 2B1 droids scream. The droid commando let go of the shock baton, and Dajer finally was able to see what was happening. Cell was at the door. The 2B1 battle droids were on the ground, one without its head, and the other trying to get up. Cell kicked it, and the droid stayed on the ground. He was about to grab one of the E-5 blasters when he saw a metal fist going for his head. The droid commando had jumped about 5 meters with one step, and arching its entire body, aimed a punch at Cell's head. Thankfully, the clone was fast, and dodged HD-22's fist, otherwise he would have surely died. Cell grabbed HD-22's legs, and tried to lift the droid and thrown it away. Unfortunately, the droid commando was too heavy, and all Cell did was unbalance it and force it to take a few steps back. The droid commando lifted his knee, hitting Cell's stomach. The clone would have faced problems even if he was using his armor, what to say without it. A mix of yellow and red left Cell's mouth, and he fell to the floor. Just when the droid commando was about to step on his back, and probably break his spine, Dajer did the only thing he could do to help Cell. Grunting in pain, he lifted his broken arm, and wrapped HD-22's neck. The droid was caught by surprise, and with one foot lifted, he lost his balance. Cell, who moments before seemed unconscious, used the chance to grab the E-5 blaster, and fired two shots right in the droid commando's head, point blank. Finally, the droid that had given them so many problems, that had given Dajer so many problems, died. The medical droid had retreated to the far end of the room, and wasn't showing any signs of doing anything, so Cell ignored it. How are you? Ugh. I'm okay. Free me from those things. I've had enough of it. Cell shot the bottom of the anti-gravity locks, and they flashed a little before disappearing. Dajer thought he would land on his feet, but the days of torture had taken a toll on him. He crumbled, and Cell had to hold him. You are not well, sir. Not at all. Just give me a second. I don't think we have a second, sir. Surely, 
Every droid on this damn building heard those shots. Then give me a blaster. Right away. Here. Cell grabbed the other E5 and gave it to Dager. Feeling the unfamiliar weapon on his hands, Dager shrugged. It was better than nothing. Help me. We have to move. Cell helped him get up, and used one arm to support him, while holding his blaster with the other. They started making their way to the door, but Dager saw the medical droid. Two loud shots later, the medical droid fell to the ground with new holes on its body. He wasn't a threat, but Dager hadn't forgotten about what it did to him. Why you? Can't leave V. E. Once more, just as they were about to leave the room, something held them back. The droid commando stretched its arms, trying to grab Dager's ankles. Even with two point-blank lasers to the head, it hadn't died yet. It truly was the separatist elite unit. You are still alive, you idiot. That's good. Remember when I said I wouldn't forget you? Can't. Leave. Sneering, Dager shot the droid commando three more times. It was impossible for it to survive now, since its head was no more. Dager gave Barrow's body one last look. Goodbye, brother. Chapter 142 A small piece of doorway flew over Dager's head, after being destroyed by a red laser. Dager crouched, and returned fire. Two B-1 battle droids fell to the ground, their chests busted open. Dager walked slowly, and bent down to pick the magazines from their bodies. He was starting to get low on ammo. It had been about ten minutes since Cell had freed him, and he was now able to walk by himself, albeit slowly. However, as he started to exercise, his paralyzed muscles started to get better. This way. Cell had made his way inside the building, so he was able to find his way out easily. Seeing no more droids coming at them, Dager finally had the chance to ask Cell how he found him. Finding you was easy. The problem was getting to you. I had to do this damn climbing. Climbing? Oh, no. You escaped right from the cell, right? You crazy. That was dangerous. Thank you. You are welcomed. Dager knew that cell was bold, but not so much. Climbing could only involve escaping from the cell through the open end of it, the one that was an abyss. Cell must have gotten out through it, then climbed horizontally until he got to the temple. And only then he had done the easy part, which involved sneaking into the prison and freeing Dager. It was a miracle he hadn't died. Do you know where are the others? They have been separated from the rest ever since that woman brought you in. However, we should be able to get to them pretty easily, they are only in another area. I think they were also being interrogated. Cell looked down when he said that. He looked ashamed, and Dager knew why. Cell. It was Barrow's decision. If it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have been able to split through Ventress' fingers and rescue me. By doing that, we now have the chance to free all of our captured brothers. Barrow. He died as a soldier, and one of the best. His voice was rough, but Dager was sure Cell understood what he meant. Clones died all the time in this war, and there would be a time to mourn, but not now. We need to leave before Ventress discover we escaped. How much time have passed since you fired the first shots? Ten minutes or so. She is not here. That is the only reason I got so far. A few hours ago, she took a big portion of the clankers and left. To where, I don't know. That made things easier. However, he could not help but wonder where Ventress was, and what she was up to. The rogue Jedi, or whatever she was, was cunning and dangerous. At this moment, they finally arrived at the exit of the prison, and Dager pushed Ventress to the back of his mind. He had more important issues. Before he was the huge temple, surrounded by snow and mountains as far as the eyes could see. In the night sky, stars were closely packed. Dager looked left and right, but saw no droid. It appears the prison was far enough so that only the ones inside heard of his escape. Finally something is going right for us. Cell, where is the armory? Two shadows slipped behind an unaware droid patrol. Using the cover of the night, Dager and Cell waited for the patrol to get away, 
then started to hack into the control panel of the armory. As one of the most import buildings in every military camp, the system protecting the door wasn't easy to get past, but Dager had learned a thing or two from tech. He used the butt of the E-5 to dislodge the control panel, revealing a myriad of wires. He looked for a while, then started disconnecting and connecting wires. Cell was on lookout and stared at the droid patrol nervously. Sir, they are coming back. Just a few more. Ugh. Seconds. A few more steps and the droids would see them. Cell gripped his blaster tightly. The moment the droid saw them, he would fire. It was always best to hold the initiative. We are in. Quickly. With a swoosh sound, the door opened. Dejer quickly put back the control panel, and it hanged precariously. Anyone who wasn't blind or stupid would see that it had been broken, but the droids were almost ways the latter. The clone duo slipped inside, and the door closed behind them. I think I heard something. Nah. The cold must be freezing your circuits, F6, F4. You should use some oil. It's amazing. As if the assassin would let us. Shoo. Quiet. Keep walking. That was close. Come on. We don't have time to waste. The armory could be described as the most secure building in any military base. Without weapons and armor, any operation was a mission. It was no surprise when they saw dozens of guards spread along the armory. Crates were laying here and there, so at least they had a bit of cover, but the moment a fight broke out, they would be flanked by the droids outside. What do we do, sir? I see twenty-eight sepies, with the possibility of more where we don't have eyes. Cell looked over one crate and counted the droids. If they had grenades and the rest of Hell Squad, it was possible to break through with brute force, by with just the two of them, it was impossible. Are you able to sneak past them? I'm not that good. There are at least three of them in an open area where they can see everything. Two more up the platforms, with eyes on the hole. They have no blind spot. Frowning, Dejer reloaded his blaster. They needed their armors, and if possible their weapons, or else they would freeze to death outside. And they needed to secure the armory, otherwise the unarmed clones would be slaughtered. We will have to take care of this the old-fashioned way. Um. Sir. The sounds of blasters firing broke the silence of the night. Two droids belonging to a patrol fell in the snow. The remaining four turned around, trying to identify the attacker. A few seconds passed, and another droid was taken out, but the patrol finally identified the position of the attacker. Over there. Fire. They sprayed the region with fire, and the red lights momentarily showed a clone, before disappearing on the night. The droid leading the patrol turned on his communicator. Sir, we are under attack by clones. There is a rebellion. I will send support. Hold your position. Roger Roach. Inside the armory, a droid sergeant issued a series of orders, and two squads worth of battle droids left the armory, going outside. When the sound of the metallic steps vanished, the lid of a crate was lifted. Chapter 143 Dager counted the number of steps that passed by the crate where he was hidden. If he was correct, sixteen droids had left the armory, which meant that Cell's distraction had worked better than they expected. Now, he only had to confront about two dozen droids. He could only hope that Cell would be okay. Their plan was for him to eliminate the droid patrol, then lead their reinforcements in a ghost hunt, while he secured the armory. Lastly, if possible, Cell was to free Hell Squad, Captain Narza, Captain Hylix, and all the others. What to do after, they still had to decide. Dager lifted the lid carefully not to expose himself before it was time. He didn't have any thermal detonators, but he had done more with less. He looked at the armory, and quickly asserted the situation. The droids up on the platforms were still there, but the number downstairs was fortunately smaller. Still, no way for him to pass through them unnoticed. He got out of the crate slowly, and closed the lid even slower, so it made no sound. He positioned his stolen E-5 above the crate, and got in a stable position. Taking a deep breath, he aimed at the highest-ranking droid, 
a sergeant, and fired. The droid sergeant's head popped out of its sockets, and before it fell to the ground, Dager had already moved to his next target. Ignoring the droids next to his eliminate, he turned his blaster to the two droids on the left platform. They were his biggest threat, and the only ones who had a good angle on him. He hit one of them on the chest, and the droid stumbled before hitting the handrail and falling. Immediately, he corrected his aim a few degrees, and shot the next droid. The droid lost one leg, and wasn't able to maintain its balance. It fell backward, and hit its head on the wall, then slid down and laid there. Three enemies were down in less than ten seconds, but the well-trained, or better, well-programmed, droid started to react. A torrent of red lasers filled the air above Dager's head, and he found himself unable to counterattack. He had, however, prepared himself to this. He laid on the floor, and peeked at the enemies through the bottom of the crate. Because of how low he was, he was only able to see the bottom of the droids, but it was enough. Before the clankers noticed he had changed his strategy, he had taken out four more. From twenty-something, only seventeen or eighteen remained. Once again forced to change positions, he felt grateful for how stupid the droid makers were. Instead of splitting jobs and covering the whole crate, the clankers all aimed and fired at the same position, and Dager just had to move a little to get a good angle and take out a couple of droids. Unfortunately, not even the droids were stupid enough to let him do that indefinitely. Soon, he heard them discussing what to do. G5, R6, go and check if he is dead. Berm. Me. Why don't you go? You go. It was obvious that without an officer, the droids had fallen in disarray. Nevertheless, they soon figured out that all they had to do was send someone over to Dager's position. Three droids approached the crate carefully. Clearly, they were scared by Dager accuracy. But just being careful wasn't enough to save them. The moment they turned around the crate, Dager hit one of them with his blaster, and the droid crashed on one of its companions. Next, Dager grabbed the droid that had remained on its feet. He immobilized the droid with one arm, and forced it forward. When they passed by the two dizzy droids on the floor, Dager finished them off without remorse. Tell your friends not to shoot. To enforce his words, Dager touched the head of the droid with the tip of his blaster. At the same time, he hurried forward. He knew his threat wouldn't last much, since the Separatists felt no guilty in killing their own soldiers. However, the battle droids weren't unmoved by the prospect of being destroyed, and using such a tactic could usually buy a clone a few more seconds. He was proven right, because the moment the droid asked his fellow soldiers not to fire, they hesitated for a split second. Using all he had, Dager kicked the droid he was holding. The droid tumbled forward, and crashed into a big group of clankers, knocking six or seven to the ground in a mess of metal body parts, wires, and sparks. There was even one blaster fired by mistake. Moments before a whole slew of red lasers transformed him a weave, Dager dived behind another set of crates. He had planned his actions carefully beforehand. The crates he had chosen created an L shape, so even with his enemies just meters away from him, he was protected. Without caring to aim, he emptied his magazine on the pile of droids on the floor. He didn't know how many he had hit, but each enemy down was equivalent to a rise in his chances of winning. Hastily, he tried to reload, but found out that he had nothing left. Looking down, he saw that there was nothing where the magazines were supposed to be. Looking back, he saw them on the floor about ten meters away. They must have dropped when he was struggling with the three clankers. He tried to reach the nearest droid body to take its weapon from it, but was greeted with a torrent of red lasers. Quickly, he pulled back his hand, unharmed but vulnerable. If he was right, there were still twelve or thirteen droids left, and he had no ammo. He looked left and right, but there was nothing that could help him. In a few seconds, the droids would notice that he had stopped fighting. It was then that he saw his only hope. He had been looking for a blaster on the ground, but forgot where he was. Even inside an armory, weapons couldn't just be laying around. They had to be stocked on shelves or inside something. And he was hiding just behind that something. Scolding himself for not thinking of it before, he slightly opened one crate, 
and put his hand inside. He wasn't able to see, but he was familiar enough with weapons to know what he was holding. For the first time in days, a smile appeared on his face. Looking at the droids which were still firing at his cover, he murmured happily. Now you are screwed. Chapter 144 The weapon Dager pulled from inside the crate was a rarely seen one. A light double-barrel repeating blaster was an extremely dangerous weapon. Dager thought that he could give it to Metal after it was all over. Back to the present, Dager quickly analyzed the weapon he had in his hands. Double-barrel repeating blaster could be split into two categories, light and heavy. Heavy had to be mounted on a tripod, and could fire an astonishing 1500 lasers per minute. Light double-barrel repeating blasters had a slower fire rate, of 800 flares per minute, but could be carried around, although they were heavy. But there could never be just good things. The double-barreled blaster had some obvious downsides. The first was that even the light version weighed quite a lot. The second obstacle was that it needed too much ammo to work efficiently, and that usually meant having only magazines on your backpack, and nothing else. Last but not least, it needed extensive training to operate it correctly. However, none of those were a problem for Dager or Hell Squad. No matter if it was a Z-6 rotary or a double-barrel repeating blaster, Metal could make do with it. And so could Dager. Differently from his men, Dager had no specific expertise except on command. As the leader of one of the most elite units of the Republic Army, he was proficient on pistols, snipers, heavy weapons, close combat and even in cold weapons. Using a heavy machine gun was a piece of cake for him. Reaching inside the crate once more, he looked for ammunition. A big, round, magazine came in contact with his hand, and he grabbed it. It was heavier than he expected. To load it onto the blaster, he had to put the gun on the floor, upside down, since it was too heavy for him to hold it on one hand. After loading the blaster, he held it with one hand on either side. When the first droid dared to approach Dager, it was blasted into pieces. Literally. He wasn't ready for how powerful the double-barrel repeating blaster was. Dager was forced a few steps back, and had to put all his weight against the blaster to stabilize it. The clankers on the way of the red lasers were destroyed instantly, and their cover became a weave. After dealing with the battle droids, he was left alone on the armory. The battle had been short, but intense. Everywhere he looked he saw pieces of droids, and the walls, the ground, and the crates were plastered with laser marks. He fired a few more rounds on the pile of droids on the floor, to make sure none of them survived, and then threw the double-barrel blaster on the floor. It was too heavy for him to carry around all the time, and anyway, it wasn't his choice of weapon. He grabbed three E5s, strapped two to his back, and picked up all the ammunition he could carry. He also grabbed a few communicators. They would come in handy. Giving a last look to the armory to ensure no clanker was left, he got out of the building, and started searching for Cell. He needed to find his brother, and free the others. It wasn't that difficult to find the scout. All he had to do was follow the sounds of battle, and the flash of lasers. On his way, he saw many dead droids. At some moment when he was inside the armory, it had started snowing, so the bodies were being covered by the white powder. He saw someone crouched near him, firing a blaster. In the dark night, it was difficult to identify who it was, but when the person fired his blaster, its face was lightened up by a red glow. Cell. It's me. He had been careful not to spook the clone and get shot by mistake, but Cell nevertheless dropped to the ground and aimed his E-5 at Dager. He only lowered it after confirming it really was his superior. Sorry, sir. With the Seppies, you never know. I secured the armory. How are you doing over here? I shoot and run. Although I had a few close calls, they can't figure where I am fast enough. But with both of us, moving in silence will be more difficult. And they have been getting reinforcements over time. Soon they will have enough troops to set up a perimeter and start searching. We have to move fast. Dager understood what Cell was hinting at. It was already difficult for one clone, trained to move silently, whatsoever for Dager, who hadn't received that kind of training. 
Analyzing his options, he quickly came up with a plan. You will have to hold for a little more. They can't be getting those reinforcements from thin air. They are either sending troops from the barracks, the temple or both of it. I understand. Before leaving, Dajer threw some magazines to sell. Stopping briefly to locate the barracks, he then started moving south. As he had expected, he saw droids leaving the barracks, and moving to where Cell's old position was. He pressed his body against the side of a building, and waited for the droids to pass by him. When they left his line of sight, he entered the armory. Immediately after the door, were tow droids guarding it. They seemed very surprised to see a clone there, and then they couldn't see anything anymore. Stepping over the clankers, Dajer soon arrived at a corridor. Lining up on the sides were many prison cells, just like the one he was before Ventress moved him. There were a pair of battle droids guarding each cell. They were all looking towards him, and had most probably heard the shots. Another fight broke out, and he had to hide behind a doorway. Ugh. Stop. He was peeking and firing when he heard a droid scream, followed by a clone yelling. Some clones had seen the droids distracted by danger, and had grabbed them through the cell's bars, immobilizing them. However, some droids had escaped, and were firing wildly inside the cells. Seeing so many brothers being massacred without any way of resisting, Dajer threw all caution to the air and stepped out of his cover. He emptied his magazine on the closest droids, and instead of reloading, just dropped his blaster and grabbed another one. In a matter of seconds, and droids were dead, but Dajer's arm had been hit, and was bleeding. It was also the same arm Ventress had broken, and the pain was almost too much for him. Two clones stretched their arms from inside a cell and supported Dajer before he fell. How are you doing, sir? If 3-4 was here, he would scold me for fighting with a broken arm. Don't worry about me. Let's get you out of here. Dajer shot the control panel, and opened the nearest cell, then gave his blaster to a clone, ordering him to free the others. Come on, we gotta move. Pick whatever weapon you find, and all the ammo you can get. There are still a lot of seppies out there. Brain, where are you? Chapter 145 Brain, where are you? Over here, sir. Brain pushed his way through the bunched-up clones. He had a dark eye, probably because he had resisted their captors. However, aside from that, he seemed okay. Dajer quickly briefed him on what had happened. Cell is out there distracting the clankers, but he won't be able to hold them for much longer. Take all the soldiers who have a weapon, and go help him. What about you, sir? I have dispatched the droids guarding the armory. I will take the rest of the men, and get some weapons. Metal, come with me, I have something for you. Brain took eleven men, the same number of blasters they had, and left the barracks. Under Dajer's orders, the rest of the clones started moving out of the building, and going to the armory. Amidst them, Dajer grabbed Dab and Tech. Dab, I need numbers. How many troops do we have? How many were captured and how many are dead or wounded? And I need to know about weapons, ammo, armor, medical supplies, everything. Tech. Yes, sir. I need you to quietly find me a medic. My damn arm is killing me. Remember, don't make a fuss. No need to make the men think I am worse than I really am. And how bad is it, sir? Tech glanced at him worried. Even Dab, who was already walking away, came back. They had seen Dajer get shot and continue fighting without even frowning. Even when he was badly injured, he still insisted that the other soldiers had to be treated first. For him to actually ask for a medic, he had to be in a lot of pain. I don't know yet. Go. We don't have time to waste. Still looking at him worriedly, both clones left. Soon, Tech returned with Thardom, a 303rd attack legion medic. Dajer found something else for Tech to do, and then stayed behind with Thardom. Sir, if you could tell me what happened, it will be quicker. This doesn't look like it was made by only one laser shot. More likely it was crushed by something, right? It is broken in at least two places. Also, I spent three days hanging from a ceiling with nothing to immobilize it. And only then I was shot. 
Thardom tore apart a piece of his shirt, and wrapped it around the laser wound to stop the bleeding. He lifted Dager's arm carefully, and saw the subcommander frowning in pain. I will have to squeeze it. We are a little short on pieces of equipment. It will hurt a bit. Without waiting for Dager to answer, the medic used his fingers to touch the clearly broken bones. Ugh. You know you should have been resting this arm, don't you? Why do I get the feeling you weren't? I had to save you. I got some. Exercise along the way. Does your exercise includes punching droids? Kind of. You know me, Fartum. I can't stay put. Well, that's true. But don't worry. It is not that bad. Gilly, give me that piece of metal. While Thardom was examining Dager, they had arrived at the armory. All the clones were getting blasters, and their armors. The droids had stored them, which was great news for the clones. At least they wouldn't freeze to death. Maijito wasn't a kind planet, so the more protection they had, the better. After receiving the piece of metal, that had probably been part of a crate before Dager blew it up, Thardom used more of his shirt to tie it on Dager's arm. The clone didn't like the feeling of not being able to move freely, but the improvised splint would help his arm recovery. Fartum. The medic had already turned around to leave when Dager called him back. Don't tell anyone about how bad it is. Let them think it's just a flesh wound. Uneasily, Thartum agreed, and left to treat the other injured clones. Both weather and the work they had to do had caused many injuries amongst the already fatigued soldiers. Many were coughing, and quite a few had bruises and broken bones. A small number of clones had been shot during their riot on the barracks, and some were heavily wounded. Captain Narza, Captain Hylix. Take twenty men each, and start sweeping the base. Help Brain and Cell, and eliminate as many of the clankers as you can. But don't take unnecessary risks. If they are resisting too much, just keep them suppressed. We have to move out shortly, and I don't want more injured men. Metal. Come here. The Hell Squad member quickly approached him, and looked at his arm, but said nothing. Metal was talkative, but he knew when to speak, and when to not. This. Dager showed him the light double-barrel repeating blaster. Is your new weapon. It weighs quite a lot but you should be able to handle it. And as you can see, it does quite a lot of damage. Timer, see if you can find any sort of explosives. Already found them, sir. There are enough debt packs to level a city. We are going to need them. Come with me. Timer was a clone that was always close to Hell Squad. He was also one of the elites of the 303rd, and specialized in explosive devices, including debt packs. Dead packs were small bombs that could be remote activated, and were an old friend of any clone. The clones were all almost ready. Tech helped Dager put his armor on, and the tired soldiers lined up before him. Even under their helmets, their eyes seemed to shine with the feeling of transforming a helpless situation in the takeover of a droid base. Sir, we have taken the base. All that remains are a few clankers on the west side. Are you sure you don't want us to deal with them? Stay put, Captain. I already said I don't want unnecessary deaths. Dager turned off his comlink. Now that he had confirmation that the Temple Valley was on their hands, he was calmer. Still, they needed to move before Ventress returned with her troops. As much as Dager liked the idea of ambushing her, he knew that he didn't have enough soldiers for that, and that they were too tired. I did what you wanted. And. It's not looking too good. Dab approached him with a heavy frown on his face. He showed Dager the data on the data pad. Our total numbers are, 198 soldiers. Of those, only 142 are uninjured. 30 have light injuries, and 26 are heavily wounded. We still don't know if they can make it. The clankers don't have medical supplies. All we have is what we had on us when we were captured. How many died? 73. Chapter 146. 73. Dager closed his eyes. That was more than he had expected, and certainly more than he wanted. Let's move. Brain, Cell, Dab, and Captain Narza, 
find our way out of this valley, and to the last known position of our troops. A bunch of our troops was brought here yesterday. Ask them. Tech, Timer, Blyer, Metal, and Captain Hylix, come with me. The clones Dager called followed him to the entrance of the temple. Even when using their flashlights, it was still unusually dark. In fact, it was more than dark. It was. Cold. A different cold than the usual one of my Jido. It was a cold that made Dager shiver, and feel like he was looking to a building, but to the mouth of a massive monster, ready to eat him. Sir, this. Yeah, I know. It is the same feeling of the nightmares. Even without Blyer reminder, Dager had already linked the unnatural cold feeling to the nightmares every clone had wherever they closed their eyes. He looked in the eyes of the soldiers around him. They were shivering just like him. He was certain that those soldiers, who had fought hundreds of battles, were now almost stepping back from pure fear. The only thing that kept them from doing that was that their subcommander was still there. Clones never remembered what the nightmares were like. Maybe because of that, it was an unofficial and unspoken rule that they could never tell any outsider about it. Not even their Jedi generals. Especially the Jedis. Daedra knew that if he took a step back, he wouldn't have the courage to enter the temple, again. For a moment he thought about bringing more soldiers, but decided not to. The majority of them were too tired to even walk properly. He had already chosen the ones in the best shape. Besides that, months of battle had taught him that having a big amount of troops on an enclosed space wasn't always the best. Timer, have those debt packs ready. Metal, help him. Whatever is in there, General D has to know. Ventress isn't a normal Seppai. She is a rogue Jedi, a traitor, that's what she is. And this is most probably Jedi business. We have two plans of attack here. First one, enter, find out what the hell is in there, and take it back to the general. Second one, enter, find what the hell is in there, and if it resists, eliminate it, then bring it to the general. I don't if there is anything inside, and if there is, whether it is alive or not, but I won't take any chances. The general can scold us as much as he wants later, but we are in no conditions to bring prisoners with us. What about the debt packs? Should we plant them on the way? The Seppis wanted us to dig out this temple for them, so nothing fairer than we bury it. The prospect of having this small, petty, revenge excited the clones. They were still afraid, but at least they had a clear purpose. Dejer touched his broken arm uncomfortably, then stepped inside the temple holding a DC-17 on his hand. It was as if he had stepped into another world. He was less than a meter away from the entrance, but when he looked back, the darkness almost covered the weak light that the moons and stars gave. Flashlights on. Six pairs of lights appeared in the darkness, barely enough to let them see each other face. They started walking slowly, following the corridor. Even after half an hour, they were still walking, in the same hall. Dager started thinking something was wrong. The temple was big, but not enough for them to walk that much and not arrive at the end of it. Also, if there was a temple, there had to be something inside it. But the clones found D nothing along the way, just the same rocky walls. Look at this. Captain Hylix called Dager. The captain was just a few meters behind Dager, however, because of the darkness, he had to turn around and walk back so he could see whatever Captain Hylix wanted to show him. On the ground, half laying, half sitting, was one battle droid. Dager had walked right past it, but didn't see it. There is another over here. And over there. Now paying attention, they soon found about a dozen battle droids, all dead, each one just a few meters ahead of the other. By the looks of it, they had been walking, and then died, one at a time. Eleven clankers. That is a whole patrol. Probably pathfinders. Check them out. See if they were eliminated by something or if it was just their battery that died. Captain Hylix turned over the droid corpse, and saw that it was just as Dager said. They had no wounds, no signs of battle. Instead, their battery had ended after staying too long without recharging. Did they enter without checking their energy levels? A whole patrol. Not even the clankers are that stupid. They got lost in here, 
and for a long time on top of that. How? There are no other paths, no chambers. All they had to do was turn back and walk back to the entrance. The moment Metal said that, realization dawned upon Dager. For some time, all he could do was listen as his men continued talking. When he spoke, his voice was cracking. W what if they couldn't? Sorry, sir. Go back, now. Without waiting for his men's response, Dager started running towards the entrance of the temple. Fifteen minutes later, he stopped, panting. Running like he was, he should have gotten out of the temple a long while ago. But all that he had in front of him was darkness. By now, the clones had realized what was going on. We got lost, somehow, haven't we? Look to the walls, timer. Do you see any of the dead packs you planted? Well, I have been looking while running, and I haven't seen any of them. Not a single one. That. Timer had been putting explosives on the walls every once in a while. Not seeing any of them was a clear sign that they were on a totally different corridor, even though they hadn't turned or taken another path. Five clones looked at Dager silently, waiting for him to talk. They didn't know what was happening, so they instinctively expected their sub-commander to have an answer. Only that, he hadn't. Something, or someone, is messing with us. Check the walls, see if any of them move. Since we didn't change course, then the only option is that they did. Or. Or what, sir? Nothing. Confusedly, the clone started checking the walls while Dager was lost in thought. He knew they wouldn't find anything, because what they were dealing with wasn't something made by droids, but by someone just like Ventress. The tricks she played on his mind while he was her captive were a fresh reminder that force-sensitive beings like her could do a lot more than just make things levitate. Chapter 147 Dager, Tech, Metal, Timer, Blyer and Captain Hylix had been walking for the last few hours, and were starting to run out of water. They hadn't prepared to be on the temple for so long, but since they got trapped inside, they had no option but to walk until they found an exit. They were still on the same corridor, and no matter which direction they went, all they found was some dead droids, which had run out of battery. Their comlinks were offline, and Dager could only hope that Brain or Captain Narza didn't send anyone to look for them, otherwise more clones would be lost in the temple. Look! Dager had been so lost in his thoughts that Timer had to shook him. Something had changed, and the corridor opened in a gigantic room, bigger than any else Dager had ever seen. Pale green mist was flowing in the room, making it impossible to see it entirely. Strangely, the mist didn't seem to float outside of the room, as if an invisible wall was stopping it. Activate your filters. One of the biggest improvements that the Phase II armor had was the filters on the helmet, enough to safeguard the soldiers from most of the toxic substances. As well as filter the water so the clones would be able to battle on aquatic planets without having to worry about air supply. When he confirmed his men had all turned on the filters, Dager stepped inside of the room. Now that he was inside of it, he thought it was more appropriate to call it a hall, since he couldn't see the end of it. When he looked up, he discovered that the walls followed a weird pattern, as if they were under a stair. Tech, scan the area. And let's keep quiet. We don't know what is in here. Hell Squad's mechanic and expert with any kind of device, Tech always had a scanner with him. The blue screen rippled, and then showed the design of the room. That mist is interfering with it, but there is something in the middle of the room. And by the measures the scanner is showing, or rather the ones that it isn't, I think the temple is hollow. That room is everything it has. That is impossible. We have been walking for hours, how can it be? Even if someone is messing with the walls, we... Silence. Listen. Dager interrupted Metal harshly. Amidst the green mist, he could hear someone talking. The voice was so faint that he almost thought he was imagining it, but the other clones also heard it. Who is that? I, I can't understand what I it is s saying. S so cold. We h have t to see what it is. A gush of wind blew the mist away, revealing an altar in the middle of the hall. Something was glowing red above it, and Dager thought it was beautiful. And powerful. If he could see it, the nightmares would go away. 
he had to take it. He would be able to forget everything. Jedis, the Republic, all the brothers that he lost, Barrow. Be Barrow. Ah. Searing pain made him fall to the ground, holding his head, and then guilty washed over him. How could he want to forget his brothers, and all the sacrifices that they had done? How could he want to forget Barrow, the cheerful clone that had been one of his best soldiers and above all else, friend? You want so many things. I can give them to you. Come. Come. And no. Come. I will give you power. Power. His mind was blank, and the voice was so tempting. Dajer was almost giving up when someone pushed him, and he fell sideways on the cold ground. The impact cleared his mind, although he felt like he had been sleeping for a month, and his reactions were slow. He got up, and grabbed his DC-17, aiming in at the altar, but what entered his sights was Captain Hylix. The clone was walking towards the altar, and had crashed on Dajer on his ways, but kept on walking. And it wasn't only him, all the others were also moving in the same direction. Captain. Come back here. Timer. Blyer. None of the clones answered him, and kept limping towards the altar. Dajer ran forward, and looked through the black visors of Captain Hylix's helmet. His brother's eyes were fixed on the red glow, almost shining. He seemed to lost all of his strength, and when Dajer pushed him back, the captain fell backward without any signs of resistance, then got back up again. Seeing his efforts were futile, Dajer went to the altar. He had to destroy whatever was controlling the minds of his brothers before anything bad happened. When he approached, he saw that the origin of the red glow was a small crystal, the size of a finger. It was floating above the altar, with nothing under it. You want power. Take it. You will be powerful. With me. The voice once more resounded inside his head, much stronger this time. However, he blocked it, just like he had blocked Ventress when she was torturing him. Get. Out. Shirok. There was one more yell from the voice, and it disappeared. Dajer opened his eyes, wanting to destroy the crystal, but to his dismay, he saw that Timer was just about to touch it. The clone grabbed the crystal, the red glow escaping through the gaps between his fingers. For a moment, Timer stayed put, as if the red crystal did nothing. Then, slowly, he started to rise up in the air, and his feet stopped touching the ground. Suddenly, Timer's body arched in pain, and he left the most terrifying scream Dajer had ever heard in his life. Without much time to think, Dajer smacked his DC-17 on Timer's wrist. With a sickening sound, the clone's hand went limp, and the crystal dropped from it, and started floating a few centimeters above the ground. Instantly, Dajer heard the voice again, once more trying to persuade him. Knowing that if he waited any longer things would get worse, Dajer took off his helmet, and trapped the crystal inside, together with the voice. The moment the voice disappeared, all the clones being controlled fell to the ground, holding their heads. Ag. My head. What happened? Ouch. My wrist. I think it's broken. Dajer stood quiet, holding his breath. He was waiting to make sure the green mist wasn't poisonous, but after some time, nothing happened, and he decided it was safe to breathe normally. Tech, give me your belt. Tech took off his belt, and Dajer emptied one of the compartments that held DC-15S magazines. Carefully not to touch it, he pushed the crystal inside the compartment, and closed it. The crystal had only been exposed for two seconds, but his soldier's eyes had become blank again, and only returned to normal after a few seconds. Without time to explain, Dajer waited for them to get up, and walked towards the same corridor that they came from. Now that the red crystal was secure, he suspected that they would find the exit easily, and all Dajer wanted was to get as far as possible from the temple. Chapter 148 Light. There is the exit. After more than an hour of walking, Dajer, Metal, Tech, Timer, Blyer and Captain Hylix finally saw a pale light at the end of the corridor. The green mist had dissolved as soon as the red crystal had been trapped, and the once straight, never-ending, path that they had been following turned into a normal one, filled with twists and turns. Dajer looked at his soldiers, more specifically at Timer. 
With his haste, he had forgotten about the clone's wrist, which he had broken himself. Now, with the red crystal safely locked on the belt he was holding, and when they were almost out of the Temple of Asherus, Dajer thought it was appropriate to tell the trooper what happened. Timer. Yes, sir. Your hand. It was me. I'm sorry. I don't quite understand, sir. When we were at that hall, this damn crystal was controlling you all. You touched it, and started screaming. I had to get it out of your hand, fast. I understand, sir. Dajer knew that he didn't. It wasn't easy to cope with the pain of broken bones, and knowing that it was Dajer that did it, all the clone could do was stay silent. Unless one saw for himself what Dajer saw, they would always believe there was a better option, even if they were brothers. An awkward silence followed the small interlude, but Dajer had already put his attention on something else. He could see the dark sky of Majido, and that the light they were seeing wasn't from the sun, but from the clones outside. That was, however, impossible, because they had spent at least five or six hours inside the temple, and it should have already been day outside. Majido had thirty-six hours of nighttime, and only six of daytime, so Dajer really wanted to take advantage of it, and got as far of the temple as they could during the day. They had many injured, limited equipment, and no vehicles, meaning that they would slow down a lot during the night, when even seeing one own hand was difficult. As soon as they left the temple, Captain Narza and the rest of Hell Squad went to meet them. They were looking weirdly at the clones that came out of the temple. Is there something wrong, sir? Do you need more men? If he needed more men, then he wouldn't be out of the temple unharmed. Call back everyone, we are moving out. Did you send anyone looking for us? If so, call them too. Brain staggered, and spoke very carefully. He seemed to think his superior was having some kind of trouble, and Dajer didn't like that. They had gone through too much for his men to doubt him. Why would we send anyone looking for you? It hasn't been twenty minutes since you entered the building. This time it was Dajer who staggered. Twenty minutes. That was impossible. They had been walking for hours and hours inside the temple. However, at this moment he realized that above the mountains, traces of light started to appear, and were growing stronger. While he looked, the sun appeared in the sky, and Dajer knew that something was wrong. It was possible for Brain to be wrong about the time, although improbable. However, no one could change the cycle of the sun. You said twenty minutes. We spent hours in that damn place. If the crystal could trap us in that endless corridor, maybe it also has changed our sense of time. Crystal. What crystal? Dajer ignored Cell, who had just arrived and was listening attentively, and thought about what Tech had said. It was the only reasonable explanation. Reasonable after everything Dajer had seen Ventress do, of course. Narza, Hylix, get everyone moving. Cell, lead a patrol ahead, scout the path. I want to know if Ventress and her droids are coming back. Brain, find me a map, or anything like that. Dab, you will be leading the vanguard with Lieutenant Hawk. Fartum. You are in command of the medical unit. I want wounded in the middle. Prioritize those who can't walk, and those who are too wounded to go fast. We have to hurry, but I want no men left behind. Is that clear? Metal and Tech, you are the rear guard. While Dajer was giving orders, Brain returned with a hologram projector, and showed a big map, but lacking on details. Dajer frowned. Is this the best we had? The logistics building caught on fire during the combat, sir. Almost everything was lost. That was all we could gather. Dajer analyzed the map, and rotated it. It showed a quarter of the planet, but only the main roads, cities, canyons, and mountains appeared. Thankfully, the temple was marked on it, so at least they knew where they were. The last known position of our troops was on Yamala, right here. That is also the direction that Ventress and her clankers went. According to our battle plans, if we lost Yamala, we would retreat to this valley here. Dajer traced a red line connecting the city and the valley, then another one connecting their position to the valley, but going around Yamala. We will go here, and hope that they are still there. Tech, I want you to try and fix our long-distance communicators. 
Now, we have to suppose that Ventress will come after us. So, we are going to take the big turn right around. Here. He circled an area where a city connected to one of the main roads of the planet. A giant bridge crossed over a canyon, and a few more, smaller, also connected the two sides of the massive gorge. We will blow this bridge, and the others around it, in this sequence. And, if Ventress troops catch us before we can do that. Dajer lowered his voice, and the officers around him got closer, so the normal soldiers couldn't hear them talking. A small group will stay behind and hold them off. We will discuss who only if that ever comes to happen, understood? All of them nodded seriously. Staying behind was obviously a mission, a last resort so the others could survive. Nobody wanted that to happen, and preferred to only think about it when it was strictly necessary. Moving on. Timer, give me the detonator, and go see a medic. Your hand needs treatment. All right, everyone, let's move. Dajer got a loudspeaker from one of the soldiers, and got up on a crate. Brothers. The Seppis thought that they could use us to dig out their things. Well, they thought wrong. Not only we escaped, but we are also going to give them a little something to remember us. Clear the area, pack your things, and let's find the rest of our brothers. Move. 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 The soldiers had been prepared for a long time before Dajer warned them, and they all moved towards the exit of the valley. When no one was close, Dajer pressed the trigger. A chain of explosions caused snow to flutter in the air, and with a resounding boom, the Temple of Asherus, where they had been forced to work, disappeared amidst a cloud of smoke. Chapter 149 When the dust settled, the Temple of Asherus has tilted to one side, and was half buried under snow and dirt. Debris covered the whole area around it, and the nearby buildings had all been pelted with stones, and some had even collapsed. Dajer felt nothing but satisfaction when he saw the already damaged columns that sustained the temple crack and break, furthering the destruction. He couldn't think of a better way to get his revenge against Ventress for what she did to him and his brothers. Unknowingly to him, when he turned around and led the clones away from the valley where the temple was, the red crystal that he had trapped inside a box glowed stronger. Ventress made a grabbing motion with her hand, and an unlucky clone that was firing at her from meters away suddenly discovered that his feet weren't touching the ground, and that he was being pulled towards the dangerous woman. His last memory was of the smile on her lips as a red lightsaber pierced his heart, killing him immediately. Usually, she wouldn't mind playing with her victims a little, but now she was in the middle of an intense battle, and even with her arrogant self couldn't be careless. Using the information that the clone officer she captured gave to her, she had intercepted the main Republic force on Majido. She frowned when she remembered the resilient officer. She had been able to squeeze some very interesting information from him, but when she asked about the battle plans of the Republic, he had closed his mind. Somehow, he hid from her that the Republic had not one or two at TES, but half a dozen of them, plus, a myriad of smaller vehicles. She didn't want to admit, but she had to order a retreat, otherwise a whole slew of her troops would be lost, impacting the separatist campaign on Majido. She jumped forward, and sliced two clones with one move. She despised the clones. They were weak, emotional, and persistent like bugs. Suddenly, her expression of disgust became one of astonishment. Like a wave, she felt something hit her mind, and affect the balance of the force. She turned around, and looked to the mountains, but her mind was on the Temple of Asherus. Something had happened. So absorbed on her thoughts, she didn't notice a clone sergeant aiming his blaster at her back until a droid captain warned her. Spinning around, her lightsaber moved at inhuman speed, deflecting the blue laser back to its origin. The clone sergeant tumbled to the ground surprised, and soon life vanished from his eyes. Ventress ignored the man she just eliminated, and stopped in her tracks, letting the droid vanguard engulf her. She grabbed a droid with yellow markings. Captain, order total retreat. But, madam. We are winning. Total retreat, captain. Now. Yes, madam. All units, retreat back to quadrant 86 to 909. I repeat. Retreat to quadrant 86 to 909. As if they were one single machine, 
the droid army stopped dead on its tracks, and turned around, rearguard becoming vanguard, and vanguard becoming rearguard. Orderly, they started their retreat, but the Republic soldiers, seeing their enemy run, became even more audacious, and countless droid units were shot on their backs. Some of the clones even started chasing after the retreating army, only to be called back by their superior officers. However, nothing could extinguish the satisfaction of winning the battle. General D was on the front lines, fighting side by side with Commander Keeley. Both clone and Jedi were exhausted, but neither was willing to give up and retreat. A little to the left, Ragu seemed much better than them, jumping and dashing amidst the droids, cutting them down and reflecting their lasers. They are breaking through the left flank. Quickly, General Du analyzed their options in his head. There was a mountain range to their right, so they were safe from attacks from that direction, at least until the right flank held strong. However, if the left flank fell, the droid army would be able to split the Republic's troops, and systematically eliminate them. It was one of the favorite Separatist strategies. Commander Keeley, retreat what is left from the left flank. Let's put that mountain range behind our backs. Yes, General. That was what Commander Keeley was about to suggest. This way, even with they didn't gain any ground, at least they could hold what they had. However, before he could give the order, he saw General D stop moving. Even the lightsaber on his hand turned off. Immediately worried that something had happened, Commander Keeley signaled two of his men to stay in front of General D to serve as a shield while he checked the Jedi. General, sir. What happened? He checked his general but saw no wound or blood. Instead, General D was looking straight forward, right through the Separatist forces, as if they weren't even there. A disturbance in the force. This is our chance. His voice was so quiet that Commander Keeley had trouble understanding what he was saying amidst the noises of the battle. He followed General D's line of sight, and saw no disturbance on the force or whatsoever, but the droid army retreating. Immediately after, he heard one of his men calling after him. Commander. The clankers are on the run. All over the battlefield, Republic soldiers fired a few more shots at the retreating army, then started celebrating. Commander Keeley wasn't carried away by the victory, because he knew very well that the Republic had been on the losing side. He ordered the clones to stay ready for battle, and the medics to start treating the wounded before the enemies returned. However, minute after minute passed, and not a single clanker was in sight. General, I think they are really gone. Why? They were clearly winning. Something happened, Keeley. I just don't know what. Many hours later, Ventress arrived at the Temple of Asherus in a STAP speeder. What greeted her was the broken remains of the temple. The middle portion had collapsed on itself, leaving the interior of the temple open to the sky. Without even waiting for the STAP to stop, Ventress jumped out of it and ran inside the temple through the hole. She couldn't care less about the building itself, but what was inside of it. The red crystal inside the temple was a kyber crystal, and a powerful one on top of that. Her master, Count Dooku, had sent her to get it for him. Kyber crystals were the core component of a lightsaber, and usually come in many colors, but never red. A red crystal meant that the owner of the crystal had been tortured and eliminated, and that his mind had been broken beyond repairs. The pain, anguish, and despair that the master of the crystal generated dyed the crystal with the color of blood. Like her master, and the master of her master, and the master of those who came before, Ventress had gotten her Sith lightsaber by torturing and killing a Jedi, and stealing the Kyber crystal. She didn't know why her master wanted another crystal, but the one thing she knew was that he wasn't lenient with those who disappointed him. Looking to the direction where the clones had run, a cold smile crept its way on her face. They would regret doing this. They really would. Chapter 150 Brain had just returned from a scouting mission when he saw the subcommander of the 303rd Attack Legion, Dager, sitting on a rock alone. For the last few days, the mixed group of 303rd Troopers and Galactic Marines had been marching through the snow to get back to the main attack force on Majido. However, things were looking grim. Of the 200 soldiers that left the Valley of the Temple of Asherus, about 20 had died because of their wounds. Dager himself had a broken arm that had been paining him for days. 
Now, Brain noticed with interest, his officer was using a small rock to scratch his shoulder pad. Two small but clear lines could be seen on the armor piece, contrasting with the dark brownish red that covered half of his phase two armor. What are you doing? Dager looked up to him, not surprised to see Brain ask. The clone was his most trusted soldier, and his closest friend. Dager threw the stone away, and brushed his shoulder pad to clean the paint that he had scratched off. Because of his helmet, Brain couldn't see his face, but Dager's eyes reflected a mix of pain and rage. When we were at this temple, that thing made me want to forget everything. It wanted me to forget 3-4, to forget General D, Commander Keeley, and Hell Squad. To forget about the war, about all our brothers who died. About the Sarge, about Barrow, about Rot Hacks, about everyone. In a way, I think that would be worse than treason. Brain didn't know what to say. Dager hadn't really answered his question, but he wasn't sure if he should ask again. Dager had always been quite closed, and detached from his men, never interfering with them unless he thought it was necessary but always following orders, and making sure they were being followed by his soldiers. It was the first time he ever talked about how he was feeling, and Brain stared at him silently. Thankfully for him, his superior officer didn't plan on leaving things like that. I don't want to ever forget about them, and above all else, I don't want to ever forget for what they thought. Each of those markings. He showed the two scratches on his armor. Are someone we took down because of them. Not just any droid, but those who represent everything we fight against. That medical droid, and that droid commando. And Ventress. I guarantee you, she has a place for her here, next to these two clankers. And I assure you, sir, that someday we will put her marking there. For Barrow. And for all our brothers fighting for the future of the galaxy. After that, both clones stayed silent for many minutes, until Dager finally recovered from his somber mood, and returned to his officer-like attitudes. Brain could help but smile. He knew that his squad leader was back, and more determined than ever. Dager looked around the precarious camp that the clones had set. Snow was falling from the sky, but thankfully there was no wind, meaning that the clones were cold, but not freezing. The two scratches he made on his armor attracted a lot of attention, especially since Brain couldn't hold back his tongue, and told the others the reason he did it. Dager thought it was for the best, since the troopers seemed more motivated than ever. And he had good news for them. Dager called his closest officers, namely Captain Narza, Captain Hylix, Thardom, and Hell Squad. Men, Brain brought us some good news. The bridge we need to cross is just 70 kilometers away. Considering our speed with the wounded, in two days we should be safe and sound on Republic territory. There was a round of quiet cheers amongst the group of clones, but Dager quickly silenced them. Probably it was just superstition, but he had seen too many troopers celebrate only to get eliminated by what they supposed wasn't a problem. Of course, there was a logical explanation. Whatever a soldier lowered his guard, for any reason, things could get nasty. Either way, Dager wasn't willing to gamble the life of his soldiers on just a prospect. He would only relax when he saw the Republic forces. In a war, there was no such thing as safety. Just crossing the bridge wouldn't mean that Ventress was forbidden from chasing them. At most, it meant that she would be wary of encountering a bigger enemy force than she expected. Dager was just about to conclude the meeting when a clone came looking for him. The clone got down from one of the staps they had stolen and saluted Dager. Clankers on our trail. Distance. How many? Maybe thirty kilometers behind us. It was just a scouting party, but the main force can't be far behind. A round of curses replaced the cheers. Just when they thought they were almost out of danger, something like that happened. Did they see you, Sharp? Sharp, the clone who had just reported in, shook his head. I don't think so, sir. I was pretty far away from them. Fartum. Prepare the wounded. We are moving in ten minutes. But, sir. We can't. I haven't finished stabilizing them yet. If we move now, many will get worse. There will probably be casualties. Dager looked straight at Thardom's eyes. 
he liked it even less than the medic did, because any death would be because of his orders. Unfortunately, time wasn't a commodity they had. And if we don't move now, we all will die. Captains, you heard me. Ten minutes. Immediately, the group of officers dispersed, leaving only Dab and Dager behind. The sniper coughed to get Dager's attention, who was lost in thought. If you have something to say, Dab, then say it, otherwise get moving. I want you on our rear guard. Dab ignored the harshness of Dager's voice. Sir, do you remember that avalanche we saw yesterday when we were crossing that gorge? A bunch of those white, climbing creatures disappeared under it. Dager clearly remembered, because it was terrifying, even though they were kilometers away from it. A group of creatures about four meters tall, and clearly adapted to the environment, disappeared like they were nothing under it. At the time, all Dager could think about was that if it were the escaping clone stuck under it, less than half would have made it out alive. What so? Dad smiled cunningly, and Dager instantly knew what was going on in his head. Sometimes he forgot how smart the sniper was, mainly because he almost never talked. If we could provoke one of those, the path of the clankers would be blocked, and they would have to take a detour through one of the secondary roads we saw. That would give us all the time we need to get away, and more. And, if we are lucky, we might even bury a few of them. It sure will be well deserved. Dab, gather hell squad. It's been some time since we've done something together. Chapter 151 Dager, Tech, Brain, Metal, Cell, and Dab sat at the top of a mountain, looking down to the road that the escaping clones were following. Now, the clones were already out of their line of sight, even though they had slowed down because of the wounded. However, the signs of the small camp that they set could be clearly seen. While Cell was analyzing the road below, on lookout for the droids, Dager was going over their plan again. Tech already set the charges. When the clankers get here, they will probably stop to search through what we left behind. That is when we will blow the debt packs. To make sure that the droids stopped, they had left very clear signs that they had been there. If everything went according to the plan, at least part of the droids would stop there, and then Hell Squad would blow up a piece of the mountain, triggering an avalanche. Cell, can you see them? Not yet, sir. Dager crouched next to Cell, and lowered his macro binoculars. He could see farther than Cell, but still saw no signs of the droid army they were expecting. According to Sharp, they weren't too far behind, and clankers didn't need to rest, only recharge. Then he saw something at the far end of his line of sight. A group of the creatures they had been seeing in the last days was running towards them. Dager focused behind the fleeing bunch, and soon the first B-1 battle droids appeared, followed by B-2 units and AATs. Thankfully, Droidikas had a hard time rolling on the snow, so Ventress didn't bother to bring some. Right in front of the approaching Separatist force, Dager saw Ventress herself. Suddenly, she looked up, directly at Dager. For a moment, he thought that he had been seen, but then Ventress shook her head. Dager dropped down to the snow, in case she ordered any droid to search his position with binoculars. She probably felt that he was watching her, but even for a force-sensitive being, the distance was too great to actually see something. Just in case, Dager preferred to get out of sight. Retreat. Tech, are the charges ready? We have about an hour before they get here. Let's get ready. Captain. Yes, madam. Send a patrol ahead. I have a feeling we are about to catch up with the clones. Yes, BZZ. Madam. Very soon, three droids left the big group on staps, and flew ahead, lifting patches of snow as they went by. Hell Squad had moved from the top of the mountain to somewhere far from both the droid army and the path of the avalanche. They sent a patrol. Three clankers. Cell warned them, and the clones all grabbed their blasters nervously, especially Metal. He was anxious to try out his new double barrel repeating blaster. With a move from his hands, however, Dager ordered them to stand down. If this patrol doesn't return, they will know we are here. We have to hide. Quickly, bury yourselves. Berm. Instead of answering, Dager used his hands to shovel snow over Cell, 
who was laying on the ground with his blaster and his binoculars by his side. The clones finally understood what he meant, and started doing the same. Soon, six mounds of newly rummaged snow appeared. Under them, small patches of brown and black could be seen if one looked carefully. Our footprints. Stop. Dab wanted to get up and erase the clear footprints on the snow, but Dager stopped him. He could already hear the sound of the three steps approaching. They will be too worried about the camp to see them. Now, stay quiet. Even when whispering, Dager was worried that the droids would hear them. The patrol arrived at the abandoned camp, barely 300 meters away from Hell Squad. They made circles around the place, looking for clones, but aside from the mess of footprints and a few crates that were left on purpose, the clankers apparently saw nothing. At a certain time, one of the steps flew just a few meters away from Dager, and he had to exert enormous control over himself not to fire. After what seemed like an eternity, the patrol finally left, going back the way they came. Dager waited a few more minutes before getting up, and brushing the snow off his armor. Some of it made its way through the gaps between pieces, and melted when touching his skin, making him shiver with the unexpected cold. Well, that was more intense than I expected. Behave yourself, Cell. As always, as soon as possible, Cell complained, and Brain followed. Dager knew that he couldn't find more loyal and skilled troopers, but sometimes the two clones behaved like they still were cadets. Even so, he couldn't help but let a small smile appear on his face. Cell was right, it really was intense, although nothing happened. He could feel sweat mixing with melted snow on his back. I say we get a little farther away. What do you think, sir? Dejer nodded, agreeing with Metal. This time, they moved the farthest they could while still having the ambush place in their sights. Nothing unexpected happened again, and in half an hour they could hear the sounds of the marching droid army, muffled by the snow. After twenty more minutes, they finally saw the first droids appearing, and more followed. Tech gripped the trigger anxiously, and looked at Dager expectantly. Not yet. We have to let more of them walk into the trap. However, as more and more seppies appeared, including Ventress, Dager couldn't help but feel nervous himself. If they were discovered, or if the avalanche failed, Hell Squad would be as good as dead. They could fight off a two, or even three to one disadvantage, but not two or three hundred times as many enemies as they. Less than half of the droids had entered the traps area, but it was too risky to wait any longer. Besides, their objective wasn't to eliminate the droids, but block their path. Burying them was a bonus. A cadence of explosions filled the air, making the Separatist army look up. At the top of the mountain, small pillars of smoke rose in the air, but that was all. For a moment, Dager thought that they hadn't used enough dead packs, but then the ground trembled. The top of the mountain shook, and snow and rocks started rolling down, soon forming a white wave of destruction. When it finally came crashing down on the droid army bellow, nothing was left of them. Snow and dust were everywhere, and Hell Squad couldn't see anything for a while. When it finally settled, the sight startled Hell Squad. The whole road had been engulfed by the snow. Here and there, droid arms, legs and heads could be seen sticking out, sparks flying out of the broken components. Cell whistled. It truly was a terrifying sight. It's a pity 3-4 isn't here to see this. I doubt any clanker survived that. Chapter 152 Ventress pushed her hands upwards with inhuman efforts to hold back the amount of snow that was about to crash down on her. Blood vessels popped on her hands and arms, and her eyes became bloodshot. Although she had her fair deal of dangerous situations, she had never used such amount of force. She could feel her reserves draining, and black spots disrupted her vision. She knew that if they didn't do something soon, she was bound to die. So, using more force than she ever had before, she blasted the snow out of the way, sending it flying in the air. The effort left her breathless, and she dropped to the ground panting. Only after several minutes she finally got up. Around her was utter destruction. The droid army that she had with her was either buried or in pieces around her. Only a few hundred lucky ones, who had been near her when the avalanche happened, survived. Ma. Madam. 
Where? You. Her communicator bipped, and she vaguely heard the droid captain's voice, interrupted by static. With her sensitive ears, she heard the mechanical sounds of droids behind the avalanche. It appeared that part of her army had survived. Ignoring her exhaustion, she walked towards the snow wall, and put her hands on it. Small pieces of snow fell on her bald head, and the cold relieved her a little bit. She could feel a headache coming, as it always did when she overexerted the use of the force. Captain, stay away from the snow. Madam, there. Snow every. Ventress shook her head. Sometimes droids were just too stupid, and she couldn't be bothered to explain more to it. Closing her eyes, she let the force concentrate on her hands, before releasing it at once. Five or six meters of compacted snow was pushed away, burying the stupid captain that was behind it. Ventress stepped over the broken body, and looked at the troops she had left. About five hundred droids had been buried, but she still had more than a thousand troops. Against a few hundred, and tired, clones, that should be more than enough, unless they pulled out another trick like the avalanche. Anyway, Ventress didn't care about how many troops she lost. They were expendable, she could just get more. She looked at a droid sergeant, identifiable by the yellow markings, similar to the ones a droid captain had, but fewer. You are the new captain. Move. Hell Squad met the other clones two hours later. With Ventress and the droid army out of the way, the clones unconsciously slowed the pace. Dager thought about hurrying them, but Thardom wasn't kidding when he said that many wounded were at the limit. Many who had recovered slightly worsened because of the fast pace, and more than one was near death. Dager was worried about unforeseen problems, but he also relaxed a little when the threat that was Ventress disappeared. This series of events and coincidences all led to the ultimate flaw in Dager's plan. He didn't know that not only Ventress had survived, but her troops also did, and were hot on their heels. So, two days later, Dager, Brain, Captain Narza and Captain Hylix were on top of a hill, looking down to the bridge that meant safety when they received the bad news in the worst possible way. Suddenly, chaos broke out. Dozens of clones fell victim to an unsuspected volley of red lasers. Dager turned around, and saw that the clankers he thought they had buried were right behind them. Veteran soldiers, after the first moment of panic, the clones grabbed their weapon, and tried to resist. However, they were outnumbered six to one, and more troopers started dropping like flies. If things stayed like this, all of them would die. Dager grabbed his DC-15A, and ran towards the battle, all the while barking orders. Thartum, Blyer, and Sharp. Take the wounded and go. Timer, plant the debt packs. Lieutenant Shield, take the left flank and go with them. Hell Squad, on me. Narza and Hylix, we will hold them back. Shoot and retreat, understood. Come on, Hylix. At that moment if life or death, none of the clones hesitated to throw themselves at the fray. About thirty to forty troopers covered the retreat of the others. The bridge was only a few hundred meters away. If they managed to cross and blow it, then they would be safe, at least for a while. Amongst the clones that stayed behind, Hell Squad was surely the most eye-catching. Tech and Cell used their DC-15S to take down two or three droids before running back a little. Dab used his DC-15X to find and eliminate the enemy officers. The sergeant that Ventress appointed as the new captain was the first to fall. Brain and Metal also were a force to be reckoned with. The new weapon that Dager gave to Metal was wreaking havoc amidst the closely packed B-1 battle droids, and Brain's thermal detonators cleaned up those which remained. And Dager was dueling with an AAT. Only one of the tanks that Ventress brought survived the avalanche, but it was enough to slaughter Dager's men if left alone. So the leader of Hell Squad had taken on to him the task of keeping it busy. Every time the main cannon if the AAT turned to shoot at Dager, he would roll out of the way. This made difficult for the AAT to focus on him, but more than once Dager was almost blasted to pieces. Dodging the tank wasn't an easy feat, but he also had to worry about the clankers firing at him. I will create an opening, you take it down. Dab stopped sniping the enemy officers and started charging his DC-15X. 
Long ago, he had modified his weapon so it could charge a powerful blaster, enough to cause a small explosion when it hit. More than once it had proven useful to take down targets that hid behind cover. Still, it wasn't enough to even sway an AAT whatsoever destroy it. However, since Dager had spoken, Dab had full trust in him. Meanwhile, Dager suddenly stopped. Seeing the clone that had been pestering it for so long stop, the AAT turned its barrel towards him. Just when it was about to fire, Dager fired two quick shots at the hatch on top of the tank. His gamble played off. Both blue lasers hit the hatch's lick, blasting it open. At the same time, Dab fired the charged shot, hitting the inside of the AAT. A small explosion happened, followed by a much bigger one when all the ammo inside the AAT blew up. Without waiting for the reaction of the droids, Dager swiftly retreated. The bridge was now only a hundred meters away, and most of the clones had already crossed it. Only the ones that were covering their escape remained, now only twenty of the original forty. At that moment, Dager's soldier sense warned him. He scanned the droids with his eyes, and saw Ventress looking directly at him. She had her red lightsaber on her hand, trespassing the limp body of a clone. Chapter 153 Ventress looked at him, and even with dozens of meters and hundreds of droids between them, Dager could see the hatred on her eyes. Memories from what she did to him appeared in his mind. He wanted revenge, but now was not the place nor the time for it. Quickly, he signaled full retreat to the few soldiers he still had with him. They disengaged the droids and started making their way towards the bridge. Only Hell Squad remained behind, because they saw that Dager was looking at Ventress without moving. When he saw his brothers staying with him, Dager felt grateful. He loved all his brothers, but he had a stronger bond with the members of his squad. Forget the clankers, focus on Ventress. And be careful with lasers she reflects. General D can do that, so she probably can too. We have to get to the bridge. Aim for her legs. Dager nodded at Tech's suggestion. Aiming at the legs would make it more difficult for Ventress to deflect them, and also slow her down. His biggest worry wasn't the lightsaber, but the force she used. If she got close enough, she could just pick them up and throw them away. Six clones started firing all they had against the single rogue Jedi, including Metal's double barrel repeating blaster, but all of the lasers were either dodged or deflected by Ventress. Some of them even hit the droids close to her, destroying them, but Ventress continued her relentless advance. Reloading. Dab and Cell ejected the two empty magazines from their blasters, and inserted new ones as fast as they could, but the small amount of time was enough for Ventress to get a few more meters closer. Surprisingly, she didn't use the force as Dager expected she would, but kept advancing. It appeared she wanted to eliminate them with her lightsaber. What Dager didn't know was that she wasn't able to use the force because of Dager's avalanche trick. Suddenly, Dager felt the snow beneath his feet become something more solid. Quickly looking down, he saw they had arrived at the bridge. There, Captain Narza, Captain Hylix, and the rearguard troopers were waiting for them. Sir, the charges are set. We just have to cross. Go, go, go. And then Ventress was above him. She had jumped, and flew meters above the ground until she was right on top of him. Dager raised his blaster to defend himself, but the red lightsaber sliced through it like it was nothing. He saw a flash of red, and then searing pain on his face. Dager fell, unable to do anything but scream in pain. His face was burning, especially his right eye. He couldn't open it. Vaguely, he saw an explosion near him, and Ventress was thrown on the air. Two arms grabbed and pulled him. The bottom half of his body dragging on the ground, he saw four or five clones bravely taking cover behind the sides of the bridge. Go. We will hold them. He saw Captain Hylix wave at him, or most probably, at the soldier dragging him. He tried to lift his arm and stop Captain Hylix, but he didn't have enough strength. Then, more hands grabbed him, and he felt the cold snow under him. They were on the other side of the bridge. He was lifted and put on an improvised litter. Leaning on his elbows, Dager saw Captain Hylix fire at Ventress, 
while the troopers he had with him went down one by one under the concentrated droid fire. Blow. Blow it up. The clone near him leaned closer to listen. Dejo's voice was so low he thought it might have been his imagination. What, sir? Blow. It. Up. The clone spoke with someone, and Dejo saw Timer give the trigger to Captain Narza. The captain looked at Dejo uncertain. Dejo's eyes haven't left the bridge. He saw Ventress hold Captain Hylix by the throat, and stab him in the chest with the lightsaber. Hell Squad's leader nodded. Without hesitating anymore, Captain Narza pressed the trigger. A chain of explosions crossed the entirety of the bridge, and it crumbled, pieces of it falling in the gorge below. Just before he passed away, Dejo saw Ventress do a backflip, and jump out of the collapsing bridge. When he woke up, Dejo was inside a building, laying on a hard bed. For some reason, his vision was blurry. By his side were his armor and his blaster. Aside from dust and battle marks, there was also a terrific scar on his helmet. The entire right side of it had been cut through, starting above the visor and going all the way down to where it connected to the neck. Through it, Dejo could see the inside of the helmet, where broken wires were hanging. You are awake. On the other side of the bed, near a medical droid, was a clone Dejo hadn't seen for a long time. Three. Cough. Berg. Three four. What are you going here? Calm down, sir. I recovered from my wounds. See? He slapped his side, where many weeks before a laser had hit him, almost killing 3-4. Where are we? We are on the sincerity, sir. You have been unconscious for the last few days, so you lost quite a lot. The 303rd pulled out of my Jito. We left the Galactic Marines to take care of it. The planet is now half ours half the Sepis. That was expected. From the start, it was obvious my Jito wouldn't be conquered in just one battle. Dejo needed to know what was happening, so he tried to get up, but 3-4 held him down. Hold on, sir. Your eye isn't good enough yet. We took you out of the Bacta tank because there isn't any more it can do for you, but you have to. My eye. What is wrong with my eye? He raised his hand and touched his face. Half of it was covered by bandages that he hadn't noticed before. Over his right eye, there was a huge bump. 3-4 looked uncomfortable, but he knew it was better to answer at once. He scratched his head and looked away from Dejo. Brain and the boys told me you fought with a Jedi traitor or something on my Jito. General D called her a Sith. Well, she. She almost sliced your face in two. You were lucky, sir. But her lightsaber reached your face. And your eye. Ventress. At the last moment, after she had injured Dejer, someone had blown something near her, keeping the Sith away from him. How bad is it? Your eye might, or might not make it. We could try replacing it if it doesn't recover, but I'm not optimistic about that. The higher-ups rarely replace limbs or anything. Too expensive, they say. There was a small grudge on 3-4's voice, but Dejer could understand it. Clones were extremely loyal to the Republic, but even they had grievances with how it worked. More than one brother of Dejer had to retire early after losing a limb, because it was cheaper to make a new clone than to make metallic limbs for every disabled soldier. Help me up, 3-4. I have to talk to General D. Chapter 154 With 3-4 helping him, Dejer got up. Even if he ignored his wounded eye, Dejer also had many different wounds. His entire body was sore, especially his legs, although he didn't know why. In fact he had engaged in so many battles that it could be because of a dozen different reasons. His arm was also hurting a lot. It had been showing signs of getting better, but in the last battle he was forced to use it a lot, so it got worse than before. Whenever they passed by a clone, be it one clad in full armor, or wearing non-combat attire, they all saluted him. Apparently, Stories about how Dejer helped 200 clones escape from the slave-like work had already spread through the sincerity. They met Hell Squad on the way, wearing their armors and holding their helmets under their arms. Just like the others, they saluted Dejer, and then immediately started asking how he was. 
He smiled when he heard the concern on his brother's voice. I'm all right. According to 3-4, I won't have even a scar left. All the members of Hell Squad looked at the medic. They had seen Dagers wound by themselves, and it didn't look like it was so unimportant. 3-4 quickly shook his head. I said the scar probably won't be too big. It will probably cover only half of your face. But look by the bright side of things. You probably will scare away the droids before we even have a chance to fight. Ha 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 ha. For a few seconds the laughter of Hell Squad resonated on the corridors of the sincerity, until Dager's face turned serious and he looked at Brain, his right hand. How many escaped, Brain? A hundred and eighty-two, sir. Captain Hylix died on the bridge. I saw it. He was a true soldier. They stayed silent for a few moments. The aftermath of a battle was always like that. Laughing a little and grieving a lot. Unfortunately, most of the time they couldn't even grieve for their deads properly. Like now. Let's go to the command bridge. I need to talk to General D. We already told him about Ventress, sir. You really should rest more. Your injuries aren't a joke. It's not about Ventress I am concerned, Metal. While he was being tortured, Dager had told Ventress at least something. He didn't know what or how much, but it was a fact that she had cracked him. Like always, Hell Squad found Commander Keeley and General D on the command bridge. Both of them almost never left it, and when Dager was uninjured, he was by their side. General D's Padawan, the young Tigruta named Ragu, was also there, looking bored. Dajer could help but think about how different master and apprentice were. General D was calm and methodical, while Ragu always jumped headfirst into danger. The Padawan was skilled, however, and had helped Dajer more than once. At the same time, the Jedi and Padawan seemed to complement one another, and fought with such cohesion that was only possible because of the Force and their complete trust in each other. You shouldn't be here. What about your eye? The first to see him was Ragu. The Padawan half walked, half jumped to Dajer, and talked with a mixture of excitement, worry, and concern. I am almost good, General Ragu. I need to talk to you all. General D walked forward, and put his hand on Dajer's uninjured shoulder. My Padawan is right, Dajer. You shouldn't be here. Your wounds are many, and worrisome ones. I have urgent intel, General. My wounds can wait. General D raised an eyebrow. What urgent intel could Dager had, considering he was unconscious for almost a week? Still, he could see that Dager was troubled. The eyes of the sub-commander carried many worries, and a hint of. Guilty. 3-4 and Brain helped Dager get near the hologram table, and he used it to support himself. He saluted Commander Keeley, who gave him a friendly tap on the shoulder. Hell Squad, Commander Keeley, General D, Ragu and even Admiral Dao, who was a distance away, looked at Dager expectantly. He took a deep breath, and for the first time in years, didn't look on the eyes of his brothers when he was talking. Generals, Commander, I I. I betrayed the Republic. There was a short period of shocked silence after he uttered those words, then Commander Keeley and Ragu talked at the same time. What do you mean, Dager? You can't. You would never do that. Dager looked around, and saw that Hell Squad was looking at him stunned, but he saw only disbelief on their eyes, not rage. Then he looked at General D. He looked so calm that Dager almost thought he already knew about it. Look at me. Tell me what happened. Making immense efforts not to look away, Dager looked at the Jedi. He was overridden by guilty, although he knew it wasn't his fault. Not entirely, at least. When we were captured, that woman, Ventress, she used the same things you use, General. The Force? Brain told me about her. She belongs to the oldest Jedi enemies. She is a Sith. She got very upset when we called her a Jedi. After she eliminated Barrow, with the red lightsaber, she used the Force to break into my mind. I wasn't able to resist the first time. The first time. There were more. She tried to get more information from me after that, but I did as you told us. 
protected my mind with. Walls. She wasn't able to enter them, so she resorted to physical torture. That I could deal with. What information did you give her? I, I don't know. I can't remember. But she mentioned Iktach, and the Iktachi there. And if I told her that, I don't know what else I did. Suddenly, General D's serious face broke into a small, almost unnoticeable smile. Don't worry, Dager. You did well by resisting her after the first time. Many would have lost their minds under this kind of mental bombardment. As for your so-called treason, well, you weren't in control of yourself. But. I might have given away everything. If you did, she wouldn't try again. You told her something, that is true, but you didn't betray the Republic. You helped us guard a great deal if classified information that otherwise would have fallen into separatist hands if they had captured any soldier but you. Seeing that the general didn't blame him, and that none of the others did, the guilty that Dejer was feeling disappeared, replaced by trust and determination. He wouldn't betray the Republic ever again, willing or not. But we know for a fact that Ventress now knows about the Force-sensitive being on Iktach. Admiral, our next stop will be there. As for you, Dejer, get back to your quarters. Your injuries are serious. Dejer was about to turn around when he remembered something. He quickly whispered something to Sel, who left the command bridge. Actually, General, there is something else I need to tell you about. Chapter 155 Actually, General, there is one more thing I would like to tell you about. The reason this all started. I believe Brain already told you Ventress was capturing clones to dig out a temple. She called it the Temple of Asherus. Temple of Asherus. I never heard of it. Do you know why Ventress was so interested in this temple? After we freed ourselves, I took a group with me, and entered the temple. We walked in an endless corridor for hours and hours, or so it seemed. After we left, Captain Narza told us that we had spent less than an hour inside. This time General D was truly shocked. Possibilities flashed by his mind. Control over time was an ancient Jedi art that not even Master Yoda had mastered. At some moment, whoever was messing with us created a path to the center of the temple. We could only follow it. Inside we found a red crystal. The crystal. Spoke with us. Tried to control us. Metal and tech were there too. The subcommander is right, General. We totally lost our minds. We could only think of grabbing the crystal. Only he escaped its control. There was admiration on Metal's voice when he spoke. If it wasn't for Dager, who knows what might have happened. When Timer touched the crystal he started floating and screaming. I had to break his wrist to release the crystal from his hand. And where is this crystal? Such a dangerous thing can't be left for anyone to take. Especially Ventress. We took it, General. Cell is grabbing it right now. And, General D. If you can't decide what to do with it, we really should destroy it. It's too dangerous. Cell chose this moment to enter the command bridge, holding a container. He gave it to Dager, who in turn gave it to General D. When the Jedi was about to open the container, Dager nervously searched for his DC-17, only to remember he had left it at his quarters. Power. Power. Take it. Take me. You will have power. Pow! The terrific voice appeared again, trying to take a hold of Dager's mind. He saw all the clones on the bridge stop, and stepped towards the crystal. Suddenly, General D closed the container strongly. His face was pale, and Dager saw a trace of fear. Ragu had the same look. Whatever they heard from the crystal was much more intense than what the clones did. M Master. This. So powerful. So. Dark. I don't know, Ragu, but you are right. It's too powerful for us. We have to give it to Master Yoda. General D looked to all the dazed clones on the command bridge. Only now were their eyes starting to gain focus again. He put the container holding the red crystal inside his robes. Is there anything else concerning this crystal, Dager? If it is, you need to tell us. It is very important. 
I don't think so, Jenner. Master D. All your troopers started acting weird. What is happening? A green-skinned person, with deep black and blue eyes entered the command bridge as if it was its home. Commander Keeley, one of the first clones to recover from the influence of the Red Crystal, rolled his eyes. The Rodian, Senator Anaconda Far, had been a constant source of trouble ever since they rescued him from the Separatist on Maijito. Commander Keeley had heard that Senator Farr was one of the calmest and most reasonable senators of all the Republic, but this had been proven wrong so far. First of all, he had been the only witness of his fellow senator, and traitor of the Republic, Bond Lee, killing Sergeant Rothax of the Galactic Marines, and blowing the bridge, which led to Dager's capture. Then, the senator started urging them to leave Majido and get back to Coruscant, even getting to the point of trying to overrule Commander Keeley's orders with his authority as a senator. Only General D's intervention made the Rodian stop. And now, he entered the command bridge yelling without any regards. Senator Farr was about to speak more when Dager turned around. Clone and Senator looked eyes, and the Rodian immediately turned around and tried to leave the command bridge. Dager struggled a little to remember where he had seen the Senator, then some bad memories came back to him. Instantly, he jumped and tried to grab Senator Farr's arm, but with only one eye, his depth perception was bad, and he missed. Arrest him. Instinctively, Brain and Dab grabbed the senator's arms, and pulled him back. What are you doing? I am a respected senator of the Republic. Release me. Release me now. This is treason, clone scum. The clones ignored him, and held him right in front of Dager. Only then did Commander Keeley and the others react. He is a senator. Brain, Dab, release him. The two clones might be members of Hell Squad, but ultimately, they still had to follow the orders given by Commander Keeley, even if it meant disobeying Dager. After a little hesitation, they dropped the senator to the ground, more violently than they should have after all, he called them, clone scum. Still, they positioned themselves behind Senator Farr, blocking his way out. Commander Keeley approached Dager until he was just centimeters away from his second in command. General D was watching by the side. His eyes weren't disapproving, but pensive. Ragu was at Senator Farr's side, talking with him. Explain yourself, trooper. Dager couldn't see through the visor of Commander Keeley's helmet, but it was obvious that he wasn't happy, and he had good reasons to be so. If what Dager did before wasn't considered treason, then this was. Dager gave a sideways glance at Senator Farr. Commander, this man was responsible for our capture on Majido. Nonsense. It was Bond Lee. I helped you guys arrest him. Dager ignored the screaming Rodian and turned to General D. He could see that although the Jedi didn't totally believe him, he also had his suspicions about Senator Farr. I saw him eliminate Rothax and two other Galactic Marines with my own eyes, then blow up the bridge, sir. That is stupid. I am a senator of the Republic. Why would I help Ventress capture clones? That is absolute nonsense. Dager wanted to explain more when Ragu ordered him to stay quiet. Unknowingly, Dager followed the order. Although young, the Padawan was many steps above him in the hierarchy. Senator Farr, how do you know about Ventress? The moment Ragu asked the question, every person on the command bridge went quiet. The fact that they had met a Sith on Majido wasn't a secret, since many clones saw her, but her name should only be known by a few officers. I, I heard the soldiers talking. Why are you asking me? This clone is the traitor. I am a senator. A senator. General D approached Senator Farr. The Rodian tried to back off, but Dab and Brain blocked his way. General D closed his eyes, and waved his hand in front of the senator. You are not Anaconda Far. Who are you? Chapter 156 You are not Anaconda Far. When General D said that, the senator, the imposter, actually, nervously shifted his feet. He fiddled with his hands, not knowing where to put them. The imposter looked behind him, only to see Brains and Dab's unhappy faces. W what do you mean? I I. I am Senator Farr, of course I am. 
I don't understand, Jedi Master. The moment he said that, Daedra noticed his hand reaching inside his clothes, and a dangerous glint flashing through his eyes. Commander Keeley obviously saw it too, because he yelled at Brain and Dab. Hold him. General D, however, was faster than any of the clones. The Nikto swung his lightsaber in a blur, and the K-7 Watchman pistol that the Radian had pulled out was cut in half, together with three of his fingers. The fingers were originally green and membranous, a characteristic of the Rodians. However, in midair, they became long and gray, and yellow blood oozed from them. The person impersonating Senator Far kneeled, holding his hand near his body. Dab grabbed his arm and twisted it around the back of the person, at the same time putting his knee against the person's neck, so every move he made caused intense pain. When the person tried to get up, Dab twisted the arm harder, and the imposter was unable to bear with it, and crouched with his face against the metal floor. General D switched off his lightsaber, and the lethal weapon turned into a harmless metal stick. Serious as always, the Jedi approached the imposter. He had now become a gray-skinned and skinny being. His face had burned scars, and he only had a few scattered clumps of hair. Atiri Umbatai Chilek. General D frowned when he heard the imposter speak. A Claudite. Speak the common language. Tyra Wheat. Kaitoi. Before the Claudite could finish, Dab pushed him to the floor. The general asked you to speak the common language. Stand down, trooper. He is a prisoner, but that doesn't mean you can treat him like that. The aura that General D released made Dab stagger backward, and let the imposter go. For a moment the clone looked at the Jedi, then acknowledged the order and let the Claudite get up. Dab was a quiet soldier, but that didn't mean he was unemotional. Being scolded by the general in front of the others, for something he considered unjust, since the Claudite clearly eliminated many clones, made his face heat up with shame, but he could do nothing. Not for the first time, Dajer wondered if the compassion the Jedi showed for everyone everything wouldn't be their doom. He, like many clones, respected the Jedi's almost more than anything, but had his doubts about their qualifications to lead armies in a war. What do you want, Jedi? For the first time, the Claudite spoke the common language, although his tone was disdainful. General D waved his hands in front of the imposter, in a gesture that Daedra now knew it used the force to control the mind of a person. However, what General D did was different than what Ventress did. The Claudite's eyes became misty, and lost focus, but he didn't appear to be mind-controlled as Dajer had been, neither showed signs of feeling pain. Like always, the Jedi had a gentle way of doing things. Who sent you? El Lord Dooku. Sent me. The clones had no reaction to the name, since, for them, Count Dooku was only the Separatist leader, and nothing more. However, General D and his Padawan exchanged glances. They knew that Count Dooku wasn't only a fallen Jedi, but had become a Sith Lord, and a powerful one on top of that. And there could be only one reason why he would send a shapeshifter to impersonate Anaconda Far. Why did he send you to my Jito? The Madam. Would give me a package. To get to my Lord. It was unnecessary to say that the Madam was Ventress, and the package must be the Red Crystal. During the few seconds that he saw the crystal, General D sensed its power. He could not let it get to Count Dooku's hands. Now, it was obvious that all that happened, from the three senators being captured, and then being released by the 303rd, and finally, to the Claudite blaming Senator Lee, was just a plan by the Separatist to get the Red Crystal. And General D had to admit it was an almost perfect plan. By blowing that bridge, the Claudite provided 200 workers to Ventress. And, if he really got its hands on the package, he would have the protection of an entire Republic fleet, all the way to Coruscant. From there, the imposter could go anywhere. Take him away. Two troopers grabbed the Claudite by his arms, and pulled him out of the command bridge. The imposter would be locked on a cell, where he would stay until they got to Coruscant, where he would be judged and sentenced to life in prison. General D also ordered that Senator Lee was released. He and the human senator had been coerced by the Claudite, and had been too afraid to expose him. Dajer, get your men ready. Now that your 3-4 is with us, Hell Squad should be complete, right? 
That's good. Ragu, prepare a corvette. Dager, get some rest. You won't be able to battle if you stay as you are now. Commander Keeley, you will stay with the fleet. Your orders are to stay near the Pyrelia system, and guard the trade routes, at least for now. All the clones acknowledged their orders without questioning, as they had been trained to. Ragu, however, didn't have such discipline. Where are we going, Master? Our path is still unclear. However, it stars on Iktach. Be patient, my young apprentice. What are we going to do on Iktach? The only thing there is the being Dager met. General D smiled with the gentleness he only showed to his Padawan. As I said, you have to be patient. A few hours later, one of the CR-90 corvettes that General D's fleet had separated itself from the fleet, and entered hyperspace. Aside from the pilots and the crew, the ship also carried Hell Squad, General D and his Padawan, and the Claudite. Their first stop would be Iktach, since Ventress had shown interest in the White Lizard that day Jermet. Then, they would go to Coruscant and transfer the prisoner to the Coruscant Guard, as they did with Aura Singh. They also had a secret, and much more important, objective, which was to deliver the Red Crystal to the Jedi Temple, where it would be safe from Count Dooku's hands. Inside the ship, Dager was sleeping soundly. 3-4 had given him painkillers for his eye and arm. Two days later, when they arrived in Iktach, his arm was almost healed, and his eye didn't hurt as much as before, which Dager interpreted as a good sign. Chapter 157 the corvette extended its landing gear, and landed on one of the many rocky plateaus of Iktach. The bottom compartment opened, and a ramp extended amidst the smoke that rose from the cooling engines. General D, Ragu and Hell Squad walked out of the ship. Commander Keeley stayed with the fleet, since it was unwise to leave the soldiers with no officer. Where is the Iktachi's house, Dager? Roughly that direction, General, but we won't be able to see it until we are very close. There is a rock wall in front of it. Well, we better hurry, because something is wrong. Ragu showed the direction where the Iktachi's hut was. A small but thick pillar of smoke was rising, although Dager didn't see it before because of the grey sky. The group quickly ran towards the smoke, but it still took them a few hours to finally see something. And it wasn't anything good. Separatist, General. And a bunch of them. When Cell returned from the scouting patrol, his expression was serious. He showed the group a large rock platform, from which they could see the source of the smoke. Below them, one C-9979 transport craft had its ramparts open, and droid after droid was entering it. Near the ship, the small hut where the Iktachi lived was no more, and only ashes were left behind. Dager lowered his macro binoculars, and looked at the platoons of droids outside the ship. They were only nine, and even though two were Jedis, there were hundreds of clankers. There are too much seppis even for you, General. And I don't think the Iktachi is still alive, otherwise they wouldn't be leaving. We have to at least look for him, Master. What if he was captured? Close your eyes, Ragu. Feel the Force. What do you feel? The young Tigruta closed his eyes. Slowly, a frown appeared in his face, and he spoke with his eyes still closed. I feel. Nothing, master. There is nothing. Exactly. The connection that the Iktachi had with the force was so strong that even Dager could feel it when he first came here. No offense, Dager, but you didn't have any kind of training, so that should have been impossible. Dager dismissed the apologies. He didn't understand the force, and he probably never would, so there was no reason to be angry about that. Besides, no clone could ever be like the Jedi's. It was impossible to clone something so rare as the ability to sense the Force, otherwise there wouldn't be just a few thousand Jedi's in a galaxy with millions of trillions of beings. B but. We can't just leave. What if he is not here? Oh or if Ventress captured him and is doing something to hide him. Or. Ventress has no need to hide him. She has no way of knowing we would come looking for the Iktachi. And they wouldn't be leaving if they hadn't found what they were looking for. Brain is right, my young Padawan. We are too late. No need to ask all those questions, youngling. 
I can tell you the lizard is dead. Ha ha ha. Suddenly, a voice that Deja knew too well intruded into their conversation. Without getting up, Deja and the rest of Hell Squad rolled to the sides and aimed their blasters at the owner of the voice. Ventress' pale face entered his sights, and he didn't hesitate to pull the trigger, nor did Hell Squad, with the exception of Metal. Who couldn't fire the DBRB double barrel repeating blaster because of the awkward position he was, with his back on the ground and his feet pointed towards Ventress? In the span of a few seconds, dozens of blue lasers were fired at Ventress, but her red lightsaber deflected them all, either hitting the ground nearby or flying away. General D and his Padawan were already up, both holding their lightsabers, one blue and one green, but none attacked. According to their experiences, attacking first wasn't necessarily the best in lightsaber combat, since the enemy could dodge quite easily. You must be Asajj Ventress. Calmly, General D ordered the troopers to hold their fire, just instants before Dajer did. If they kept shooting at Ventress, at some moment they would die to one of their own lasers. While the Jedi Master was talking, Ragu slowly circled around, to cut off her escape path, but she didn't seem phased by his actions. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Yumling. My troops are already on their way. Ragu hesitated, then stopped. They were only nine, and couldn't afford to start a battle, or they would pay a hefty price. Why would Ventress tell them that, when she could just stall them for long enough for her troops to arrive? Unless. General, she is afraid. She can't take both of you at the same time. He thought he had spoken quietly enough, but Ventress must have heard him, because she looked at Dajer, and her eyes flashed with a dangerous glint that confirmed his suspicions. Then she smiled at him, but her eyes were cold. My dear Dajer. I never expected to see you again so soon. I still have to apologize for what happened on that freezing planet. I'm so sorry for your eye. I was aiming for the neck. The words, spoken with a smile on her face, were enough to send chills down the spine of every clone present when they remembered how dangerous and cruel the woman in front of them was. Now, Master Jedi, I believe you have something that belongs to me. A red crystal, perhaps? I never thought I would be able to get it back. Ha! <laughs> you won't, Sith. The last word was almost spat out. It was obvious how much General D despised the owners of a red lightsaber. The smile didn't leave Ventress' face, but she put her hand inside her robes, and pulled out a second metal stick. She suddenly jumped, and at the same time activated both lightsabers, making a red cross, and brought it crashing down on General D. The Nikto calmly parried the attack, slightly tilting his lightsaber, so Ventress harmless slipped past his. At the same time, Ragu attacked her with a horizontal slash, aiming for her torso, but she blocked it with one of her lightsabers. The battle became faster and faster, until all Dajer could see were blurs of movement as both parties engaged in one of the most frenetic battles he had ever seen. Hell Squad couldn't find a chance to interfere, fearing that they might hit General D or Ragu, so they stayed aside awkwardly while the three force-wielding beings fought. Suddenly, after just half a minute of the battle, one of the three figures fighting was thrown back by a kick. Ragu rolled on the ground, and Dajer quickly helped him get up. Are you all right, General? The Padawan wanted to get back on the fray, but before he could, they saw General D give Ventress a leg sweep, and she fell. He brought his lightsaber down on her with a vertical strike, which she blocked by crossing one lightsaber on top of the other. It was clear, however, that she was losing the battle of attrition. She grunted, then suddenly turned off her lightsabers. General D was putting all his weight on his own weapon, and lost his balance when the red lightsabers disappeared. He staggered a step forward, and Ventress took the chance to push him away using the force. General D landed on his feet, but the Sith warrior had the chance to run. Doing a backflip, Ventress disappeared over the edge of the rock platform. Chapter 158 Dajer and Ragu looked over the ledge, and saw Ventress jumping down from one rock to another. The soldier aimed his DC-15A at her, but before he could fire, Dajer saw dozens of red lasers coming for him. He ducked, and barely escaped the onslaught of lasers. Clankers didn't have a good aim, but when hundreds of them fired at the same time, 
there was little a clone could do. And that was exactly what was happening right now. The droids that still had to enter the C-9979 lined up in front of Ventress, protecting her with their bodies. General D approached them, and pulled both the clone and his padawan back using the force. Dejer felt his body being dragged gently, which, compared to how Ventress used the force on him, was quite peculiar. The Jedi's robes were utterly battered, with many cuts, although the Nikto didn't look like he was hurt. We are going back to the ship. There is nothing we can do here. Ragu looked grudgingly at the droids below, and turned away. The group went back the way they came, but it would still take hours for them to get back to where the corvette landed. Shep, I am transmitting our location to you. Come pick us up. There should be a place where you can land about 10 kilometers from here. Shep was the pilot of the CR-90 corvette. When Deja was informed that Hell Squad would be the only ones to accompany General D, he tried to convince the Jedi to bring an ARC-170 escort, more specifically, Steel Battalion, the best pilots in the 303rd. The Jedi, however, said that they would attract too much attention, and denied Dager's request. As such, all Dager could do was bring Shep, who was the top pilot of large spacecraft. Yes, Subcommander. Ten kilometers were nothing for the two Jedis, and Hell Squad had the best physical training a soldier could have in less than an hour, they arrived at the rendezvous location, but the corvette was nowhere to be seen. Deja knew that they would have to wait at least another half an hour because of all the preparations necessary to take off. General, Shep should be here in forty minutes. Do we keep going or wait? General D stopped to ponder. If they kept running, the ship might not find a place good enough to land, and that could be their doom. But if they stopped here, it was almost certain that the droids would catch up to them. At last, the Jedi showed some boulders to Deja. We will wait here. Move these boulders, try to create a barricade of some sort. Enough for you to have some cover. The droids will most certainly attempt a frontal assault since they outnumber us. Hell Squad will have to hold them back until Shep arrives. Ragu and I will take care of Ventress. Dab, stay on overwatch. If a Seppai appears, shoot first, then warn us, understood. With pleasure, sir. Dab found a rock slightly bigger than the others, and rested his DC-15X on it, his eyes scanning the mountains and paths for any signs of droids. Meanwhile, the rest of Hell Squad started pulling over boulders to create a primitive wall. After twenty minutes, the six clones, with small help of the Jedis to move some bigger rocks, had created a barricade about one meter tall, a dozen meters long. It was small, but better than nothing, and they finished right on time. They heard the droids before they saw them, and Dager quickly ordered Hell Squad to take position behind the barricade. A few seconds later, the first shot from Dab's DC-15X echoed. To maximize the surprise, Dab had even fired one of his charged shots. The modifications that Dab made on his blasters were unusual, but usually came in handy, as they did now. Before the clankers even discovered they were being attacked, at least a dozen of them were blasted to pieces. Of course, a dozen in an army of hundreds wasn't much, but it was a good start. As one of the top units amongst the entire Republic army, Hell Squad's abilities were way better than 99% of the clones. The only ones that could compare to them were other special units, clone commandos, and ARC troopers. As such, none of the members of Hell Squad missed a shot when they fired the first volley. To get to the clones, the droids had to walk through a gorge, which limited their lines to about 20 to 25 clankers, shoulder to shoulder. The first shot from Dab had already depleted their vanguard, and Hell Squad took care of the remaining 12 before the second line could even understand what was going on. Each of the blue lasers found their mark either on the head or chest of the B-1 units. Such accuracy, considering that the droids were about 250 meters away, and that they weren't using sharpshooters blasters, but DC-15As and DC-15SS, was enough to earn Hell Squad's members the role of snipers on a legion. Back to the combat, the droids continued their inexorable attack on Hell Squad's position. About a hundred clankers had died, and the most Hell Squad suffered was a scratch on Brain's shoulder. As much as Dager would like to say it was all because of his squad's abilities, General D and his Padawan played a large part in it. 
at least half of the droid kills had been by their hands. However, now, they were too occupied to deal with the droids. The duo of Master and Apprentice were fighting Ventress once again, and the droids, instead of trying to intervene, opened space for them to fight. Probably, Dager thought between one laser and the other, because of Ventress' pride, she couldn't let her army help her. Still, she was fighting the two of them on equal grounds. When one of them attacked, she used one lightsaber to parry, and the other to counterattack. More than once, Ragu barely escaped the red lightsaber, and on one occasion, the lightsaber cut through his robes, not hitting him by millimeters. Suddenly, Ventress disengaged. Dager, who had been paying close attention to the fight, in case any of the generals needed help, switched his aim from one of the droids to Ventress. She was about to pounce on Ragu, who had his guard open, but then she sensed danger. Without looking, she deflected the blue laser, hitting an unlucky droid sergeant. However, she had stopped her movement, giving Ragu the chance to get his guard back up. Ventress threw a vicious stare at Dager, but all she received were two more lasers, which she dodged. Seeing the three force-wielding beings start battling against, Dager shifted his attention back to the approaching droids. Brain, prepare your detonators. His second-in-command pulled three thermal detonators from his belt, and threw them to Dager and 3-4. When the clankers approached a few more meters, they launched the detonators. And a sudden explosion engulfed the battle, destroying hundreds of droids. Chapter 159 A chain of explosions much bigger than what three grenades could do erupted on the battlefield. At the same time, a large shadow encompassed Hell Squad and the droids. When Dager looked up, he saw the CR-90 corvette that brought them to Iktach. The frontal turbolaser cannons on it were hardly of any help against other ships, but when the targets were helpless infantry, they were deadly. In a matter of seconds, about 300 droids were blown to pieces, and the remaining started peppering the corvette with red lasers. The lower rampart of the corvette was open, and a crew member was holding on it with one hand, and had a blaster on the other. Hurry up! Their tanks are coming. Move, move, move. Dager pushed his men towards the rampart. The corvette went down a little, enough for the clones to climb the rampart, although it wasn't touching the ground. Seeing that the clones were already getting inside the ship, General D said something to Ragu, and the Padawan nodded. Both of them pushed their open hands forward, and Ventress, who was about to hack with her red lightsabers again, was sent flying ten meters. The duo turned off their lightsabers, and somersaulted to the rampart. General D motioned upwards with his hands, and Brain was pulled inside the corvette. Seeing the last of his men get into the ship, Dager shouted for Shep to take off. While holding on to the columns of the ship, Dager felt his recently healed shoulder hurt once more, and grunted. If he kept entering in fights without giving it the proper time to heal completely, his shoulder would probably break again. However, it wasn't like he could choose to fight or not. Finally, the rampart closed, with the two Jedi's still deflecting lasers that found their way in. Dager felt the ship accelerate upwards, and almost fell, but at least now they were out of range from the AATs. Is everyone alright? Most of the clones answered his question with a nod, and only 3-4 gave a real answer, mainly because he was treating Brain's injury. Only Brain got hurt, sir. But he will only have a small scar, that's all. The grenadier and second-in-command chuckled. All of you are getting one, I didn't want to be excluded. But I doubt any of them will be as good as yours, sir. Hell Squad laughed. Only Brain would dare to joke with the subcommander of a Republic Legion this way. Hell Squad had gone through too much together to care about small things like that. And even if he didn't want to, Dager still let the joke slip without doing anything, because it helped ease the tension. Only one soldier had gotten hurt, but the truth was that they had nearly been wiped out. Had the battle lasted a few minutes more, casualties were bound to happen. Shep had arrived right on time. Dager looked over to his general, and saw the Nikto sitting on the ground, with his eyes closed. His lightsaber was floating before him, and slowly spinning. By the side, Ragu was on his feet, looking at nothing in particular. Is everything all right with General D? Unwilling to interrupt the Nikto's meditation, Dager approached the Tigruta. 
Ragu looked at Dajer, and slowly nodded. He appeared to be extremely tired, which was understandable, considering that Dajer's body was aching, and he didn't even fight with a lightsaber. You should grab some rest, General. Both of you. I will tell Shep to set course to Coruscant. Ragu once again nodded, and looked at Dajer gratefully. Thank you, Dajer. Hell Squad was spectacular on Iktach. Dajer said nothing, but inside he agreed with the Jedi. Hell Squad had fought better than he ever saw they do. Maybe it was training and experience, maybe it was because 3-4 was back, but anyway, they didn't let Dajer down. You all, go to sleep too. That's an order. Yes, Dab, you can take care of your blaster first. Before the sniper even asked, Dajer knew what he wanted. After every battle, the first thing Dab did was clean his DC-15X, especially if he used his overcharged shot, since it was quite a burden on the weapon. After all the clones went to their quarters, only Dajer was left in the lower hangar. He took off his helmet, and put it on the floor. Then he pulled the bandage that was covering his eye. Droplets of blood fell on the floor, and on his armor. During the battle, the wound had opened, and the inside of the bandage was soaked with blood. Thankfully, his eye hadn't suffered any other injury. After throwing the old bandage away, Dajer headed to the medical bay, where a medical droid applied another one, and gave him some painkillers. You should refrain from doing physical activities. But your eye is getting better. Dajer chuckled when he heard the droid's instructions. It would be really hard for him to refrain from doing physical activities, even if he wanted to. Since he didn't want the other clones knowing about his reopened wound, Dajer put on his helmet, and went to the cockpit of the ship. The clone trooper guarding it saluted him when he entered the room, and Dajer returned the greetings. When he entered the cockpit, the pilot, Shep, and his co-pilot, Spike, turned around. Thanks for the rescue, Shep. We were having some problems down there. Just doing my job, sir. Well, our next stop is Coruscant. Can't say I am happy to go back there. I lost some friends to that mad scientist there. But they captured him, at least. He was doing some experiments on Naboo, I think. He will spend his life in prison, like the scum he is. He was lucky it wasn't us who captured him. I can't guarantee he would be intact. Ha ha ha. I know what you mean, Spike. But Coruscant it is. And then back to the fight. Back to the fight. Back to the fight. Three days later, Dajer was playing Dejeric with Ragu. He won against the Padawan most of the time, since he had been trained to command. But the Padawan learned fast. A few more rounds and Dajer's winning streak would come to an end. So, General, what do you think General D will do with the crystal? It will probably go to the Jedi Temple's archive or storage. Why? I can't help but remember that this thing was responsible for so many deaths. If I were you, I would destroy it. It is too powerful. It's an object of the Force, Dajer. It's who uses it, and how it is used that decides what it does. I don't know about that. That thing was all alone on my Jito, and almost eliminated Timer. I don't. Suddenly, the whole ship swayed to one side, throwing Dajer off his balance. A few seconds later, the same thing happened, but now at the other end of the ship. Shep. What the hell is going on? Asteroid field? I don't know, sir. It's not asteroids. I just lost control of the ship. It's like something is. Nudging it. As if to ensure that the pilot was right, the corvette shook once more. Dajer looked at Ragu, and put on his helmet. Chapter 160 Sir, I. You should see that. Shep's voice came through the speakers, and Ragu ran towards the cockpit, followed closely by Dajer. They didn't need Shep to tell them what it was when they arrived. Instead of the normal space vacuum, all they could see through the windows was a red, big, and moving, mass. Whatever it was, it was big enough to curl around the entire ship. It was also leaving some kind of secretion where it passed, and blocking the scanners. What is the problem, Dajer? Oh. I see. 
General D entered the cockpit, which started to get quite crowded, and instantly saw the thing outside. Do you know what that is, Master? Unfortunately, yes. A crimson slug. They coil around ships and squash them until they break. After which they will eat everything and everyone. As if to prove he was right, alarms suddenly started going off, dyeing the ship with red. Lights started flashing on the control panel, and Shep looked at them worried. Section 12 is being crushed, General. If this thing doesn't stop, the ship will split in half. The turrets are destroyed. What do we do? Solemnly, General D motioned for Dager and Ragu to follow him. We have to scare it away. General D put on a helmet shaped like a bubble, with two tubes on the back connecting to a small tank. Ragu did the same. The subcommander looked at the Jedis and asked the same question for the fifth time. Are you sure about this, General? It's our only option, Dager. Or the ship is gone, and we with it. Dager looked at Hell Squad, and shrugged. Since the Jedi already set his mind on it, there was nothing he could do to stop him. So, it was better to go along and ensure that their plan was a success. Dager verified that his helmet was safely locked on, and told Hell Squad to do the same. The Phase 2 helmets could be used in space for a short amount of time, although not for what General D wanted. The survival capability of the helmet was so rescue ships could find soldiers lost in space after a battle. Dager bet the armor's designers never thought someone would purposely go out in the vacuum with it. Still, they were doing it. Dager closed the door of the isolation chamber, and pressed a button on the wall. The wall opened, and the loss of pressure pulled them, but all the clones had tied themselves to the ship. The Jedis simply attached themselves to the ship using the Force. Out. General D's voice was muffled because of the mask, but his command tone was clear. Hell Squad left the ship, and for a few moments floated in space. Then they pushed a button in the cable tying them, and were pulled to the ship. Magnetic locks on. When his feet touched the outside of the ship, Dager turned on the magnetic locks on his boots. They gave off a light blue glimmer, and Dager felt his feet safely glued to the ship. He took a first tentatively step. It was weird at first, because he could feel the lack of gravity trying to make him float. They were on the side of the ship, but it was too dark to see anything clearly. Still, Dager thought he saw something moving. When they walked a few more steps, trying to get to the top of the ship, he knew he was right. A giant worm, at least 100 meters long, was coiling its body around the corvette. The metal plates that made the exterior of the ship were bending under the pressure that the crimson slug applied. He aimed his blaster at the creature, but he doubted it would do any damage to it. General, how? How do we fight this thing? We aren't trying to fight it, Dager. It is just looking for food. If we show it isn't worthy, it will leave there is no need to eliminate a being who just wants to survive. Once again, the Jedi philosophy of not killing unless necessary could cause problems. And, in Dager's opinion, killing the Crimson Slug was entirely necessary. Ragu, let's try to send it away. Yes, Master. The Jedis approached the moving mass that was the Crimson Slug, and stopped about ten meters away from it. Dager warned Hell Squad. Stay ready, boys. I don't think this thing will go away quietly. Is there anything we can do if it doesn't? Shut up, Cell. Without touching their lightsabers, General D and Ragu touched the sides of the Crimson Slug. The creature was so big that it didn't even notice. Ten seconds passed, when nothing happened. Then, suddenly, the slug started shaking. Its tail twitched uncontrollably, and missed Hell Squad by mere meters. Dager was about to open fire, even though he knew it was pointless, when General D stopped him. Hold your fire. It is confused. It doesn't want to hurt us. Ragu's words weren't enough to convince Dager, but orders were orders. He closed his fist above his head, a clear signal for the clones to stop. With the corner of his eyes, he saw Cell tense up and then relax and mumble something. I'm not sure about that. Shut up, Cell. Dager felt the ship rock under his feet, and, consequently, 
he also swayed from one side to another. The crimson slug grew increasingly relentless, and Dager gripped his blaster nervously. He could face an army of droids unfazed, but fighting a giant worm, on the vacuum of space, was a little too much. Pushed together, Ragu. Dager barely heard General D, but he saw their faces frown in concentration, and the crimson slug stifled. The corvette shook once more when the huge body impacted down. The crimson slug's tail twitched a few times, and then the huge body unfurled, and the ship sunk under its weight. Minutes tickled by when everyone stood quiet, uncertain of what to do. Then, the crimson slug slid down the sides of the ship. Chapter 161 Just when Dager thought the crimson slug was dead, the creature came back to live, and floated near the ship. Now that it wasn't grabbing onto the corvette, it looked much more menacing, and it was blocking the little bit of light that a nearby star provided. For the hundredth time in a few minutes, Dager clenched his blaster tightly, and waited to see what the creature would do. The reaction that the crimson slug had surprised him. Instead of becoming angry or fleeing, the crimson slug bowed. In a motion that seemed impossible, the creature dropped its horrendous head, and flicked its tail. No matter how impossible it seemed, what the crimson slug did could only be described as bowing. Hell Squad stood dumbstruck, looking at the space creature. They couldn't believe their eyes. And then, Regu jumped lightly, and floated towards the crimson slug. The Padawan floated for a few moments in the vacuum, and approached the crimson slug. When he stopped, the creature got closer to him on its own volition. Dager looked at General D, but the Jedi made no mention to stop it, so Dager ordered Hell Squad to stay put. Slowly, Regu touched the gross head of the crimson slug. The sharp teeth of the creature appeared between the lips, enforcing how dangerously close Regu was. But the crimson slug didn't move more than it already had. After an eternity, the crimson slug retracted its head, and turned around. In a few minutes, the creature was far away, and Dager soon lost sight of it against the black background. General D stretched his arm, and pulled Ragu back using the force. The Padawan floated to the ship, and landed next to Dager. The clone couldn't help but look at him. You Jedis really are. Impressive. Ha ha ha. Do you mean weird, Dager? I actually meant mad, General. Totally mad. Ha 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 ha. Dager and Ragu joked around, but the clone was actually extremely impressed. The Padawan had handled himself much better than the clones had, and, in the end, he even talked to the Crimson Slug. What Dager didn't know was that Ragu was very scared. He might be a Jedi in training, however, nothing prepared someone to face a hundred meters long space worm. Still, after he and his master used the Force to influence it, he felt that the creature was just hungry, and nothing more. There was no need to eliminate, or even hurt it. Moreover, after it released the corvette, the crimson slug bowed. It might have been because it felt that Ragu and General D didn't want to hurt it, or it might have been because it was still under the influence of the force. Anyway, Ragu felt it was just right to return the respect the crimson slug gave them. Only when they were returning to inside the ship did Deja realize that they were, well, in space. He knew it before, of course, but he was so worried about the crimson slug that he kind of ignored it. Now, walking on top of the ship, he was appreciating it, and he saw that Hell Squad and Ragu also were. It was weird. He felt he had never really enjoyed anything aside from being with his brothers. In fact, most of his life had either been filled with training or battles. Of course, they weren't on a trip, so they soon got back inside. After confirming with Shep that the Crimson Slug didn't damage any important components of the Corvette, they set off again. For some parts of the journey, like the one they were now, they couldn't go into hyperspace because of obstacles like asteroids fields and nebulas. Hyperspace didn't mean that one was going through everything, but that one was cutting through the lanes of space, shortening the distance. Everything on the real space had its shadow on hyperspace, meaning that a careless pilot could crash into something and potentially erase their ship from existence. An inconspicuous CR-90 Corvette came out of hyperspace on top of Coruscant. It was quite damaged, with a few missing plates. 
but this wasn't a new sight on Coruscant. Broken and tattered ships were common on the galaxy as a whole thanks to the war. Usually they didn't go to Coruscant, but for one of the satellite planets, but sometimes they stopped at Coruscant to drop someone off or complete a mission. And that was exactly what was happening. The corvette landed on one of the peripheral districts of Coruscant, and two Jedis got out, together with seven clones. While one of the Jedis, a youngling, was calling a transport, one of the clones, who had an almost entirely brown armor, except for his belly and pieces of the arms, was talking to a clone in a pilot's attire. Shep, do a report on the damages, and repair time of the ship. If it isn't possible to fix it in about a week, contact me. Yes, sub-commander. I was wondering if I could let the crew have some fun, go to the Revanter. I know they aren't on leave, but there is nothing they can do here, so they would just be bored all day long. I will stay with the ship, of course. Dager looked at Shep, and thought for a bit. The pilot was right. Since Coruscant was the heart of the Republic, the chances of it being attacked weren't that big, and a couple dozen men wouldn't make a difference if it was. Also, Shep had volunteered to look after the ship. If he had asked to go together with his men, Dager probably wouldn't permit it, but the pilot knew his duty. They can have three days off, then I want them back. You can't, Shep, you know why. Thanks, sir. That is the price we pay to be in command. Tell me about it. Ha ha ha. The clones joked around for a bit before the ship took off again, this time to one of the repair ports of Coruscant. Usually, merchant ships would use them, but now that the Clone Wars was at its maximum, the ports had been seized to help in the war's effort. After watching the corvette take off, Ragu called the sub-commander. Sometimes, the Padawan thought, Dajer forgot where he was, or what he was doing, and just stood still, thinking. Very unusual for a clone, but Ragu liked it. As usual, after they entered the transport, Hell Squad formed lines next to the two Jedis. Even though they were in Coruscant, old habits still prevailed. Besides, Dajer didn't have that good of an impression of Coruscant. Dajer, there is no need to do this. You can stand down. Ragu shook his head when he saw Hell Squad behaving like they were on a battlefield. Sometimes Dajer was too strict. Under his helmet, Dajer smiled when he heard the Padawan. I know, General. However, he didn't move. Ragu was about to speak again, but in the end he gave up, and returned to General D's side. A few minutes later, the transport arrived at a big construction in the middle of the planet. It towered over the nearby buildings, a massive edifice with five towers. Despite its importance, only a few dozen people could be seen around the entrance, most of them wearing brown robes. A few hundred clones using the red colors of the Coruscant Guard patrolled the entire perimeter. General D walked towards the building, and stopped Dager before they entered the defensive perimeter set by the Coruscant Guard. Gentlemen, welcome to the Jedi Temple. Chapter 162 Gentlemen, welcome to the Jedi Temple. Under the amazed gazes of Hell Squad, General D smiled and showed them the huge building. They had never seen so many Jedis in one place. Unfortunately, you cannot enter. Only Jedis and apprentices can go inside. It was a pity, because Dajer would be lying if he said he wasn't curious about the insides of the temple. However, he already expected it, so he wasn't too disappointed. I will contact you when we need to go. In the meantime, Hell Squad should stay at the barracks. Dajer, Commander Fox wanted to talk with you, so you should look for him. General D and Ragu nodded to Hell Squad, and left for the Jedi Temple. When the Coruscant guard members near the entrance saw them, they let the Jedis in. Dajer watched them, and, after they were inside the Jedi Temple, turned around. The transport was still there, waiting for them, so Hell Squad boarded it, and went to the barracks. Master Yoda. Master D and a youngling I see. In the battlefield I thought you were. A small, green being talked to General D and Ragu. He had white hair, and wrinkled features. Almost his entire weight was on the small wooden cane he held. Anyone who saw him could only think of the words old and harmless. The Jedis, however, knew better. 
The Green Midget was the most powerful Jedi on the Jedi Order, and the current leader of the Jedi Council. No one knew for how long Master Yoda had lived, but it was a fact that he was much more experienced and powerful than any other Jedi. Out of respect, Regu didn't say anything aside from greeting Master Yoda, and let his master, a senior Jedi, speak. General D told the entire story again, of how his troops were captured, escaped, found the red crystal and so on. General D pulled the box out of his robes, and opened it slightly. The red glow and the voice showed themselves once more, and all the Jedis around them stopped and looked at it. Contrary to how the clones behaved, no Jedi became entranced by it, but frowned when they felt its attraction. A kyber crystal that is. Why Ventress and Dooku after it were, no we don't. Well you did in bringing it here. Store it away we shall. Ragu, you are free for now. The Padawan bade his farewells to the two Jedis, and went to meet the other Padawans. He was after all a kid, and was very excited to tell everything he had done with the 303rd to the other Padawans. Follow me you must, Master D. Discuss this matter with the council we have to. Hell Squad got out of the transport in front of the barracks, except for Dager, who went to the Coruscant Guard headquarters, to talk with Commander Fox. The commander was in a room, donned in his red armor, looking over some files. Dejer could see many faces, some saying, bounty hunters, and others saying, fugitives. Paperwork, commander. This is a hundred times worse than going after some bandit. Dejer knew what Commander Fox was talking about. Being a sub-commander also had its disadvantages, which included hours sitting on a desk looking over files of casualties, wounded, supplies and so on. You need to talk to me. Yes, Dager. Do you remember Aura Singh? Dager obviously did. The bounty hunter was a dangerous woman, and had caused a lot of trouble before being captured. For all Dager knew, she was still in a prison somewhere in Coruscant. She escaped. Eliminated four of my men when she did it. Dager knew where this was going, and he didn't like it. Singh had eliminated Barrow's entire squad the last time they met her. And both her looks and the way she behaved remembered him of Ventress, who he liked even less. How did it happen? During a transfer. Two other bounty hunters helped her. Commander Fox turned his datapad to Dager. On it were two pictures, and some information about the bounty hunters. The first one was an ugly Cladoinian with beige skin, with bloated eyebrows, and various missing teeth. The file identified him as Castas, a bounty hunter who had worked with Singh more than once, although he had a reputation of being a coward. The other bounty hunter was named Bosk, a Trandashan. Trandashans were a reptilian species, known to be great bounty hunters thanks to their natural abilities as the apex predators of their home planet, Transdosha. Even though they were an intelligent species, the Trandashans kept their barbaric habits of hunting other intelligent beings. The Trandashan in question, Bosk, had green skin, and the file also stated that his weapon of choice was a Relby V-10 mortar gun, an outdated and difficult to work with weapon. However, Bosk was also very capable with his hands, and could eliminate Wookiee warriors with his bare hands. Of the two, Dager instantly concentrated on Bosk. He could feel that the Trandashan was dangerous, and he had worked with Singh many times. However, he didn't underestimate Castas. It was impossible for a bounty hunter to work with Singh if he wasn't good. You want me to go after her, Commander? If so, I don't think I can. Soon Hell Squad will have to return to the fight. I know, Dager. The investigation after Singh is on Sergeant Hound's hands. However, when I heard you would come to Coruscant bringing that Claudite, I thought you might be interested. You were the first to ever capture Singh, after all. Hell Squad had dropped the shapeshifter at the prison first thing when they arrived in Coruscant. The wardens were very pleased to receive a clone killer. Dejo could tell the Claudite wouldn't have an easy time in the prison, but, well, he deserved it. Hound. Isn't he the one who made friends with a massive? Grizzer. Hound is now in command of a unit specialized in using massifs to track down fugitives. Dejo thought for a bit. Commander Fox wasn't giving him an order, but he had some personal interests in capturing Aura Singh again. 
and he would be on Coruscant for about a week anyway. If he could help the Coruscant guard, he was ready to do it. I have to ask General D for permission first. It is not like we are on leave. I understand. And, Dager. Yes, Commander. If you can, drop by the Revanter. There are few commanders here on Coruscant. It would be good to hear the news from the 303rd. Of course, Commander Fox. See you soon. As Dager had expected, General D had no complaints about him joining the hunt for Singh. He only reinforced that when it was time, Hell Squad would have to leave, had him found Singh or not. That same night, Dager went to the Revanter, following Commander Fox's advice. The commander also said that Hound would be there so he could fill Dager in the details of the pursuit. Chapter 163 As soon as he entered the Revanter, Dager saw many familiar faces. He recognized soldiers from the 327th Star Corps, from the Coruscant Guard, and also saw men from Shep's crew. There were also some soldiers using the gray of the 104th Battalion, under Commander Wolf and Jedi Master P.L.O. Kuhn, and some using the purple of the 187th Legion, under Jedi Master Mace Windu. When he entered the Revanter, Dager instantly became the focus of attention, because he was using his entire set of armor, from helmet to boot, and carrying his blaster. The barman, a Bothan, wanted to warn him that blasters were prohibited inside the bar, but Dager ignored him, and went straight to the second floor, where the private rooms were. He knocked on one of the doors, and entered the room. Three clones were waiting for him inside it, and, just like him, all of them had their armors and weapons. The first clone, sitting near the entrance, was a familiar face, or helmet. Fire, of the Coruscant Guard, looked more serious this time, but still rose to greet Dager. The second clone was one Dager had never seen. He had red armor, characteristic of the Coruscant Guard, but much thicker. His chest and shoulder pads were of a darker shade of red, and his entire armor had many blaster marks, showing that he had been in many battles. His helmet also had protection above the eyes, and the side filters were much bigger than normal. With just a glance Dager recognized him as a shock trooper, the elites of the Republic responsible to escort important figures on diplomatic missions. Dager, this is Commander Thorne, of the Coruscant Guard. Commander, this is Subcommander Dager of the 303rd Attack Legion. Commander. Dager knew that the Coruscant Guard had more than one commander. Commander Fox was responsible for what took place in Coruscant, and Commander Thorne was the superior in charge of the security of senators and ambassadors. And this is Sergeant Hound, also from the Coruscant Guard. Fire showed Dager the last clone. This one, contrary to Commander Thorne, had lighter armor, painted in red and black. He was an ARF trooper, specialized in stealth and survival. Like Cell, ARF troopers acted as scouts, but were much more trained. Only a few clones, from special units, could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. ARF troopers were also more intelligent and independent than normal clones, because their job required them to make decisions all the time, but Dager didn't know about that. For him, all clones were equal. The only difference they had was in training and experience. But Dager didn't need introductions to know that that clone was Hound, because the sergeant had a massif next to him. The small reptile species had spikes on its back, and a mouth full of sharp teeth. It was massive, a species that could be found in many planets, and excelled at tracking down fugitives. They were also trained to bite down on arms or legs, to stop bandits from running away. This specific massif was two times bigger than the regular ones. He was Grizzer, a massif that Hound had saved during a mission on Corellia. Sergeant. Subcommander, Sir. Hound's helmet was stylized in a way that made it look like it had dark fangs above and under the visor. Dejo could imagine that when he was in the dark, the paint would blend in with the ambient, and possibly even make Hound look like, well, a massif. Dejo was of higher ranking than Hound, so the clone stood up and saluted him. Dager waved him down, and the clone sat back. Grizzer, the massif, walked over to Dager, and smelled him. Dager stood there, quite unsure of what to do. Grizzer, back. Sit. The massif sat on the ground, near Hound. For a moment Dager thought about patting it, 
but then he gave up. He had heard that the Massifs were very aggressive with anyone other than their pack or trainer. Sergeant, I've heard of your unit before. Commander Fox contacted me because I have a personal interest in capturing Singh. She eliminated an entire squad of my men. However, the one to conduct the pursuit will be you. I understand, sir. Hound then pulled a hologram projector, and turned it on. The clones got closer to see the image, which was split into two. One of them showed a map, and the other was Singh, with some information about her. Aura Singh, female Paladuvan, deadly assassin and bounty hunter. Until that, nothing new. But the next line made Dager frown. Seven confirmed Jedi assassinations, suspected of having participated in nine others. That is quite the record for a bounty hunter. Why isn't any Jedi on the case? You would expect them to be more concerned about her. I asked the same, Dager. According to General Oppo Rancisis, they have a Jedi after her, but she prefers to work alone. Let's get back to the matter at hand. Dager, you fought Singh before. What can you say about her? Commander Thorne showed the limited file that the four clones had on Singh. It was clear that he wanted more information before going after her. Unfortunately, there was nothing much that Dager could say to him. She is efficient and cruel. When we captured her, she tried to escape at least two times, and almost eliminated me during one of the attempts. She won't hesitate to eliminate, neither will she feel pity for her companions. As I said, she is efficient. The fastest way to eliminate is the best way for her. Now, based on how she attacks our ship to capture the Padawan, I believe she prefers to lurk in the shadows. Also, I think she might specialize in long-range attacks, but this is just speculation. You think she is a sharpshooter? Because of how she eliminated my men. She either broke their necks or cut it. This is how our snipers deal with clankers in close combat. Other troops tend to just destroy them. Singh did a clean job. And then, on Tatooine, she used cables to pull us. Also, her blaster had a scope. Fire pointed at the second image, the map, tight after Dager finished his explanation. It makes sense. This is the sector we think she escapes to. It is a docking zone. Many high and hidden spots, but also many open areas. It's the optimal location for a sniper. What Thayer said hit the clones after a few seconds. Commander Thorne looked at Dager, and knew that the 303 RD's clone was thinking the same. She chose the battlefield. She knows we are coming. But what is her plan? She can't possibly think she can take on the entire Coruscant Guard. Singh doesn't have to. Besides, she is not alone. Both Bosk and Castas are efficient killers. When a battle starts, what do civilians do? They run and hide. They panic. They will try to leave the area. We can't force them to stay. Some will take ships and leave she might use one of them, or she might flee to another sector. Even if we know that, we can't stop her. Fire slammed the table when he heard Dager and Commander Thorn. He was more hot-headed than most clones. There is nothing we can do, then. She is going to escape. Many battles taught him that he couldn't give up at the first problem. Let's hope we can capture her before she has the chance. Chapter 164 It took two days to get all the clones who would partake on the operation ready. In total, 64 clones were chosen, including Dager, Thyre, Hound and Commander Thorn. Commander Thorn had argued at first, saying that using so many men would scare Singh, but Dager countered by saying that no matter how many soldiers they took, Singh would face them. Because if she doesn't, we will find her. She needs a distraction, and she needs us to create it. Dager looked at the stern faces around the hologram projector. All those who were sergeants or above were in the meeting. None of the clones in the room were rookies, and they understood exactly what Dager meant. Nobody said anything, but they knew they were destined to suffer casualties, and not just a few. But that was the reality of war, and this small chase after Aura Singh was, after all, a consequence of the Clone Wars. Whilst Dager was explaining their plan, with small interventions from Hound, who would lead the main force, 
from time to time, Commander Thorne thought that the subcommander would make a good commander one day. It was never really night on Coruscant. The lights of the city, or rather, of the planet, made the night looks like day. It was, however, night time when the clones set off to the docking zone. They decided for that time because of no other reason than the fact that there would be fewer civilians around. Sergeant Hound. You will take your unit and search the east docking area. Split as you seem fit, but make sure that each man is always within the line of sight of another. Commander Thorne was giving the last instructions to the soldiers. In fact, he was just repeating what was said in the meeting, to ensure the clones knew their orders. The tactic they were using was an unusual one, but very efficient when searching for someone. By staying in the line of sight of each other, soldiers couldn't be ambushed, at least not easily. Besides, Hound was in command of the massive unit, so even though he only had eleven troopers with him, Commander Thorne wasn't too worried. I will take the rest and search the west area. We will split into two groups, but stay close. Understood. Several clones voiced their agreement, and made the last-minute checks they always did before a battle. Weapons were loaded, and armors were adjusted. Commander Thorne looked through the nearby clones until he saw the two soldiers he was looking for. Fire, Dager, you see that control tower? Go there and take sniping positions. You will be able to overlook much of the docking zone. If you see anything unusual, warn us. I don't want as much as a womp rat slipping past us. Commander Thorne looked at the men around him, and found sixty clone helmets, their T-shaped visors facing him. Let's move, boys. I didn't know you were trained as a sniper, sir. The clones had already split up, each group going in its own direction. Dajer had been keeping an eye on his comlink, to make sure he was warned at the first sign of Sing, but Thyre's words caught his attention. He and the lieutenant were going to the control tower, to provide overwatch. Dajer grinned. I wasn't. For a few moments Thyre stayed silent, unsure of what to say or do. He didn't expect that answer. But I trained on it later on. Being on a special unit means you can't be hood at just one thing. You have to be good at everything. It doesn't matter if it is me or Metal, our heavy gunner, or anyone else. Each of us can take a DC-15X and work with it. Dab, our sharpshooter, can also use a Z-6 rotary better than most troopers. Of course, I will never be as good as him with a sniper rifle, but we each have our own strengths. Soldiers might like to exaggerate their stories, to make them look more brave and strong, but clones only did that when they were out of battle. Fire knew that a brother of his would never do that in the situation they were right now, because that could cause their deaths. As such, when he heard Dager speak with such confidence, Thyre knew that the subcommander wasn't lying when he said he could use a sniper rifle. The two clones took the lift to the top of the tower, their weapons ready. Thyre was using the standard DC-15X, but Dager had chosen a sniper rifle more of his liking. Differently from the DC-15X, his blaster looked much more simple and solid, with one big scope. It was called NT-242, an unusual choice because of its weight, but Dager had used all the weapons the Republic had on its armory, and he had on preferred for each type. The door of the lift opened, and several workers looked surprised at the two clones. Dager patted the closest one on the back. Everyone, I need to ask you to leave this building, and the docking zone. Be careful and don't run. More soldiers of the Republic will be waiting for you at the exit. Follow their instructions. Muffled sounds of complaints could be heard, something about interrupting their operations, but Dager ignored them. When he saw that the workers were still reluctant to leave, Dager urged them by saying that they could be arrested for disrupting the order. This time the workers got scared, and packed the lift full. Dager motioned to Thyre, and the clones advanced with caution. The control tower was a good vantage point, although a bit obvious, so they doubted Singh would be there. Still, being careful did no harm. However, there was no sign of Singh or one of her companions. Dager and Fire set their sniper rifle sin position on the catwalk outside, about twenty meters away from each other. While Dager scanned the docking zone with his macro binoculars, Fire contacted Commander Thorne. 
we are in position, Commander. Danger, keep a close watch on us. By now Singh must know we are here. Whatever she is planning on doing, she will do in a moment. As if Singh heard them talking, a sniper shot rang out in the night. There was a moment of silence after it, and then the civilians started running and screaming. Commander Thorne's men were already in position to block anyone who looked like Singh and the other bounty hunters. Fire, did you see where it came from? The lieutenant gave a short answer, his eyes nervously scanning the containers and buildings, looking for Singh. They knew it was her, because only she would use a sniper rifle. Over the comlink, Dager heard Commander Thorne and Sergeant Hound bark orders, and he vaguely heard that one clone had died. Two more sniper shots could be heard, one missing and the other killing a second clone. But this time Dager saw from where it came from. Chapter 165 About 400 meters away from the control tower, a group of containers was stacked upon one another in a say that seemed to be no space between them. However, there was a small opening, just enough for a slim person to squeeze through. Singh reload her weapon, which was way more unusual than Dager's. It was a slim and long sniper rifle called Adventurer Slug Thrower Rifle. Its name was weird, but how it worked was even more. In an era where space battles, droid armies, highly concentrated energy beams and people with mental powers were common, this rifle still used projectiles. Why Singh used it, or how she got her hands on it, no one knew. But she was deadly effective with it. Of the three shots she fired so far, only one missed, because the clone moved exactly when she fired. She aimed the fourth shot, a clone helmet in her scope, when her heightened senses warned her of something. She ducked back, just in time to dodge two blue energy bolts. Without showing herself, she followed the laser's path, and saw two clones on the railway of the control tower. A cold smile crept its way to her face. They found me, boys. Let's begin this show. Kakaka. Hound was gripping his DC-15S, and walking carefully. He could hear sniper shots at the other side of the docking zone, and he knew that at least three men had already died, and another was injured. Now, he and the eleven soldiers of the massive unit were rushing to the west side to aid their brothers. Gur. Hound immediately stopped when he heard Grizzer growl. The massive had saved his life more than once, and he learned to trust the animal. He gave a discreet signal to his men, and they slowed down without stopping. What is it, boy? Where? Grizzer sniffed the ground, and when they arrived at a junction, turned left. There were sounds of fighting, and a man screamed. Hound quickly followed the massive, and found it biting hard on the arm of a Nikto. When he saw the clone, the bounty hunter tried to fire its pistol, but Hound was faster. Looking at the corpse, Hound quickly scanned its face to see if he recognized him, but it wasn't on the list that Commander Thorne gave him. Back, Grizzer. Good job. Commander, Singh and the other two aren't the only ones here. I just eliminated another bounty hunter. Damn it. We already know where Singh is. We are getting to her, so. No. -oh. A scream interrupted Commander Thorne. Hound knew the voice. It was one of his men. Commander Thorne dodged under a leg swipe made by a female to Grota bounty hunter. At the same time, he used his own leg to bring her to the ground. One of his men used the butt of his DC-15A to knock her out, then helped the commander get up. This is the third one, commander. Tie her up, and keep moving. All of those are just a distraction orchestrated by Singh. We have to move while Fire and Dager have her pinned down. After a few rounds of attacks, it became clear that Singh hadn't just hidden on the docking zone, but prepared a deadly ambush. He received reports of at least five bounty hunters, none of which were Singh, Castas, or Bosk. Clearly, Singh had asked, or rather, hired, for help. Because of the frequent attacks, he had lost more than ten soldiers between dead and wounded. SHSHSHSHSHSHSHSH. What do we have here? The voice that suddenly appeared sent chills down his spine. Commander Thorne turned around and saw a Trandashan looking at him maliciously while licking his reptilian lips. The clones instantly shot him. 
Deja could see battles happening all over the docking zone as the clones were ambushed by bounty hunters. Sergeant Hound reported to be facing Castas, and had already suffered losses. Meanwhile, Deja and Thyre were pinning Singh down, but she somehow always managed to dodge their lasers, and, at the same time, shoot at one of the clones below. Just when Deja was reloading, he felt a tingling sensation. His sixth sense, honed over hundreds of battles, warned him that he was in mortal danger. He rolled sideways, but the attacker still managed to draw a bloody line on his left side, making him grimace in pain. Deja, however, ignored the pain, and turned around to see an akiaki, a species that looked like a dried fruit with long fangs. The bounty hunter was holding the same vibroblade that almost eliminated Deja. What the? Fire heard the commotion and got up, but before he could help Deja, a shadow threw itself over him, and punched him hard. Still, the clone fought valiantly. The IG-88 assassin droid that tried to eliminate Thyre had its blaster knocked away when the lieutenant used its own weapon to bash the droid. Deja couldn't pay more attention to their fight because the Akiaki pulled out a blaster pistol, making Deja dive out of the way when he fired. Deja caught the bounty hunter by surprise when he, instead of jumping away, jumped closer to the Akiaki, grabbing his legs and making him fall. The subcommander tried to grab his own pistol, the DC-17 but the Akiaki punched him using the butt of his own blaster. The pistol slipped out of Deja's grasp, and fell through the catwalk and on the ground below. So, Deja grabbed his enemy's pistol, and elbowed his arm, making him release it. And then he felt a sharp pain in his leg when he was stabbed again. Both combatants released each other, and watched one another carefully. The Akiaki only had his vibroblade, but Deja had no weapon. He vaguely heard Thyre yell, and saw, with the corner of his eyes, the IG-88 jump upon the clone, only to receive the latter's feet on its metallic chest, and be projected over the catwalk. At the same time the droid crashed onto the ground, the other bounty hunter attacked Deja. He made a simple stabbing motion, direct at Deja's chest, knowing that the clone could barely walk. But Deja was prepared. When the Akiaki jumped over him, Deja turned sideways, and the bounty hunter's vibroblade cut the air millimeters away from him. Deja grabbed the stretched arm of the bounty hunter, and broke it, making it bend into a U shape. The bounty hunter couldn't stop his own body from moving forward, and the vibroblade that had drastically changed directions was buried in his own chest. Green blood gushed out of the wound, drenching Deja's armor, but he ignored it, and grabbed his NT-242 once again. You are wounded. Leave it. Singh is killing them. Deja fired his sniper rifle again, driving Singh back into hiding, but at least five more clones had died during the twenty or thirty seconds of battle that Deja and Thyre just went through. Bosk, Castas, let's go. Our employees are going down quickly. New guy, you too. Without caring about the bounty hunter she had hired, Singh pulled back her weapon, and left her spot through an opening in one of the containers. She soon arrived at one of the exits of the docking zone. Dozens of workers and civilians were running around, trying to escape, but she soon saw her three associates. Hey! You, stop right there! A Coruscant guard clone who saw her tried to stop the bounty hunter, but was interrupted when three metal blades appeared on his chest. Singh smiled. Well done, Heige. Now, let's go. Chapter 166 well done, Heige. Now, let's go. Deja stood aiming his NT-242 at the spot Aura Singh was for about four minutes. Then, he confirmed what his instincts had been telling him. She wasn't there. He threw the NT-242 away, and grabbed the blaster pistol that the bounty hunter he just eliminated had. She is gone, fire. We need to go after her. But, sir. Your leg. Deja drew in a long breath when he felt the pain on his leg. The vibroblade had stabbed deep, although it missed the vital veins and arteries. I can deal with it. Commander Thorne. Singh is running. We are going to the nearest exit. Bosk also ran. I received a report that a clone was found dead on exit JL-3. You are closer, go there. Sergeant Hound. 
Yes, Commander. You are also close. Grizzer could be of help. I'm on my way, Commander. Dajer was about to go down the stairs, it would be quicker than taking the lift, when he saw the vibroblade embedded into the Akiyaki's chest. On a whim, he pulled it out, and took it with him. Dajer and Fire arrived at the exit quickly, but aside from the dozens of civilians, they saw no one. Fire bent over and checked the dead trooper, and shook his head. There was nothing they could do. The lieutenant picked up the Wester M5 that the dead clone had, and threw it to Dajer. The subcommander accepted it, and gladly threw the pistol away. He felt much more comfortable with a real blaster in hands. It was, however, useless, since they had no clue to where Singh escaped. Dajer looked at the wounds that the Coruscant Guard member suffered. He wasn't eliminated with a blaster. And there was something familiar about his injuries. Gur. Dajer turned around, and saw Hound running towards him, followed closely by his massive, Grizzer, and six other clones. He noticed that there were more massifs than clones, and he could imagine what happened to their owners. Hound. Can you find to which direction they went? I can't, sir, but Grizzer can. Come on, boy. Find. 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 The massif sniffed around for a few seconds while Hound gently stroked its back. Then, suddenly, the animal stopped, and looked directly north. He found it. Now, Grizzer. Go. And the massif took off running. On a dark alleyway, four people were quickly conferring together. Well, the truth was that one of them, a woman, was giving orders while the three men listened carefully. We will separate here. In two weeks, meet up in Dantuin. You will receive the rest of the credits there. Bosk and Castas nodded. Aura Singh was a deadly, treacherous and cruel bounty hunter, but even she knew she couldn't betray her partners so easily. If she did so, right after they rescued her, on top of that, she would lose all of her prestige as a bounty hunter. But the new guy they hired on their crew, Haigi, a huge Mon Calamari who never talked, had a different opinion. When Singh was trying to leave the alleyway, Haigi punched the wall near her, blocking her path. Dust and small debris fell off the wall, and web-like cracks started spreading on where he punched. After training under Count Dooku, Haigi might not have gained force powers, but he became much stronger. Bosk hissed, and Castas backed away with small hints of fear on his face. They had already seen what Haigi could do with his Vibra Trident, and they both knew they weren't good enough to fight him, at least not in such a closed space. Singh, on the other hand, just frowned. Haigi didn't speak a word, but he gave her a dangerous sensation, one she only felt when she was hunting Jedis. Haigi. I don't know why you became a bounty hunter, or why you came to me. But if you want to be part of my crew, you will follow my orders. Now, step aside. Haigi faced her angrily, and didn't move. Singh looked him right in the eyes, and both saw murderous intent. Bounty hunters always had problems like this when discussing payments and rewards. It wasn't the first time Singh decided to eliminate a fellow bounty hunter, and it wouldn't be the last. She wiped her leg, hitting Haigi on his ribs, but the Mon Calamari didn't even budge. He used his big hands to grab her leg, and lifted her before smashing the bounty hunter on the ground. Singh wasn't to be outdone, however. She might be physically weaker compared to Haigi, but she was much nimbler. She wrapped her other leg around Haigi's torso, and pulled out a blaster pistol. A round was fired at point blank, and Haigi released her, while at the same time, pulling out his Vibro Trident. Blood was trickling down from a wound on his arm. Bosk and Castas were nowhere to be seen. Whatever problem Haigi had with Singh's payment method, it was not theirs to worry about. And such a commotion would attract the authorities, even more considering that it was close to the docking zone, where a huge battle just happened. Their cautiousness paid off, because moments later nine clones arrived, one of them limping. The massive started to surround the two bounty hunters, who had now stopped fighting, and were eyeing the clones carefully. The gigantic Mon Calamari was holding his Vibro Trident, and Singh had two identical pistols. Haigi. Singh. Dajer looked surprised at the Mon Calamari. The last time he saw him, 
Heige had eliminated dozens of clones, but all of his men died, leaving him alone. He didn't expect to meet him ever again. And Singh was his target. Meeting both of them at the same time might be a headache, but it would give him the chance to take out two dangerous criminals at once. You are the clone who captured me. Your armor is different. Heige said nothing, but Dager didn't know he couldn't talk. To him, Heige was just being tough. Put down your weapons and come with us quietly. That is not happening, sweetheart. I can't wait to destroy that new armor of yours. Dager grinned. I was kind of hoping you would say that. Ten seconds went by with both sides facing each other without moving. And then Dager saw Grizzer tensing up behind Singh, preparing to jump. The moment the massive moved, Dager pushed Hound to the side, just in time to save the sergeant from two lasers shot by Singh. Grizzer jumped on Singh's back, while two other massives bit her legs, dragging her down. Ironically, it was this that saved her from the volley of blue lasers that the clones fired. Heige, on the other hand, didn't dodge the lasers, but blocked them. Using a spinning movement that looked remarkably similar to the Jedi's, all the lasers were absorbed by the Vibro Trident. Heige advanced, and kicked Dager on the stomach. The clone flew back two or three meters, hitting another clone, and knocking him on the ground. While Singh was trying to free herself from the massives, Heige slashed his Vibro Trident, cutting the throat of a clone. A massive, presumably his, cried in sadness, and jumped on Heige, but the Mon Calamari impaled it on his weapon. Then, Heige used the blunt side of his weapon to smash a clone in the face. Dager tried to get up, but Heige saw, and moved towards him. He grabbed another clone by the throat, and threw him over Dager. Just when the Mon Calamari was about to stab both of them, a green glow passed by, and blocked his Vibro Trident. Chapter 167 A small frame appeared above Dager. With orange skin, and two blue and white protuberances on her head, the young girl was very similar to Ragu. Dager realized that the person who saved him was a teenager to Grota, holding two lightsabers, one green and one yellow. The way she wielded them was weird, almost backward. She blocked Heige's Vibro Trident, and seemed almost surprised, either by the force behind it, or by the fact that it wasn't cut in half when facing a lightsaber. Heige opened his mouth, and, although not a sound came out, he seemed to be growling. The young Jedi, probably a Padawan, waved her lightsabers faster than any other Jedi Dager had ever seen. Heige was forced back step by step, and struggled under the torrent of attacks. Dager decided that the Jedi could take care of herself, and got up, looking for Singh. All he found, however, were the three massifs laying on the ground. He didn't have the time to check if they were okay. He knew Singh couldn't have escaped through the entrance of the alleyway, because the Jedi was there. So, she could only have followed the alley. He saw one of the members of the massif unit on the ground moving and groaning, and pulled the soldier up. Get on your feet, trooper. Follow me. The clone scrambled to get up, holding his chest with apparent pain. Still, the trooper grabbed his blaster on the ground, and went after Dager. The alleyway took a sudden turn to the left, and, while Dager could still hear the fight, he couldn't see it at all because of the darkness. He and the other clone advanced carefully, paying attention to every trash can and piece of metal behind which Singh could hide. However, neither he nor the clone paid attention to above them. With a loud sound, the adventurer slug thrower rifle that Singh owned fired a round projectile, which pierced the back of the clone. Differently from a laser, the projectile didn't immediately cauterize the wound. Instead, bright red blood splashed out of his chest, and onto Dager's armor. The subcommander was shocked for a moment, but then instinct took over, and he did the same move he had done thousands of times. Dropping to the ground and rolling away, he dodged the next shot, and returned with two of his own. He missed, but Singh was forced out of her hiding spot, and dampened her fall by rolling on the ground. Before she could recover, Dager pulled out the vibroblade that he took from the Akiyaki, and slashed at her. She used her rifle to block, but his objective had never been to hit her. He hooked her rifle, and pulled using all his strength. The weapon and the vibroblade fell amidst a pile of trash quite a distance away. 
The blaster Dager had remaining was the old pistol he took from one of the bounty hunters, and, at this critical moment, it failed him. Maybe it was because the bounty hunter didn't clean it, maybe it was just because it was old, but when he pulled the trigger, the pistol didn't fire. Sing looked as surprised as him, maybe because she already believed she was dead, but she recovered faster than Dager, stupidity, tried to pull the trigger once more. She kicked his knee, making Dager kneel on the ground, and brought her own knee up on the same move. When the limb smashed in his jaw, black spots appeared in his vision. Before he could react, she punched him twice on his left side, right where the vibroblade cut him. Intense pain made his body go limp, and he almost passed out. Before his vision turned entirely black, he saw the young Jedi appear running, holding both of her lightsabers, and then he saw nothing more. For the third or fourth time in a week, Dager woke up to see a medical droid above him. When the droid tried to examine his pupils, he pushed it away. He pushed the blanket away, stood up, and instantly grimaced in pain. Looking into a nearby metal mirror, he realized he was naked. Probably so the medical droids could treat him better, because he had wounds all over his body. Both his torso and leg were bandaged, but when he moved he could still feel the pain from cuts made by the vibroblade. His shoulder was red and purple, especially around the joint, where it was broken not long ago. His forearm also had bandages around it, covering the hole a droid laser made in Majito. And the right side of his face was entirely covered in plasters as well. Curiously, however, it was where he felt less pain. In fact, he felt none. Cautiously, he tried to blink with his right eye, and felt his eyelids move slightly under the bandages. He reached out, and started removing the pieces of cloth. Subcommander Dager, your eye isn't totally recovered yet. I advise that you don't. Quiet. One by one, he removed the bandages. Slowly, his wounded eye was revealed. After so many weeks, his eye struggled to adapt to the light, but Dager was too excited to care about it. He blinked a few times, and closed his left eye. He was still seeing. For many days, he thought he had lost his eye, and now he was relieved to discover he was wrong. After making sure his eye was all right, he finally moved on to analyze the scar left behind. Ventress lightsaber had cut through his helmet and his skin, leaving a scar that would never recover. Starting on the top of his forehead, almost cutting through his hair, and ending just above his chin, the scar was almost a perfect vertical line. That went to prove how powerful and precise a lightsaber was. It was about 16 or 17 centimeters long, and, up till now, it was the biggest scar Dager had. Although the one the vibroblade left on his torso would probably come as a close second. Dager grabbed his clothes, a military attire with the 303rd colors in his rank, subcommander, on it, and wore them. After taking a few painkillers that the medical droid insisted he had to use, Dager left the medical center. He didn't have his helmet, but that didn't bother him. If anything, the scar was something to be proud of, a proof he fought a Sith and survived. Besides, he had seen worse scars before. Way worse. The few Coruscant guard members he passed by on the way saluted him without batting an eye. Unfortunately, injuries and scars had become common, more common than they should have been. When he arrived at Hell Squad's quarters, he found most of his men sleeping. Only Cell and Metal were awake, playing some card game. When they heard the door opening, they turned around. You are up. How are your? Oh. Ahem. You are handsome as always. How could he take that compliment seriously when they were clones? Chapter 168 The rest of Hell Squad woke up when they heard Cell yelling. Like all troopers, they never slept too soundly, so even a small amount of noise was enough to wake them. They all gathered around Dager, the first question being if he was well, and the second being how did the operation go. He, however, didn't have an answer to the second question. He contacted Commander Thorne, and asked the results, but the clone ordered him to meet face to face instead of giving him the answers through comlink. Sorry, sir. Nothing, brain. I need to go meet Commander Thorne. You all stay here. The headquarters of the Coruscant Guard was as busy as always, but all the troopers seemed, somehow, depressed. 
They still gave Dejo the normal salutes, but their enthusiasm was null compared to the day before. Commander Thorne, Sergeant Hound, Lieutenant Thyre and Commander Fox were around the hologram table, which showed Jedi General Anakin Skywalker, and the young Tigruta that saved Dejo, twice. Commander Thorne, Commander Fox. Hound, Thyre. Dejo saluted the two commanders, and greeted the other clones, who acknowledged him. Then, he turned to the holograms. General Skywalker. And. My name is Ahsoka Tano, Subcommander. I am Master Skywalker's Padawan. Thank you for your help, General Tano. You saved my life. The Padawan looked down with sadness, which only confirmed Dejo's worries. Unfortunately, I couldn't help more. Dejo walked next to Thyre, so he could look to the holograms without them having to turn around. Commander Thorne, I was in the medical bay until a few minutes ago. How was the operation? Thorne shook his head. Like the other clones around the table, with the exception of Dejo, he was wearing his armor, but his helmet was under his arm. Instead of answering Dejo, he looked at the scar on his eye. That wasn't due to yesterday's battle, was it? No, Commander. I got it on my Jito. Was it really so bad? The shock trooper sighed, but was interrupted by Commander Fox before he could say anything. Not saying it won't change anything, Thorn. It was a total failure, Dager. Singh, Bosk and Castas escaped. Upon receiving confirmation, Dager punched the table, making the holograms sway a little, and Commander Fox stared angrily at him. Sorry, Commander. Well, it wasn't a total failure. We captured that Mon Calamari. The soft voice of the Padawan pulled Dejo back from his thoughts. He remembered his surprise in seeing Heige, who he thought was dead, working with Singh. If he was detained, that meant he might have information on her. His name is Heige, General Tano. I fought him before. Ugh. Don't call me General. It took me ages just to get Rexy Boy to call me Commander. Do the same. Dejo was unsure of what to do, while General Skywalker barely managed to contain his laughter. After a few moments, Dejo realized that Rexy Boy was Captain Rex, the commander of the 501st Legion. How the Padawan managed to come up with such a nickname for the stern captain, he had no idea. Okay, Commander Tano. I fought with Heige before. He. Doesn't like me. That might help if I am allowed to interrogate him. He turned to the two Coruscant Guard commanders, who nodded. They didn't have any problem with it. How were our casualties? Commander Fox nodded to Thyre, who passed a data pad over to Dager. The subcommander read it, and closed his eyes. The scar on his face became longer, now covering his eyelid. Twenty-nine troopers perished, and fifteen others were wounded. Those percentages are bigger than even the worst battles the Republic had. Hound pulled up a list with about twelve bounty hunters, two of which Dejo recognized as the Aki Aki and the IG-88 unit that attacked him and Thyre. Singh had about twelve bounty hunters with her, not including Heige, Castas, and Bosk. Only one escaped, while the rest were either eliminated or captured. They weren't our target. No, Hound, Commander Fox is right. We failed. A few hours later, Deja was on the canteen, alone. Hell Squad wanted to go with him, but Brain knew their squad leader wanted to be alone, and held them back. Now, Deja was almost alone on the Thames. No clone would spontaneously join him because of his status as a subcommander, except for one. Sergeant Hound, of the Massif Unit, sat next to him without asking for permission. Usually, that would have been disrespectful, but Deja wasn't in the mood to care about it. How are you doing, sir? Dager sneered. How could he be doing well? It was the first time he ever failed in a mission. Sure, he had retreated before, he had lost battles before, but it was against a droid army, where the strength of a single unit was insignificant. But now, when he had to capture a single person, he failed. What Dager didn't think about, was that if he hadn't been there, many more would have died. He was never meant to be on the chase after Singh, it was entirely coincidental that he was on Coruscant at the time. 
If he wasn't there providing Overwatch with fire, Singh could have sniped more clones. If he didn't push Hound down on the alleyway, the sergeant would have died under Singh's hands. How is Grizzer doing, Hound? The Massif had been hurt when he jumped on Singh, but he could be considered lucky. The two others had died. He will recover. But that isn't the reason I came here, sir. What is it, then? That Mon Calamari, Heidi. He eliminated four of my men on the alleyway. And it wasn't a nice death. When you interrogate him, can I go with you? Dajer thought for a while before denying. Hound wasn't emotionally stable enough for this. The sergeant stopped talking, neither contesting Dajer's decision, nor agreeing with it. The subcommander changed subjects to avoid the awkward silence. That Padawan of General Skywalker. Was she the Jedi assigned to chasing Singh? I think so, sir. She is good. Saved our lives. I only wished she arrived earlier. Dajer thought back to the sad expression that Commander Tano had when she heard the casualties. It was clear that she was very inexperienced, otherwise she wouldn't be so affected. Even Ragu, who wasn't much older than her, could now ignore the deaths of the clones and keep going on the battle. War was war, and compassion and empathy wouldn't stop it. Leave it. She probably arrived when the fight was already ending. Now, get back to your duties, Sergeant. I'm going to see Heige, but I will be sure to let you know if he gives away something. What's wrong, Snips? That clone, the one with the scar. You met him before, didn't you, Master? He was stabbed two times, but he still went after the bounty hunter. And then, when I arrived, she was almost killing him, but he didn't give up. He was still trying to fight her. Does he hate her so much? Did you feel hatred when you talked to him? I felt pain and sadness. That is what most of the clones feel. You just didn't have the opportunity, or rather, the misfortune, of witnessing it on the 501st. He kept fighting her when he was about to die because that is his duty, but mostly because she was a threat, not for him, but for his brothers. That is how a clone mind works. Maybe that is how everyone's mind should work. Chapter 169 Escorted by four Coruscant guard members, Dajer entered the high-level prison in the heart of the planet. Only the worst of the worst were sent there, and the life of the inmates followed a circle of eating and being locked in the small cells. They stopped at the inspection station, where the clone responsible asked for Dajer to leave his weapons behind. Dajer stared at the clone, who shrugged and saluted at the same time, resulting in a weird shoulder motion. Sorry, sir. Unless you are a member of the prison guard, Commander Fox or Commander Thorn, you have to leave all weapons behind. Most visitors and troopers aren't allowed to keep their comlinks, but since you are a sub-commander, you can. I understand, trooper. Dajer handed over his DC-15A and his DC-17, and the clone put them on a box labeled with his name and the words 303rd Attack Legion. As usual, after seeing two blasters, the clone pulled the box to store it, but Dajer stopped him. That is not all. The guard looked surprised at the vibroblade that Dajer gave to him. After being folded, the weapon wasn't larger than a fist, so he didn't notice it at first. After the meeting that Dajer had earlier that day, a trooper brought to him his armor, helmet, and weapons. Amidst the blasters was also the vibroblade. According to the clone, a Padawan said it was Dajer's, and ordered the soldier to bring it together with the rest. A vibroblade was by no means standard equipment to a Republic soldier, and Dajer almost threw it away, but then he thought that having one more weapon, especially one as inconspicuous as this, couldn't be bad. On the end, he keeps the vibroblade, and attached it to his back, where he could quickly grab it if needed. Are you going to take it or not, trooper? I have a prisoner to interrogate. The clone took the vibroblade, and Dajer kept walking, almost leaving his surprised escort behind. The guard that was left behind couldn't help but think that Dajer was quite eccentric, which was weird, considering that all clones should be equal. But then, the guard had never entered a real battle, he didn't know how they could change one's personality, even if they started the same. A floating platform took Dajer down. Heige was on the lowest level of the prison, where interrogations ensued. 
It was like gaining a tour of the prison. Shaped like a hollow cylinder, the platform went straight through the middle of the prison, showcasing the cells embedded on the walls. Those cells were protected by a red energy wall, but even if the walls failed, the prisoner wouldn't be able to escape unless he or she could fly or hijack one of the floating platforms. Up till now, no inmate had ever escaped. Along the way, Dejer felt many eyes staring at him with obvious disgust and hate. However, he completely ignored them. Why would he care about what criminals thought of him? The lower level of the prison was very dark, probably to scare and intimidate the inmates. Dejer heard that before the clones assumed the position of guards, countless atrocities happened in the prison. On the ground level, a Coruscant guard officer, Posh, waited for Dejer. When the platform arrived, he signaled for the escort to wait. He saluted Dejer, who nodded to him. The platform took back the escort. From this point onwards, only authorized personnel could stay. Even the guards couldn't leave the prison daily like the others. Instead, they had their own quarters down there. The prisoner is waiting for you in interrogation room 11, sir. Take me there. Berm. Before we go, sir, I think you should know that he had been. Uncooperative. Dager wasn't surprised. He doubted any recently captured inmate would be willing to talk. He followed Posh for about ten minutes, after which they ended up on a hallway full of doors, each one guarded by two clones wearing red armor. He is here. One of the cells had four clones before it, one of them being a medic, and another holding an electrostaff. Dejer raised an eyebrow. Electrostaffs and any similar weapon weren't permitted in the prison. Posh couldn't see his face under the helmet, but probably sensed his hesitation. It was the only way to calm him down, sir. He sent two of my men to the infirmary before we finally knocked him out and put him here. Dejer said nothing. He could either scold Posh for using prohibited weapons to threaten the prisoners, and complain with his superiors, or he could pretend he didn't see anything. Dejer ignored Posh, and grabbed the electrostaff from the clone's hand. Throw this way. And you, Posh, the next time I come here, I don't want to see any of this, understood? I dislike him even more than you do, but you know I will be forced to report this. I will let it slip only this once. Dejer didn't report Posh not because he was cruel or wanted to see Heige suffer, but because he needed the information that Heige had. It was their only chance to transform a failed mission into a successful one. He had, however, been influenced by the Jedi's more than he thought or ever imagined. Unconsciously, he started to adopt their morals. Commanders Fox or Thorn, who usually interrogated the prisoners, never cared for the Electrostaff, but they never worked with a Jedi for an extended period of time. Subcommander Dager. There is something you should know. Dager was about to enter the interrogation room when the medic stopped him. Dager turned to the clone, waiting for him to speak. Berm. Our exams showed us something. Interesting. The prisoner, Heige, is mute. Mute? That is not possible. I heard him talk before. His vocal cords appear to be crushed. I don't know how or when, but he is totally incapable of speaking. Then we will have him right. Open the door. The clone opened the door as he was ordered. Dager wasn't in the mood to chat, and his tone made it very clear. Heige was sitting on a metal chair, his hands chained together, and then chained to the ceiling. One of the guards chained his legs to the floor, and then released one of his hands before giving him a data pad. Dejer pulled over another chair, and sat down. Heige growled as loud as his broken voice cords permitted, but Dejer ignored the hatred in his eyes. What happened to you? A separatist officer and warrior became a voiceless bounty hunter. And you entered Singh's crew. Gur. Chapter 170. In the end, Heige was actually very helpful. That is, after he tried to break free from his chains and eliminate Dejer. Twice. But after the Mon Calamari discovered that all Dejer wanted was Singh, he was glad to tell him her whereabouts. But it was all for nothing. A group of clones raided the compound where she was supposed to meet with Bosk, Castas, and Heige, but she was nowhere to be found. Dejer was still in the middle of interrogating Heige when his comlink bipped. 
Dejer looked at Haigi one last time, and left the room. Meeting the Mon Calamari on Coruscant had been a big coincidence, but Dejer was almost sure that he would never see the Mon Calamari again. Haigi would spend a deserved lifetime in prison, and Dejer couldn't be more happy about it. Subcommander Dejer here. Return to the ship immediately. We are departing. Hearing the urgency in General D's voice, Dejer didn't question him or ask for reasons, but simply cut communications and went back to the platform. In the meantime, he contacted Brain, ordering him to talk to Shep, and get back to the corvette. Hell Squad is here, General D. Everything necessary has been loaded into the ship. Ragu, give Shep the coordinates to our destination. Hell Squad, follow me. Even before the lower rampart was fully closed, the ship was already taking off. Wherever they had to go, they need to go fast. General D turned on the hologram table, and put in some coordinates, bringing up a map. Dejer easily recognized the sector, and, most importantly, the only important planet in it. Gala's sector, Ryloth system. Why the hurry, General? Ryloth has been fighting without the Republic for months. Besides, there are no separatist forces there. They are facing their own government. Until now. And now they can't hold on anymore. The freedom fighters there finally gave up, and asked for our help. But our primary target isn't Ryloth. Typing on the hologram table rapidly, General D brought up information on a separatist convoy. Admiral Dow, together with Commander Keeley, are already directed to Ryloth. We are on a race against the separatist fleet led by the separatist commander, Watambor. The fleet has to get there before them and establish a blockade. That, however, brings us to our second problem. Supplies. Exactly. Our fleet didn't have time to restock before being reassigned. The urgency of these orders took top priority. Tech looked over the map, and showed the convoy that General D mentioned. It was protected by several separatist ships, including one Providence-class dreadnought and three Munificent-class frigates. I suppose we are going to take their supplies then. You are right, Tech. The nearest Republic planet is weeks away from Ryloth. By the time any supplies get sent from there, the separatist will have an entire fleet on Ryloth. However, if we attack, and take over that convoy, we might just arrive before them. Most of the clones didn't see a problem with the plan, and nodded, except Dager. His time as a subcommander reached him to always look for flaws. General, how are we going to attack the convoy? We have one CR-90 corvette. Our blaster cannons wouldn't even scratch their escort. Even if we are able to board the convoy, and take control of it, how are we supposed to take care of the frigates and the dreadnought? Dager wasn't worried about taking over the ship, because he fully believed Hell Squad alone could do it. However, the escort could simply wreck them after they hijacked it. However, General D gave them one of his rare smiles after hearing Dager's concerns. Master Skywalker's fleet will support us, and engage the escort while we infiltrate the cargo ships. There are two of them. We will be in charge of one, while the second will be the target of our second group of reinforcements, Delta Squad. Oh no. Seriously? General D looked dumbfounded at Hell Squad. When he gave them the news that the best unit on the entirety of the Republic Army was going to aid them, the last thing he expected were groans of discontentment. Even Dager, who barely showed any emotion when on duty, complained. Ragu, who had just returned from the cockpit, stood looking at them, not understanding what was going on. Quiet, you all. Seeing the belyward looks on the faces of both Jedis, Dager quickly ordered Hell Squad to shut up. General D looked at him questioningly, and Dager had to explain. Clone commandos can be difficult to work with, General. They are a pain in the ass. Shut up, Cell. The thing is that they tend to believe that normal clones, like us, or as the rest of the army, aren't capable enough. With special units like us, even more so. They seem to think that since we started as normal troopers, then we can't partake in the dangerous operations that they were designed to. That was exactly the truth. More than once, Dager and Hell Squad had discussed with Delta Squad when they met them. 
That is, when Delta Squad considered them worthy enough to talk to. They were very arrogant. There was no other way of putting it. Since they were genetically modified to have more independence, they also had certain emotions and feelings that other clones didn't, like excessive pride. You can't be serious. I've never seen any of you discuss, even more look down upon one another. Dajer grinned. General D already understood what Dajer meant, but Regu apparently didn't. The Padawan was still too innocent in some aspects. With all due respect, General Ragu, but we wouldn't discuss in front of you, or even while we are on duty. Clone commandos might be a little too proud, but they are still fighting for the Republic, just like us. General D ended the discussion right there, and turned it back to the battle plans, but there was one clone who have something more to say. If only we had an ARC trooper, then things would be really fun. Dajer almost facepalmed when he heard Cell, who seemed to be unable to shut his mouth. Clone commandos and ARC troopers disliked each other even more than they disliked special units. Before he had to order the scout to stay silent, a stare from General D did it for him. One hyperspace travel later, the corvette met General Skywalker's fleet behind a moon, where they could hide from the sensors of the convoy. The corvette would join the attack, but Hell Squad would realize their infiltration through another point, so they moved to the capital ship of the 501st Fleet. Hell Squad followed General D and his Padawan through the corridors of the ship, their armor catching even more attention now that they were in a legion with different colors than them. General Skywalker's Padawan, Ahsoka Tano, was in the command bridge to greet them. She respectfully bowed to General D, and it was clear that she and Ragu already knew each other. My master should be arriving soon, Master D. He has a talent to always be late. Hey hey hey, snips. I already told you to not talk bad about me behind my back. Chapter 171 A tall man, with short brown hair and a scar very similar to Dager's, entered the command bridge. General Skywalker and his Padawan started bickering almost instantly, ignoring everyone in the room. Dager could almost feel Captain Rex's frustration. Um. Master Skywalker. I believe we should be discussing battle plans. General D caught General Skywalker's attention, and the younger Jedi shamelessly ignored the fact that he didn't greet anyone properly. Dajer liked General Skywalker's fighting style, but he couldn't help but think that the Jedi wasn't very respectful. Of course, Master D. There is nothing much to discuss. Our fleets are about the same size. I say we stay hidden as much as we can, and then attack. While he was speaking, General Skywalker, showed some simulations on the hologram table. On it, General Skywalker's fleet, marked in blue, came from behind the moon, not giving the Separatists the chance to retaliate. Dajer nodded when he saw it. If everything went well, they might not only take the supplies, but also destroy some enemy ships. General Skywalker might not be the most respectful Jedi, but he sure was a good strategist. What about the infiltration? How do you plan on doing it? I think we got this covered, General. Before the younger Jedi could answer, someone did it for him. The door of the command bridge opened, and four clones got in. Their armor was much thicker than normal, making they seem twice as big as other troopers, and was scarred with battle marks. Their helmets were also bigger and more round than the Phase II ones, and the T-shaped visor glowed with a blue light. Boss. General Skywalker, General D, Commander Tano, General Ragu. The leader of Hell Squad saluted the Jedi's present, and ignored the others. Dajer saw Cell and Metal Swift uncomfortably next to him, but at least the two clones had enough common sense not to say anything, at least for now. General D looked at his men, but they stood as still as rocks, and he couldn't see their faces under the helmets. Of course, if he wanted he could have sensed their emotions through the Force, but he didn't. Instead, he eyed Delta Squad carefully. It was his first time meeting the best unit the Republic had. How do you plan on getting us into the cargo ships? Instead of answering, Boss motioned for another member of Delta Squad to walk forward. He had almost entirely black armor, with only the front of his helmet and chest being white. Golden stripes followed all his limbs. His name was Scorch, Demolition and Explosives Expert. 
If we use two Y-Wing bombers, one for each ship, we can damage their ray shields. For a small window of time, about 15 seconds, their lower hangar will have no defense, and then the emergency doors close. Using two lots, we can board in that window. General Skywalker nodded, showing his approval. General D, however, more cautious than the younger Jedi, voiced his doubts. Won't that be too little time? The gunships would have to be almost glued to the bombers to catch that moment. We've done it before, General, we can do it again. Pride was evident on Scorch's voice, and General D frowned. Too much confidence could lead to demise, and Jedi's knew this better than anyone. Even General Skywalker raised an eyebrow at Scorch's statement. General D looked at Dager. What do you think, Dager? Dager stepped forward, knowing that everyone was staring at him, and wasn't bothered a bit. He was used to having eyes watching his every decision. He quickly analyzed the enemy fleet, and the resources that the Republic had at hand. Delta Squad's plan might be a close call, but it could very well work. Maybe. It is possible, General. However, we will need good pilots, not only for the lots, but for the Y-Wings as well. If they take down the shields a tad too early or late, we crash on the ship. General D nodded. He had heard of Delta Squad's reputation, but he had never seen them in action. Hell Squad, on the other hand, he knew very well. If Dager said it was possible, then he believed the clone. Leave the pilots to me. You will have the best of the best. You aren't talking about yourself, are you, Master? Remember last time you piloted a fighter, on Christophsis? I don't think they have rebuilt all the buildings you took down when you crashed. I wouldn't have crashed if the droids weren't aiming especially at me. Master and Padawan went on bickering. General D decided to ignore them, and turned back to the table to go over their plans one last time. Group 1 will be composed of Delta Squad, Captain Rex, Master Skywalker and young Ahsoka. Group 2 will be Hell Squad, myself and Ragu. Any doubts? No one said anything, and one by one, left the command bridge. Dager followed General D and Ragu when they left. Delta Squad looked at them as they passed, and Dager slightly nodded to Boss when they went by. The clone commando nodded back. Whatever conflicts they had before, the success of the mission depended on them. The troopers might not understand that, but the leaders of their respective squads did. Every trooper to battle stations. Every trooper to battle stations. This is not a drill. This is not a drill. Red lights flashed as the scanners captured the photon signatures of the separatist convoy. Dager grabbed his helmet and his blasters, and assembled Hell Squad. In a matter of seconds, the entire squad was already running towards the hangar. It was kind of weird for Dager to watch other clones barking orders, since he usually was the one who did it. Clones using the blue of the 501st Legion started getting into the new ship variant that was becoming one of the three principal starfighters of the Republic Navy, the V-Wing. V-Wings were the evolution of the ARC-170, and although the old model was still being used, the new one was faster and nimbler. Some clones also got into a few Y-Wings and ARC-170s, and two lots were being prepared. The gunships weren't made for space battles, but were perfect to board the enemy ships. Move, boys. Faster, let's go, go, go. Let's give those clankers a betting their bucket heads won't forget. A voice stood out more than others as Captain Rex got up on a crate and started yelling. Seeing their commander made the clones work faster, and Dager thought that he might try it sometime, when he was preparing the 303rd for a battle. To the gunship, Dager. Ragu, called Dager and Hell Squad moved to one of the gunships. He saw Delta Squad boarding the other, and waved at one of them, who had orange armor on the top right of his chest and shoulder pad. Boss! We have to synchronize our entry, or they will focus fire on one of us. When you are near the target, ping us and count to ten, then make your entrance. Understood, Dager. You do the same. Good luck. Dager nodded, and closed the doors of their gunship. He heard the hangar doors opening, and the starfighters taking off. It soon was their turn. The battle had begun. 
Chapter 172 Hawk was one of the best pilots that the 501st Legion had, and so, he was assigned not to his usual starfighter, but to a lot. As most clones, he rarely discussed his orders, and this time was no different. While he was prepping the gunship to fly, he saw nine people enter the lot. Two of them were using brown Jedi robes, presumably one master and one padawan. The other seven were clones wearing red and brown armor. Differently from the others, those clones didn't have a fixed pattern to their armor's paint. The thickness of the armor also seemed different than normal. The soldier walking in the front was clearly the leader. He had his helmet under his arm, showing his face which had a red scar crossing over his right eye. His right shoulder pad had many small scratches, probably made by him, since they were too uniform to be battle marks. Hawk could only think of one squad who used such armor with such colors. And if he was right, it was no wonder that they were going to attack an enemy ship with only seven clones. After all, few in the Republic Army could match Hell Squad. They were an example to be followed, their tactics and battles even discussed in classes on the training facilities of Kamino. The stories of how seven clones took down a battle sphere and became a special unit on their first battle had reached every clone in the galaxy. Unaware of the pilot who was remembering every which one of Hell Squad's deeds, Dager was checking his soldiers one last time. As if Hell Squad would go into a battle unprepared. Dab had his DC 15X on his back, and was carrying his backup blaster, a DC 15S. Metal had his double barrel repeating blaster on his hands, and many magazines strapped to his chest. Brain and 3 4 had their DC 15S on hands, Tech was checking on his data pad which he used to hack into doors on missions like that. Cell, however, had a different weapon than normal on his hands. Something which looked like a DC-15S, but smaller and rounder. Dejer raised an eyebrow, making his scar more pronounced. You are using that? I thought you hated it. Cell shrugged. He was the clone on Hell Squad that liked blasters the most after metal and dab. When he said he hated a weapon, it usually meant that it met his requirements for a scout. It is too loud for me. But they know we are coming anyway, so it doesn't matter. Besides, I am also bringing this old buddy here. He patted his DC-15S, which had followed him since the first battle on Geonosis. Dager shrugged. Hell Squad had much more liberty than other clones, and they all knew how to use each and every blaster on the Republic's armory. He wasn't worried that Cell would get in trouble for using a blaster he wasn't used to. Brain. Droid poppers only. I don't want any supplies damaged by a bad grenade. Have you ever seen I throw a bad grenade? You heard me. Dager ignored the grin he knew the clone had on his face, and turned to the two Jedis, who were talking quietly at one side. They couldn't be more different than General Skywalker and his Padawan. The lot had already taken off and although the battle hadn't started yet, Dager knew that it wouldn't take long for the Separatist convoy to detect the ambush. Our entry point is the lower hangar. From there on, we have to take the lifts and get to the command bridge. There will be hundreds, if not thousands of clankers, sir. That is why Hell Squad is doing it, and not other clones. Dager chuckled. The Jedi knew him well enough to understand that Dager wasn't worried about the number of droids. Ships were one of the best battlegrounds for small groups. They were full of choke points where a small and well-trained group, like Hell Squad, could hold an army for hours. Hold on, generals. Things are going to get a little rough out here. Locked inside the lot like they were, they weren't able to see what was happening outside, but Hawk could. Thousands of vulture droids and a few hundred tri-fighters launched themselves out of the warships escorting the two cargo ships. Noises of battle sounded loud as the two sides crashed into one another. In the initial engagement, dozens, if not hundreds, of starfighters exploded on both sides. The Republic, however, had the advantage of surprise. While the Republic cruisers were facing directly towards the enemy escort, the Separatist ships were turned sideways, and, as such, only half of their turrets could be used. Big explosions burst holes on the sides of two munificent class frigates as the laser cannons of the Acclimator class cruisers battered them while they didn't have the chance to react. Master D. 
We are approaching their ships. They hadn't noticed us yet. General Skywalker's voice was loud enough for Dager to hear it even though he was speaking to General D. The Nikto answered briefly, and turned to Dager, who nodded. Dager went to the cockpit and yelled in Hawk's ear, so the clone could hear him. How long to the target? Thirty seconds, sir. Dager counted the seconds as they approached the cargo ships. When fifteen seconds went by, he turned on his comlink. Boss. Fifteen seconds. Bombers, open a path. Acknowledging his orders, the two Y-wings speed up. Dager could see their photon torpedoes being charged through the cockpit's glass. And then everything went wrong. If Dager was listening to the Starfighter's pilots, he would have heard one of them scream when a Tri-Fighter hit him with a concussion missile. His V-wing caught on fire for a few seconds before the vacuum extinguished the flames, and his entire left wing was ripped off. The pilot was already dead, and the already damaged Starfighter lost control, and went spinning into space. And crashed into the Y-wing. Both Starfighters exploded, the impact making Dager's lot shook. His eyes half closed because of the explosion, Dager saw the other Y-wing released two torpedoes, hitting the ray shield of one cargo ship, taking it down. Delta Squad's gunship landed inside it seconds before the emergency doors closed. We lost our bomber. There was nothing General D could do, Jedi or not. The turrets of the nearby frigate were already turning towards them, and a squadron of vulture droids was on their tail. They needed to do something. Bomber 2. Turn back and take the other shield. Their defenses are too thick, sir. We can't. That is an order. Do it. Dager's commanding tone made the Y-wing turn backs around, and fly towards them. Explosions boomed all around him, but somehow, the bomber managed to get through them, and take its place in front of the lot. Its photon torpedoes were charging once more when it was hit by a turret. It slowed down tremendously, but somehow, managed to stay on its course. The torpedoes were fired, taking down the ray shields. Almost instantly, it also was hit by a missile, and blew up. Using the small window of time, Hawk pushed the lot to its limits, and the gunship barely went through, almost getting crushed by the emergency doors. Chapter 173 Dager fell to the ground when the lot crashed in the hangar. Having to squeeze between the emergency doors, Hawk had nor time nor conditions to land properly. Dager got up groaning, and looked out of the window of the cockpit. An entire platoon of B-1 battle droids was surrounding the downed gunship. Dager saw Hawk on the ground, his helmet had been knocked off, and his head was bleeding, but he was alive. Stay here, Hawk. We are going to overtake the ship, but if we fail, try to get the lot back up. It never hurts to be prepared. Dager went back to his squad, and saw the clones waiting anxiously. He turned to General D and Ragu, who already had their lightsabers out. They are out there, General. Just waiting for us to show ourselves. Then we will do as they want. Master D. Are you there? Why didn't we contact us? Master Skywalker. We had some problems with our landing, but we are here. Don't forget your mission. We will be waiting for you, Master D. After turning off the comlink, General D signaled something to Dager. The clone and the Jedi had worked together for quite some time now, and understood each other very well. Brain, prepare the droid poppers. Metal, when we open this door, Brain is going to throw some droid poppers to clear the way, and you will blast the clankers on the left. Tech, support him. The others will focus on the right. We get out and take cover. Understood. The clones cleared the door, waiting for General D's move. The Jedi did it by leaning his body forward, and putting both his hands near his belly. Then, suddenly, he pushed his hands forward, and the door was sent flying. While it was happening, Dager quickly thought that now their backup plan of fleeing in the lot was busted. The door crashed down on a group of clankers, crushing them, and stunning the others, who didn't expect it. Brain threw a handful of electromagnetic pulse grenades, the famous droid poppers. In an area of about 20 meters, every droid convulsed as blue chains of electricity zapped through them. 
Metal got into the action, every shot of his repeating blaster shoving droids back, or ripping them apart. The double barrel repeating blaster was so powerful that even the shots that missed did some damage as they caused small explosions. Not to be outdone, the rest of Hell Squad also burst into action, cutting down droids left and right. More feeling than seeing a burst of lasers coming towards him, Dager turned his body sideways, and felt the red energy rays heat up his face. He moved his DC-15A quickly, changing his target even before the shot connected. Each and every laser he fired found its mark on a droid's head or chest. Suddenly, he saw that Brain had taken a step too far, and two droids found the time to shoot at him. Dager knew that they would hit. Without thinking, the leader of Hell Squad jumped forward, and pushed Brain down. The lasers that went to the grenadier would now hit him. Even knowing this, Dager still managed to return fire, and one of the droids went down. He looked at the incoming lasers, and, surprisingly, smiled. He knew what was going to happen long before it did. With a blue flash, the lasers were deflected, hitting some unlucky clankers. General D used the force to push Dager forward, and the clone used the impulse to surprise some of the droids. He used one hand to support his DC-15A, and pulled out his DC-17 with the other. The long blaster lost its balance, but with General D's help, Dager had gotten so close to the droids that accuracy didn't matter. The head of the first droid burst out of its sockets when it received a round of Dager's blasters point blank. The second and third clankers were dead before they could react. Only the ones behind those had a shot at reacting, but before they need, Ragu jumped over Dager's head, cutting three droids in half with just one move. Then, the Padawan used the force to push another group of droids, and the B-1 units flew as if they were light as a feather, and ended in a broken mess near one of the hangar's walls. The battle was over when General D pulled over the last droid directly towards his lightsaber. When he deactivated it, the clanker fell to the ground, breaking the silence that reigned after the battle. In a matter of seconds, an entire platoon of droids, about 40 B-1 units, lay dead on the ground, while the Republic's side had no wounds whatsoever. Hawk looked over from the lot, a DC-15S in his hands that he never got the chance to use. He had never seen anyone fight like that, neither had he ever witnessed Jedis and clones work so fluidly together. Dager ignored the surprised clone, and stepped over the droids towards a lift. The lifts aren't working, General. They must have turned them off as soon as we landed. Tech, try to get them moving. No need, Dager. Ragu stepped forward, and stabbed his lightsaber on the lift's door. The weapon penetrated until only the handle was off, and Ragu made a circle with it. Melted metal dripped of the borders of the circle, and when Ragu kicked it, the cut-off part fell down, thundering as it crashed into the sides of the lift shaft. The Padawan put his head inside the hole, and looked upwards. Then, he jumped inside the lift shaft, and grabbed the cables. General D followed him, and, after looking hesitantly to their leader, Hell Squad followed. Anakin Skywalker slashed downwards, literally cutting a B-2 super battle droid in half. As the droid fell, he saw his captain, Rex shooting down the last droid on the corridor using his DC-17s. The Jedi turned to his Padawan, Ahsoka Tano, and nodded. The group, composed of two Jedis, one clone and four clone commandos went forward, looking for the command bridge of the cargo ship. General, Fixer's scanners detected a huge group of droids. Boss, the leader of Delta Squad, warned the Jedi. Under his helmet, he was frowning. The number of clankers inside the ship was bigger than they expected. He quickly calculated their odds, deciding for the best battle plan. We should split up, General. You, Commander Tano and Captain Rex follow this corridor till the end, and you should arrive at the command bridge. What about you? Scorch, the explosives expert, and battle maniac answered for boss. We will prepare the Seppis a nice surprise. One that they won't forget for as long as they live, which won't be much longer. He he he. The Jedi looked at them, thinking carefully. He didn't like the idea of splitting up, but it seemed rather logical in this situation. The reason Delta Squad was chosen to come with them was exactly for moments like this. All right, but be careful. 
If you can't stop them here, retreat to the command bridge. We will think of something there. Watching the three people run, Boss wondered how Hell Squad was doing on the other ship. The clones from the 303rd were a little bit too arrogant for him, trying to compare themselves to clone commandos while being normal soldiers, but even Boss had to admit that they had some abilities. Here they come, sir. Forcing his thoughts to the back of his mind, Boss concentrated on the fight that was about to start. It was going to be tough and dangerous, just how Delta Squad liked it. Chapter 174 Three Four used a piece of white cloth to bandage Tech's arm. The clone had been hit during their last skirmish with the droids, but it was nothing serious. Their journey up the elevator shaft had been almost uneventful. Two stupid droids had decided to look at them through one of the doors, and Ragu pulled them. The clankers fell down, almost hitting Dab, who was in the middle of climbing up the cables. Aside from that, the most dangerous moment that they faced was when Brain slipped, and almost fell, but then General D stretched his hand, and the clone floated in midair. General D moved his hand slowly, and the clone who was floating above a 30 meters fall quickly grabbed the cables again. Surely it wasn't a pleasant experience. In the end, they made it to the upper level of the cargo ship, where a bunch of droids waited after every corner. Dajer didn't know how many droids were on the ship, but judging by the number that they already eliminated, he expected there were at least a few hundred. Suddenly, Dajer heard metallic footsteps. Many of them. As one, all the clones turned back, and saw a myriad of clankers. Unnecessarily, Cell yelled. Seppi's incoming. The droidikas rolled in first, setting up their annoying shields. B1 and B2 units followed closely behind. Taking cover on the sides of the corridor, Dajer turned to General D. You go first, General. We will hold them. Denied. Ragu, you are a better pilot than I am. Go to the command bridge, and get us out of here. Dajer nodded. One Jedi would probably be enough to clear the command bridge of any hostiles. Tech, go with the general. Tech was by far the best pilot in Hell Squad, and could be of help when going over all the commands necessary to turn the cargo ship away from its escort. The Padawan and the clone ran away, and soon Dajer heard sounds of combat. Not worried about them, Dajer turned to his own battle. He saw at least 100 droids, packed in the corridor. At least the clones had the advantage that not all the droids could fire at the same time. Well, this is going to be fun. Cell spoke with excitement in his voice, and all hell broke loose. The droidikas in the front fired rapidly, forcing the clones to duck behind cover. Red lasers hit everywhere as the clones couldn't even respond without getting shot. Brain. Remember what I said about only using droid poppers? Forget it. As if he was waiting for Dajer to say that, his second-in-command pulled out a thermal detonator. Cover me. Up till now, General D had been deflecting the storm of lasers, and, although some of them hit the droids, most were absorbed by the droidika's shields. However, when Brain called for him, the Jedi increased his velocity, his arms becoming blurred as he swung his lightsaber in inhuman speeds. Brain showed himself just enough to throw the detonator. The deadly metal ball hit the walls, rebounding around until it finally landed amidst the droids. The B-1 units looked confusedly at it, as if wondering how did it get there. Then, the thermal detonator exploded. Seven or eight of the droids became scrap metal. Usually, a single detonator wouldn't eliminate that many, but the clankers were so closely packed together that not only the explosion hit them, but some also went down when pieces of their fallen comrades hit them. The detonation made most of the droids stumble and stop firing for a brief second, except the droidikas and a few clankers in the front. Soldiers as experienced as Hell Squad wouldn't let this opportunity slip past them. Take care of the destroyers first. Dajer took out a thermal detonator, and rolled it on the floor. If he did it too fast, the droidika's shield would stop it. He, however, had a lot of experience dealing with the rolling droids, and the detonator easily went through the shield, blowing the droid to pieces. Two droidikas remained, but then, General D jumped on the wall, and ran. Literally. As if gravity had no effect on him, the Jedi ran on the wall as if it was the ground. 
The droidikas tried to switch its aim to hit him, but the Jedi deflected the first few lasers they shot, and dropped on them. The powerful shields might as well have been made of paper when the blue lightsaber went through it. The first droidica flinched and fell when it was stabbed on the head, and then General D spun, cutting half of the head of the already dead droid, and slicing the second one. Even Hell Squad was stunned for a moment when seeing this unfold, but they recovered quickly. The sound of Cell's new weapon as almost as loud metal's blaster. He had modified a DC-15S to be shorter and more powerful, creating a powerful shotgun. At such close range, it cut down two or three droids with each shot. The battle raged on for a few more minutes, and both sides suffered losses. While Dager himself was unharmed, Dab had his hand pressed in a scratch in his leg, where a droid fragment had cut through the armor. Brain complained continuously about his damaged helmet, ignoring the fact that if it hadn't diverted the shot, he would be dead. Even General D didn't get out unscathed, as his shoulder had a nasty wound where one of the B-2 super battle droids hit him with two continuous shots. Usually, the Jedi would have been first priority on 3-4's medical list, but now, the medic was leaning over metal. It was only when the battle ended that most of the clones, and General D, saw that the heavy gunner had been wounded. There was a dark spot on his armor, just under his chest. It was clear that he had been hit hard. Dajer walked over to 3-4, careful not to hinder the clone as he worked, removing the metal's chest armor and helmet. How is he? 3-4 gently patted metal's face. Hell Squad as a whole closed their fists, as the clone didn't appear to be breathing. But suddenly Metal opened his eyes, and gasped for air, scaring the clones who were surrounding him. Stay still. Your ribs are cracked. 3-4 usually was a calm and quiet clone, but now he spoke with such a commanding tone that even Dajer was impressed. Metal stood quietly, as he was ordered, breathing heavily, his face showing pain each time he exhaled. You were lucky. If it wasn't for the blast padding, you would be dead. Blast padding was a new sort of armor, too expensive to be given to all troopers. As such, only commanders and important units were given it. That is why Hell Squad's armor is thicker than normal. Blast padding was part of the armor, and covered the chest, stomach, and back, offering protection from common lasers from a certain distance. Still, the impact from the lasers could crack or break bones, and even rupture organs. There were many injuries to cover, and little time. General D only waited for Metal's condition to stabilize before moving on. 3-4, Dager, carry him. Cell, help Dab. Let's move to the command bridge. We are too exposed here, and I doubt those are all the droids the ship had. Once in the command bridge, we can set up better defenses. As quickly as their injuries permitted, Hell Squad moved along the corridor, leaving behind more than a hundred dead droids, and a corridor that could hardly ever be restored to its original appearance. Chapter 175 The door of the command bridge opened, and General D saw a blaster aimed directly at his face. He moved his hand, and the blaster slowly lowered as he used the force and the person behind it saw who he was. Sorry, General. I didn't have how to know it was you. It's okay, Tech. How are we on the ship? General D looked around the room, and waved his hand slightly. Two or three dead droids floated and piled up against a wall, leaving the center of the command bridge clear. On the way towards the command bridge, they saw more than a few dead droids, most of them eliminated by a lightsaber. A few more minutes and I should be able to override their countermeasures. It would be quicker if the crew helped, but they refused to talk. Tech pointed towards one side of the command bridge, where about ten people were crouching or sitting on the floor in the dim light. General D walked over to them, and stopped in front of the one who was clearly the captain, for he was using clothes that no crew would dare to use. The Jedi ordered the human to get up, and, when he didn't follow the instructions, using the force. Felling himself pulled upwards against his will, the captain struggled and closed his eyes, his fear was evident. But when General D waved his hand in front of him, the fear disappeared and his eyes became blank. You are going to insert the command codes. I I am going to. Insert the command. Codes. 
After mumbling this, the captain went to the control panel, and typed rapidly. Tech laughed happily. Those are the correct ones, General. When you want to, just say the word and we can get out of here. Ragu, contact Master Skywalker. Ragu fumbled with his comlink, and a hologram of General Skywalker and his Padawan, Ahsoka Tano, appeared. Both of them were running, and the sound of blasters being fired could be heard in the background. Occasionally, General Skywalker would lower his head to dodge a red laser, or reflect it. I was about to contact you. We are. In a little trouble. We already put the new coordinates on the control panel, but the command bridge was flooded with droids before we could enter hyperspace. We were forced to retreat. Ahsoka, duck. The projection disappeared for a small moment as Master and Padawan dodged something Dajer couldn't see. Then, they got up as if nothing happened, and started running again. Calm down, young Skywalker. Are you able to take back the command bridge? I don't think so, Master D. There are too many droids. Also, we were forced to split from Delta Squad. They are trapped somewhere in level 2. General D, more seppies incoming. General D looked over to the door hurriedly, and spotted dozens of droids, and probably more were coming. They would lose their own command bridge if they didn't pay attention, so how could they help General Skywalker? Facing such difficulties, General D made his decision. Unfortunately, Master Skywalker, you are your own. We can't reach you. Forget the supplies, reunite with Delta Squad and get out of there. We are going to jump. I can't do that, Master D. Otherwise your troops. Okay. I am sorry, Master D. Don't worry, young Skywalker. We are going to pull through it. We always do. Now, retreat before it is too late. Yes, Master D. May the Force be with you. The Nikto cut off communications, and turned to the door, his lightsaber in hands. Ragu positioned himself next to his master, and Hell Squad found cover. Wounded or not, their fighting spirit was burning strong, since they knew that those supplies could very well save many of their brothers. Tech, initiate the jump. General Skywalker sensed a familiar tremor, as if space itself was shaking. He knew that this was the sign of a large ship entering hyperspace. Silently, the young Jedi Master wished good luck to General D and the 303rd. Um. Master. They are coming. General Skywalker ignored his Padawan's warning, only bothering to deflect a few lasers that came his way. With a heavy heart, he ordered their retreat. Rex and Snips, come on, we need to go. But, Master. Enough, Snips. Let's find Delta Squad and leave. Nobody was more disappointed than him. As a young and newly appointed Jedi Knight, not being able to help others was a gigantic blow to his confidence and pride. Half an hour later, a very damaged lot flew out of the remaining Separatist cargo ship, and it was immediately put under a starfighter escort. The other cargo ship had long disappeared into hyperspace. About an hour later, both sides disengaged from their fight, Republic fighters and droids returning to their respective ships. Soon, the Republic fleet turned around and jumped into hyperspace, but not before destroying the remaining cargo ship. It appeared the Republic commander had decided that since he couldn't take the ship, he wouldn't let the Separatist have it either. Dajer felt the ship shake a little as it entered hyperspace. The ever-beautiful sight of blue and white lights going past the ship as it cut through space and time appeared out of the command bridge's window. Unfortunately, he couldn't appreciate it now since he had to deal with the onslaught of droids. He was kneeling behind the captain's chair, which was now full of holes. The doors if the command bridge were starting to get stacked with droid corpses, but the clankers knew no fear, and kept coming, only to die. So far, None of them stepped one metallic foot inside the command bridge. Dajer didn't need for how long the fight went on, for he was too absorbed in it to pay attention to anything else, and so were the others. As such, they only noticed that they had come out of hyperspace when Republic starfighters zoomed past the ship, and a transmission from the Republic fleet nearby came through. Cargo ship Ezentral, this is a Republic system. Deactivate your shields and let our forces board you, 
otherwise we will attack. Dager, who was the closest one to the communicator, sprinted towards it, dodging the laser shot at him. Admiral Dow, this is Subcommander Dager. Subcommander. I was thinking which bold separatist captain would dare to. No time for this. Admiral, we are currently under attack by Sepis on the command bridge. We need reinforcements, now. Lower the shields and I will send them in, sir. Soon, several gunships left the 303rd Attack Legion's fleet, and flew to them. When Dager saw them landing, he let out a happy yell. Uhu. Just a little bit more, General D. I was starting to get tired. That was a joke, if Dager ever saw his general do one, for he was wounded and had been fighting for hours without stop. He was much more than tired. All of them were. Thankfully, they didn't have to wait much. At most 15 minutes had passed when he heard shots coming from behind the attacking droids. The leader of the reinforcements was none other than Commander Keeley, firing his two DC-17s wildly while leading at least 100 303rd troopers. Caught between Hell Squad and the other clones, the droids fell down one after another, without even a chance to react. Certainly, there were more clankers in the ship, but they would be quickly cleared. The 303rd wouldn't forgive those who hurt their general. Chapter 176 More often than he wanted, Dager found himself in an infirmary. This time, however, he wasn't there to treat his wounds, but to check on his squad members, and, more importantly, his general. Battle statistics showed that the cargo ship carried more than 900 droids, almost two battalions, all of which had been eliminated. Of those, at least 500 had died before the ship arrived on Ryloth and was boarded by the 303rd. It was a new record in the entire Republic Army, seven clones killing about 60 or 70 times their numbers. However, Dager, who fought on the battle, knew that this had only been possible due to many factors. Firstly, they fought in a ship, with small and cramped corridors, meaning that not many droids could attack at the same time. Secondly, they had taken the enemy by surprise, and thirdly, they had two Jedis with them. Still, they had suffered a lot to win the battle. Most of those who partook in the battle were injured, with the exception being Dager and Ragu. While they were defending the command bridge, Tech had been hit on his left thigh, while 3-4 had somehow managed to almost be eliminated several times. Burning him several scratches on his armor and about five or six bruises and cuts where the droid's lasers cut through his skin. None of them complained, however. It was a miracle that none of them died, and also that the only serious injury was metals, but even that should recover quickly in a back to tank. Now, Dager and Commander Keeley were standing next to General D, and Anikto was talking quietly to them so they wouldn't wake up the convalescent Hell Squad. Ragu had talked to his master for a long time, and only a few minutes ago did the Jedi manage to convince his Padawan to get some sleep. Keeley, as soon as I am recovered we are going to descend onto Ryloth. The planet is at war, not only with the Separatist, but also with themselves. Corrupt rulers and politicians almost sold them to the Confederacy of Independent Systems. Only a few freedom fighters remain. Ryloth and its people cannot be lost. We understand, General. Now, you should rest. Leave the details to Dager and me, we will let you in as soon as you are out of bed. The Jedi nodded tired, and soon drifted off into sleep. Commander and Subcommander left side by side, walking directly to the command bridge. They had to defend an entire planet, and this didn't include just ground battles. In fact, the decisive factor would be whether or not the Republic would be able to hold the space around Ryloth. Admiral Dow would be more important than them in the following battles. Yes, Commander. You had been through a lot lately. I swear I never saw a clone gather wounds as fast as you do. That earned a chuckle from Dager. His eye, face, shoulder, legs, torso, arm. All of those were parts of his body that had received at least one injury. His entire body was scarred, more scarred than normal for a soldier, even though most of the troopers who fought since Geonosis had at least a dozen different scars. Commander Keeley himself had been wounded more than once. Go get some sleep, Subcommander. Don't complain, otherwise I will order you. 
The reports that came in today said that the separatist fleet who will attack Ryloth is three days away. We can manage five or six hours without you. Dager wanted to protest. It felt wrong to go to his quarters sleep when his men were in the infirmary and other clones were planning and preparing for a crucial battle. But he was unable to suppress a yawn, and he suddenly realized that his entire body was sore, old injuries were aching, and he barely could keep his eyes open. Dager was in a dark place. Streaks of blue and red lightning thundered into the darkness. A massive, disform being looked down on him. A dark cloak covered this being, flapping into the non-existent wind. Instead of a face, all the being had was a black vortex, spinning, and spinning, seemingly trying to destroy the universe. The eerie laugh that always accompanied this figure startled Dager awake. He could still hear it in his head, controlling him, ordering him to do horrible things. His instincts told him that barely three hours had passed since he laid in his bed to sleep. However, he wasn't sleepy anymore, or rather, he wasn't sleepy enough to go back to his nightmares. Putting on his armor, he grabbed his helmet under his arm. Dager hesitated before leaving his quarters, and, in the end, decided to take his weapons with him. He strapped his recently acquired vibroblade to his back, sheathed his DC-17 and took his DC-15A on his hand, holding it parallel to the ground. It was uncommon for him to take all his weapons with him just to go to the command bridge, but the nightmares left him feeling vulnerable. At least, when he passed by troopers on his way, they thought he was simply preparing for the forthcoming battle, and not that their sub-commander was afraid of dreams. Commander Keeley was still on the command bridge when he got there. In fact, the clone seemed to never leave, as he was rarely seen on his quarters or anywhere else. The commander had his helmet off, showing his shaved and tattooed head. A small scar appeared on his neck, almost hidden by his armor. He was looking through the window, watching the planet below. The sincerity towered over the other cruisers, the giant metal beast showing no signs of fear of the separatist fleet that would attack them in the next days. Subcommander Dager. Admiral Dow. It's good to see you again. Same here, Dager, same here. Dager shook hands with the Admiral. He was shorter than the clones, and his eyes glistened with intelligence. A commander from the Old Republic days, the Admiral had won many seemingly impossible battles by using unorthodox tactics. Dager nodded to Commander Keeley, who didn't say anything about how much he slept. The commander knew better than any clone how difficult it was for a trooper to get a good night of sleep. Dager looked at Ryloth. The planet was as big as Majido, but its climate was the exact opposite. While on Majido it was always snowing, with chilly winds that made even walking difficult, Ryloth was hot and rocky. Giant formations of loose rock made for precarious mountains, and the air was stagnant. Red dust coated every building and rock of the planet, making everything look rusted and old. All in all, it was the perfect battlefield for a legion like the 303rd, a battlefield where they could display their full capacities. There, their armor would meld in with the terrain, their combat experience could be put to full use, and they could show the Seppis who the real boss was. Chapter 177 Dager, Commander Keeley, and Admiral Dow spent many hours discussing. Every aspect was covered, every flaw they could find were corrected. But their stares only grew more worried as they saw how slim their chances were. This time even Dager wasn't that confident. The Republic had thrown the 303rd in a mission, one they couldn't run away from. Not for a moment did Dager believe that the freedom fighters on Ryloth would actually be of any help. In fact, he could foresee that they would cause a lot of trouble. Still, they had their orders, and they were going to follow it to the bitter end. Their job on Ryloth was simple. They had to defend the planet against anything the Separatist threw on them. If they could hold the Separatist on space, it was even better. If their blockade failed, then they would fight for every inch of ground. As such, the commanders had already started making their preparations. Supplies were being loaded on, ships were being fueled, and, most importantly, soldiers were boarding their ships. To defend Ryloth, the 303rd would give everything they had. Everything. 
almost every infantry trooper descended onto the planet, leaving only a few hundred behind to defend the cruisers in case they were boarded. That day, the citizens of Ryloth witnessed an incredible sight. Gunship after gunship flew down from the fleet on space, dropping men, weapons, vehicles, and supplies. The long convoy continued for hours before it was finally over. If one looked up, the fleet would appear to be the same, as if the long string of lots was just a hallucination. But for the clones who remained on the cruisers, it was different. The long corridors, usually bristling with life, were now silent. The canteen was quiet, since even those who remained weren't willing to talk. No soldier had any illusions, they all knew that it was going to be a tough fight, and it was very unlikely they would see each other again. You should see this. General D turned away from the window, and saw one of the crewmen calling for him. For the last couple of hours, he had just been staring at the planet below. Ragu and Hell Squad had already gone to Ryloth, the clones mostly healed from their injuries. Now, the only ones who still had to go to the planet were he and Commander Keeley. What is it, Corporal? We just received a message from General Kenobi. It has information about the Separatist fleet and transmission for you. Play the transmission first. The clone nodded, and a recorded hologram message appeared. The man in the hologram used Jedi Knight's clothes, in shades of white and beige. His beard was well treated. The man seemed to be a well-educated gentleman, and this impression was only reinforced by how he spoke, even though it was just a recording. Master D, it is unfortunate that I have to contact you under such circumstances. I regret to inform you that we aren't able to provide you any support, at least for now. The Separatists are engaging us in every planet in the galaxy, and the Republic is hard-pressed to fight back. Some of my men were, however, able to retrieve basic information about the Separatist fleet tasked with conquering Ryloth. I hope it is of help, as little as it may seem. May the Force be with you. The hologram disappeared, and General D looked pensive for a moment. The situation was dire, much worse than he expected. Put the intel on. The crewman made as Commander Keeley commanded, and pulled up the intel that General Kenobi had gathered. Almost immediately, curses and imprecations left the mouths of every officer on the command bridge. We are doomed. Admiral Dow's words resumed what every clone was thinking. The 303rd Attack Legion had a fleet that was by no means small. The Sincerity was a Venator-class cruiser, one of the biggest and most powerful models the Republic had on stock. Not only that, but the fleet also had three other Venator-class cruisers, eleven aclameter class cruisers and dozens of smaller ships like CR-90 corvettes. The number of starfighters was in the thousands. So what could possibly make the commander of such a fleet feel certain doom? The answer was, a much bigger enemy fleet. Not only there were six Providence-class dreadnoughts, and twenty Munificent-class frigates, but they also brought a Recusant-class destroyer. This ship was equivalent to all three Venator-class cruisers the Republic had. That meant that besides the big number of capital ships, there would be tens of thousands of vulture droids to deal with. The Separatists usually had a numerical advantage over the Republic, but this was ridiculous. Don't worry, my friends. They might have the numbers, but we have the best pilots, and the best leaders. Admiral Dow fought on many battles, more than any of us here. We will pull through this ordeal, and soon, the Republic will send help. All the officers acknowledged General D's speech. None of them believed in it. Deja watched as clones marched before him, and into the city of Lesu. Outside the city, ATS, ATAPS, and SPHATS lined outside the city. The citizens looked at the marching army and the massive vehicles in awe and fear. Many of them weren't happy with Republic forces taking control over their capital, even if they were the ones who asked for help. As he commanded the clones to take position on the walls, he analyzed the outskirts of the city. A blast bridge was the only way in or out of the Lesu. The capital was surrounded by an abyss that seemed to have no end. It was an extremely good defensive position, but if the clankers did break through their blockade, and Dager had no doubt they would, then even such a city would fall in a matter of days. He looked over to the center of the city, where a high building towered over the others. The city council was having a meeting there, 
deciding whether or not they should accept the Republic troops. As incredible as it seems, when Dejer first arrived at the city, the rulers rejected him, arguing that those who asked the Republic to come were the so-called freedom fighters, traitors of Ryloth. Dejer looked at the fat Trilex and ignored them entirely. He had his orders, he was going to carry them. Some of the members of the council threatened to report him to the Senate, saying that the occupation was illegal. Dejer once more ignored them, instead saying very politely that if they didn't shut up, he was going to arrest them. At the moment, Ragu was waiting for an audience with the city council, and Hell Squad served as an escort. Dejer had stayed outside the city to organize the defenses. He was glad he didn't have to attend the meeting. Subcommander, sir, the general is arriving. Thank you, Smith. Dismissed. Dejer watched as the lot landed, and walked towards it. Only two passengers got out, Commander Keeley and General D. Dejer saluted both. Welcome to Lesu, General. We are facing some trouble with the populace that General Ragu thinks only you can solve. He asked me to tell you to go to the city council. I will go immediately. Arrange transport. Blyer, you heard the general. Commander, the defenses are ready for inspection. Let's do a patrol. Chapter 178 How dare you! We never asked for help, that is just an excuse for the Republic to conquer us. Cham Sindulla and his traitorous rebel friends should be hunted, not assisted by you. Mr. Shar, Mr. Jairet, I understand your concerns, however, I can assure you that the Republic's intent isn't to conquer, Ryloth, but to help it. Cham Sindulla is. Cham Sindulla is a traitor. He should have been executed when we had the chance. He is. When General D entered the room, what he saw was his Padawan trying to reason with a bunch of fat Trilex, but it was in vain, and his voice was drowned by their endless complaints. Seeing his helpless apprentice, General D almost chuckled. Regu's specialty was battling, not talking. Deciding to help his Padawan, General D used the force to create a small shockwave, just enough so everyone knew he was there, and that he was a Jedi. Council, please, listen to my Padawan. The Republic never had any intention of conquering Ryloth. The word of a Jedi should be more than enough to assure you that. When had we ever lied? As if we didn't know you all are dogs of the Chancellor. A fat green Trilek muttered under his breath, maybe thinking that the Nikto wouldn't hear him, but he was wrong. General D turned towards him, recognizing him as Mr. Shar Yelps, the one who complained the most against Ragu. Jedi aren't underlings of the Chancellor nor of the Senate, Mr. Shar. We are peacekeepers. We are here to protect Ryloth. You brought war to our planet. General D eyed the Trilek, disgust evident in his glare. May I remember you, Shar Yelps, that Ryloth is part of the Republic, and the only reason the Republic is here is to help you. May I also remember you that war would have come to Ryloth sooner or later, and it came now because some of your rulers and politicians tried to hand over the planet to the Separatist. Don't forget, Mr. Shar, that your name, and the name of others in this room, appear more than once as the masterminds behind this attempt. The Republic didn't trial you up till now, but if you insist on handing over Ryloth to the Separatist, our hand will be forced. The room instantly became so silent that one could hear a pin drop. Amongst the tens of council members, only one or two faces appeared happy, while the others showed rage and fear. Weeks before, an emissary of the separatist commander Wattambor came to Ryloth. He promised many benefits to those who aligned with the separatist cause. Most of the members of the city council were greedy and arrogant, and didn't hesitate to throw away the interests of the population in favor of theirs. The few who were against it were quickly silenced, and some even were thrown out of the council. However, what those greedy men didn't expect was that the Republic would be faster than the Separatist, and now, they were stuck in an awkward position. They couldn't turn away the Republic, otherwise it would be considered open treason, but they already received benefits from the Separatist. If they betrayed their new allies, then the consequences would be dire when they conquered Ryloth. After all, the Separatist weren't kind. Seeing the impact his words had, General D decided to continue. He had to subdue these men now, or they would backstab him and the Republic. 
May I ask you all, do you know what the Separatists do when they conquer a Republic planet? No. Let me tell you. Under the excuse of being prisoners of war, the entire population, men, women, and children, are forced to work to them. Many die from inhuman treatment. And the destiny of those who have some kind of power or influence over the people, a city council, for example, is even worse. They all disappear mysteriously. The council left the room to debate after those words. It was unclear whether they were more afraid of the Republic or the Separatist. Ragu approached his master, smiling. That should get them on our side, master. That made them afraid. They will be on our side for as long as it is beneficial to them. We will have to be careful. The moment they see the Republic show weakness, they will backstab us without hesitating. In a cave outside of Lesu, an old tree lek, with beige skin was hearing the reports made by his soldiers. Groups of tree leks scattered around this cave and others, taking care of children and moving supplies around. Every adult was carrying at least one blaster, and many had scars, showing they were battle-hardened veterans. Cham! Cham! Are you listening? Sorry, Gobi. I was thinking. You always are. Ha <laughs> ha. What I was saying is that clones arrived. They are called the 303rd Attack Legion. They are in all the major cities. Lesu, Kalayun, Nabut, Rovari. And how are they behaving? They took over those cities. Our spies said that the Jedi, Imagun D, scared the city council so much that they almost ran away. Ha ha ha. Oh think we can trust him. You know I don't trust anyone. Um. I will have to meet him. Organize it, Gobi. Yes, Cham. Give them a chance. We need their help. That depends on them, brother. Deja was inspecting an outpost that the 303rd had built a few kilometers away from Lesu. Over the past two days, that was all he had been doing, going from one city to another. The citizens still showed some distrust towards them, but after news of how the Sepis treated prisoners started to spread, they weren't so hostile anymore. General D is asking you to return to the city. Captain Agile, you will be in command of this outpost. Dejer took a BRC speeder, and left the outpost. Fifty kilometers were covered in twenty minutes with the vehicle. Even before he arrived, he saw Ragu waiting for him on the gate. Dejer, over here. Dejer, we were contacted by Cham Sindola, leader of the Freedom Fighters. Master is busy, so we are going to meet him. Just let me gather my squad, General, and I will be with you. They are already waiting for us. Sindola wants to meet outside the city. Something about this whole situation didn't seem right. Cham Sindela had contacted the Republic, asking for help, but after the Republic arrived, he waited for days before finally asking for a meeting. It was okay for Sindela to what to meet outside the city, since the city council considered him and his men traitors. Still, Dager's instincts told him something was wrong. General, I think it is better if we go with a larger group. Lieutenant Shield is in the city. If we bring him and fifty troopers. Cham Sindula is our ally, but he doesn't trust us much. Taking sixty soldiers will make him think we are up to something. He might not even go to the meeting if we do that. Hell Squad will be enough. A few minutes later, the group departed from Lesu on BRC speeders. Dejer put up two fingers and slid them across his chest in a way that only Hell Squad saw it. His men acknowledged the signal, and checked their weapons. They had long learned to trust Dejer, and if the subcommander was instructing them to pay attention, they will. Chapter 179 Dust left a trail in the horizon as eight BRC speeders zoomed through the valleys of Ryloth. One of the drivers, a clone wearing a weirdly painted armor, said something to the only person who wasn't a clone in the group. Don't stop. There is someone looking at us. The Tigruta didn't slow down, nor looked at Cell. Instead, he just asked quietly where their stalker was. The hills to the left. He is on some kind of animal. Dager discreetly lowered his macro binoculars. Cell was right. A Chui Lek with pink skin and riding on a big and round kind of lizard was watching them. 
Ragu also saw the Trilek, even though he didn't have any kind of binoculars. He is riding a blurg. They are the mounts used by the Freedom Fighters. I bet he is a scout for Cindulla. He really doesn't trust us, does he? We certainly don't trust him. Ragu turned to Brain, surprised that the easygoing clone would be so hostile to the Freedom Fighters. We are here to help them, Trooper. We have no reason to distrust Cindulla and his men. Brain silenced. It wasn't appropriate for him to answer, since he would be discussing with the general, and, well, soldiers didn't do that. But Brain had his reasons to doubt Cham Sindulla. Usually, rebels like Sindulla couldn't be trusted. They had a tendency to think that just because it was their planet, they knew more than actual soldiers. However, all the experience they had came from grabbing a blaster and killing two clankers. They didn't have tactics, they didn't think enough before attacking, which usually lead to high casualties and failure. Not only that, but they were also driven by rage and hatred. That made them susceptible to make rookie mistakes. Suddenly, the path disappeared between a crack on the walls of the valley. Slowing down, they followed it until they arrived at a clearing. At the center of the clearing, three Trileks waited for them. One was a woman with gray skin and a revealing outfit. She was beautiful, but a terrific scar cut her face and neck. The second one was a man, his skin blue and green, and he was carrying a huge blaster. And finally, the third one, a male with beige skin. Dajer assumed he was Cham Sindulla, because he exhaled confidence, and the skin he showed was marked with scars. Ragu got down from the speeder, and graciously greeted the Trilex. Hell Squad walked behind the Jedi, their blasters in hands but aiming at the ground. Cham Sindulla? I am Ragu, Padawan of Master Imagun D. We want to Disku. Where is he? Ragu was interrupted rudely by Sindulla. The Trilek yelled furiously, confusing both Ragu and the clones. Where is he? W who? Sindulla, I don't understand. Don't lie. My people saw you capture him. Where is he? Cham Sindulla advanced, as if he was going to attack Ragu. Immediately, seven blasters were aimed at him. In response, the other two Trileks that were with him also aimed their weapons at them. There was a muffled sound and the earth shook. All around the clearing, in the walls above, Trilek riders appeared, aiming a variety of weapons at Hell Squad. The clones changed their aim, each one to a different target. In the past, they had made the mistake of firing at the same clanker, wasting time, and costing other soldiers their lives. Dajer now knew why his instincts were telling him something was wrong. It was an ambush. He didn't know why the Freedom Fighters would want to attack Republic troops, but it was happening. Lower your weapons. Ragu's low voice startled Dajer. He looked at the Jedi, and saw the Padawan glaring at him. Slowly, Dajer lowered his DC-15A, and ordered Hell Squad to do the same. Are we being captured again? It can't be as bad as Ventress was. Silence. Cham Sindulla. You called for help of the Republic. Why are you aiming your weapons at us now? Sindulla laughed, and spat on the ground. Dajer tensed up at every movement the Trilek leader made. We called for help, and instead you betrayed us. You captured my brothers, and you still dare to come to this place. I didn't believe when my people said you were still coming. What do you want? A ransom? You won't get it. We fought the Separatist, we will fight you. Ragu frowned. He had no idea what Sindulla was talking about. However, the Padawan knew that something went terribly wrong. Without warning, Ragu used the force to pull his lightsaber. The entire Trilek force concentrated on him, and Hell Squad put their weapons up again. And then Ragu threw his lightsaber on the ground, near Sindulla. Do the same. Dajer looked at his general, and sighed. Jedi were said to be calm, but sometimes they were more impulsive than the clones. You heard the general, boys. The sounds of several weapons hitting the ground made Dajer feel uncomfortable, as if he was naked. The two Trileks originally with Sindulla walked over and grabbed the blasters. Sindulla himself grabbed Ragu's lightsaber. 
There was a smile on his face now, the rage all gone. Dejo suspected that the freedom fighter was never really angry, but wanted to see their reaction. Ragu, right? Follow me. To where? My home, of course. I still want to know where my man is. Ragu stood still, and confronted Cinderella. When the woman next to him aimed her blaster at him, Ragu simply waved his hand, and her weapon flew out of her hands, hitting the ground twenty meters away. I don't know who your man is, nor what you are talking about. Explain, Cindulla. Now. Cindulla frowned, and a dangerous glint flashed in his eyes. It was clear he liked the sensation of power in his hands, and Ragu contesting his authority was almost too much. You are in no position to make such claims, Jedi. Either you come now as guests, or you come later as prisoners. Ragu stared at Cindulla, and eventually shrugged. He wanted to understand what was going on, not cause a conflict. It would only make things more difficult if the Republic had to worry not only about the Separatist, but also the Freedom Fighters. But I want you to know, Cindulla, that I have no idea what you are talking about. If your man was arrested by us, I know nothing about it. Liar. You are all liars. Quiet, Maiwi. The woman with the scar spat towards Ragu as she picked her weapon on the ground. Carefully, Ragu and Hell Squad followed the Trelex to a cave with blasters on their back, they disappeared inside the earth. We can't reach General Ragu. Do you want us to send a patrol after them? General D closed his eyes, and felt the force around him. He had a special connection with Ragu, so it was easier to sense him. No need. He is safe. Continue the preparations. Chapter 180 Dejer could feel a blaster poking his back, and he had to resist the urge to strike his captor. It would be so easy. The Trelek obviously didn't know how to handle weapons. If Dejer turned around and grabbed his hand, then the blaster would be his. However, he knew he couldn't do that. Dejer glanced at Cham Sindola, the leader of the Freedom Fighters. As weird as it seems, Deja knew that the Trelek wouldn't eliminate them. It was clear now that someone tried to frame the Republic, and make the Trelecks think of them as an enemy. That person, or group, wanted to use Sindulla's temperament to eliminate Ragu and Hell Squad, which would undoubtedly start a war between the Freedom Fighters and the Republic. However, whoever it was, he or she had put too much trust on the hot temper of the Trelek. To be able to lead a resistance big enough to threaten the Separatist, obviously Sindulla had to be able to control himself. After many minutes, the tunnel they were following gave place to a well-lit cave many Trelecks using ragged clothes were in the cave, talking and working. Kids were running around, and two of them almost bumped in danger. Seeing the group of clones using their battle-scarred armors, the kids yelled, and ran away, hiding behind their parents. Some of the adults approached them with friendly smiles on their faces, until one of them noticed that their comrades were aiming blasters at the back of the clones. The Trelek yelled something, and the smiles were replaced with distrust. Chan Sindulla said something to his people, and sat at a rock in the middle of the room. The other Trelecks pushed their prisoners rudely, making them sit on the ground in front of Sindulla. I believe when you say that you know nothing of my man. But I don't believe it wasn't your kind who did it. Jedis are peacekeepers. Why would we want to start a war with you? Peacekeepers. Ha! Why are you leading a war, then? You might have been peacekeepers one day. Not anymore. Now, all Jedis want is power, the same as everyone else. That is not true. Believe in what you want. That is not why I brought you here. I want to free my soldier. Gobi. He went to find your master, and didn't come back. My people in the city saw him enter the city council building, and he never left. The 303rd isn't staying on the council building. That was the first time Sindola showed any kind of reaction other than rage or distrust. Dajer saw in his eyes that the Trelek knew exactly what happened, and that he was blaming the Republic wrongly. Ragu obviously saw it too. Who did it? You know, don't you? Cham Sindulla closed his, and stayed quiet for a few minutes. Ragu didn't seem worried at all, 
as if he already knew how things would unfold. When Sindulla opened his eyes, he wasn't looking at his captives, but at the men behind them. Lower your weapons. The Jedi is telling the truth. It wasn't the Republic that took Gobi. It was someone from the city council. After a small moment of hesitation, most of the freedom fighters lowered their blasters, and some even stepped aside so the clones could get up. However, two of the Twi'lek still had their weapons aimed at Regu. Cham! How can you believe them? Sindulla! You can't do that! The first one was Maiwi, whom Sindulla completely ignored, at least for now. The second one was a skinny Twi'lek with purple skin. His eyes shined with a cunning light, and he had a half-smile on his face whenever he looked at Regu or Hell Squad, as if he was planning something. Seeing the skinny Twi'lek brazenly contest his authority, Sindulla's face got darker. Tram Chalk, you better be careful. Don't forget I was chosen to be the leader. It isn't up to you whether or not I can do that. If you have a complaint about my methods, call a vote. If anyone has a complaint, call a vote. Sindulla looked around, and a few of the freedom fighters lowered their heads, while most of them looked back with trust in their eyes. Tram's eyes burned with rage, but he backed off when confronted. Dejur could tell that Sindulla had to be careful in the future. Seeing his opponent give up, Sindulla sat down again, and glanced at Ragu, his intentions clear. The Padawan signaled Hell Squad to get away, and sat near the rebel leader. Hell Squad walked until they were close to a wall, and sat down. Surprisingly, a Twi'lek brought them their weapons. He even had a friendly smile on his face. It was hard to believe that the freedom fighters trusted Sindulla so much, to the point of taking each of his words as guaranteed truth. Otherwise, why would they trust Hell Squad immediately? While Hell Squad checked their weapons, they had to make sure nobody played a trick, Deja was looking around. He soon noticed that although most of the adults were carrying weapons, few looked like they knew how to use it, maybe 30 or 40 out of 1 or 200 people. Most likely the actual freedom fighters were just a few, while the rest were their families. Mr. Soldier, would you like something to eat? Dejer was surprised to hear a soft voice speak to him. Standing next to Hell Squad were a bunch of kids, carrying pots and trays with food and drinks. The one who spoke to Dejer was a small girl, probably younger than the cadets when they first started training. The little girl looked at him with hopeful eyes, and Dejer smiled unconsciously. Her blue eyes made a good contrast with her amber skin, and the way she talked showed her innocence. He saw the rest of Hell Squad looking at him, and nodded. The clones took off their helmets, and the kids yelled in surprise. You have the same face. And you too. Are you brothers? The clones laughed, and Metal patted one of the kids in the head. We are all brothers. Every one of us. Whoa. That must be so nice. I wish I had a brother. Or a sister. Do you have a sister? Ha ha ha. No, I don't. But I have many more brothers. Later, when you see someone using an armor like mine, you will know he is my brother. The kid started asking all sorts of questions, and screamed in awe from time to time. Their parents at the side, initially looking protectively to them, were now smiling and laughing too. You won't take off your helmet. Dejer saw that the little girl was still looking at him, holding the small tray. He shook his head. I got hurt, so I have a big scar. I don't want to scare you. The moment he said that, the kids grouped up around him. I am not scared of anything. I also am not scared. I am very brave. One day I will be a warrior. Warriors can't be scared. Boys and girls all boasted, saying they weren't scared at all. Dejer smiled under the helmet. His only experience with kids came from his training as a cadet, but the way the little Trelex behaved was almost the same as he and his brothers did when they were smaller. You should take it off, sir. They won't stop pestering you until you do. While Dad was a bit more sensible, the rest of Hell Squad laughed to their heart's content. It was simply too funny to see their stern sub-commander being dominated by a bunch of children. Okay, okay. I will take it off. Ready? Yeah. 
Slowly, Dejer took off his helmet, and showed his face to the kids. As he had expected, they all jumped back, screaming. Even some of the adults had their mouths opened in shock.